The Gulag Archipelago Introduction in 1994, after 20 years of forced exile in the West, Alexander Solzhenitsyn returned to Russia. At one town meeting held on his Trans-Siberian whistle-stop tour to reacquaint himself with his homeland, he was confronted by this rebuke. It is you and your writing that started it all and brought our country to the verge of collapse and devastation. Russia doesn't need you, so go back to your blessed America. Solzhenitsyn instantly replied that to his dying day he would keep fighting against the evil ideology that was capable of slaying one-third of his country's population. The meeting erupted in applause. That sort of exchange was unimaginable when the present abridgment of the Gulag Archipelago first appeared in 1985. Almost no one expected then that within a few years the Soviet Union would collapse, and almost in a day like the legendary one-horse Shea. Yet now the dramatic events that put the closing punctuation mark on the Soviet parentheses in Russian history have also, we may say, brought an end to what the great Russian poet Anna Akhmatova called the true 20th century. This foreshortened century, running from 1914 to 1917, to 1989 to 1991, was the area when utopian dreams rooted in enlightenment optimism came to rely on brute force to make ideological schemes prevail. The 20th century has proven, in quantitative terms at least, the most murderous in human history, as governments killed their subjects at record rates. For decades, the word holocaust served as shorthand for modern man's inhumanity to man. Then one lone man added a second such term, gulag, which now appears in dictionaries as a common noun. Solzhenitsyn was one of the precious few who did anticipate the demise of the Soviet experiment, and he thought his book would help. Oh yes, gulag was destined to affect the course of history, I was sure of that. On one of his darkest days, February 12th, 1974, the day before he was forced into exile, and precisely because Gulag had appeared in the West, he mused, You Bolsheviks are finished. There are no two ways about it. What satisfaction he felt, then, when some early reviews, such as one from the Frankfurter Allgemeine, a leading German newspaper, caught his intentions. The time may come when we date the beginning of the collapse of the Soviet Union from the appearance of Gulag. American diplomat and scholar George F. Kennan hailed the work as the greatest and most powerful single indictment of a political regime ever to be leveled in modern times. One sure to stick in, the craw of the Soviet propaganda machine, with increasing discomfort until it has done its work. Solzhenitsyn has proven prescient on other matters as well. Not only did he reiterate, in the teeth of the prevailing opinion of Western specialists on Soviet affairs, that he was absolutely convinced that communism will go, he also insisted, most resolutely, and against all seeming reason, that he expected to be reunited with his beloved Russia. In a strange way, I not only hope, I am inwardly convinced that I shall go back. I mean my physical return, not just my books. And that contradicts all rationality. His improbable prerequisites were that his citizenship be restored, that the charge of treason against him be dropped, and that all his books be published in his homeland. After his prophecies were fulfilled, a friend of his reminisced, It seemed crazy to me at the time, but it was a real conviction. A poet's knowledge. He sees. The man sees. However historians ultimately apportioned the credit for ending the Cold War, Solzhenitsyn indubitably played a part in bringing the Soviet edifice down to rubble. His writings delegitimized communism in his homeland, and discredited it abroad. He was much too modest in depicting himself as a little calf foolishly budding a mighty oak and thinking this could bring it down. As David Remnick, editor of the New Yorker, declares, In terms of the effect he has had on history, Solzhenitsyn is the dominant writer of this century. Who else compares? Orwell? Kessler? Remnick concludes that to some extent you have to credit the literary works of Alexander Solzhenitsyn with helping to bring down the last empire on earth. It might be supposed that if Solzhenitsyn won his argument with history, or even precisely because he did win it, 
his relevance is now over, but that would be to presuppose that we have successfully come to terms with the twentieth century and have learned its lessons well. Unfortunately, if understandably civilized society, after the brief euphoria of 1989 to 1991, has generally averted its gaze from the dreadful record, as one former denizen of the Gulag, Lev Razgan, put it, people are tired of the past. A review of Solzhenitsyn's record will highlight the historical impact of two of his books. When one day in the life of Ivan Denosovic appeared in 1962, the world's attention was drawn to the cruelty of the Soviet Gulag. At a stroke, a hitherto unknown high school teacher of mathematics and physics was catapulted into newspaper headlines around the globe. In retrospect, that novella can be seen as the first crack in the Berlin Wall. From the platform of fame, the author could launch the Gulag Archipelago. And now it stands as the indispensable text revealing the distinctive character of the age. Through Herculean research efforts into Soviet atrocities, Solzhenitsyn has sketched the panorama and provided many details. Other witnesses and scholars have answered his call to fill in the blank spots in the picture, and the literature of the Gulag continues to be written. The recently published Black Book of Communism, with its global analysis of communism's crimes and repressions, has put a frame around the unfinished picture. A black border, to be sure. Among the gaping spots that remain, we have yet to determine roughly how many politically induced deaths the Soviet regime inflicted. Solzhenitsyn publicizes a demographer's estimate of some 60 million. Alexander Yakovlev, a high official in the Gorbachev regime and now chairman of Russia's Commission for the Rehabilitation of the Victims of Political Repression, estimates the number at perhaps 35 million. Also, he admits that his generation allowed those monsters Lenin and Stalin to kill us, and that it is high time for him and others to repent, to apologize to those who survived, and to kneel before the millions who were shot. Yakovlev's penitential posture accords with Solzhenitsyn's moral vision. A key passage in Gulag proclaims, So let the reader who expects this book to be a political expose slam its covers shut right now. The passage proceeds to specify that moral matters are fundamental because the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Given the nature of the Soviet experiment, the political dimension of life is never far from Solzhenitsyn's mind, but he always approaches politics in moral terms. Anyone, then, who views the human reality primarily through the prism of politics will misread Gulag. Elsewhere, Solzhenitsyn complains about those who always insist on regarding me in political terms, completely missing the point that this is not my framework, not my task, and not my dimension. Far from limiting himself to politics, he attends primarily to the timeless essence of humanity, to those fixed universal concepts called good and justice. To read Gulag through a moral lens is to understand that government power can perpetuate all sorts of atrocities upon human beings, body and soul, but it can never fully succeed in quenching the human spirit. Yes, some people will submit and will die spiritually, but others, like Ivan Denosovich, will endure and prevail. Despite all the indignities inflicted upon them, their innate human dignity will remain intact. In this sense, totalitarianism must always fail. In Solzhenitsyn's case, the moral vision grows organically from a religious commitment. Passages in Gulag describe his move from Marx to Christ during his years of incarceration, a change of heart amplified in subsequent writings. Because religious faith is his bedrock conviction, the greatest impediment to appreciating and appropriating Solzhenitsyn has been the error of listening to his sad music of Russia with ears attuned solely to secular wavelengths. Many Western admirers, who in the early years of Solzhenitsyn's fame had lionized him as an anti-totalitarian freedom fighter, reacted with shock and dismay when in 1972 he publicized his Christian faith. The static interfering with this Western reception increased when the now-exiled writer, in speaking to Western audiences about the West, voiced moral criticism in tones many judged to be overly harsh. 
Intellectuals and journalists developed a negative consensus about him, which was memorably captured by American critic Jerry Labor's complaint in 1974 that he is not the liberal that we would like him to be. That consensus hardened over the following two decades. By the 1990s, the Western response to Solzhenitsyn could be called schizophrenic. On one hand, the misrepresentations encased within the negative consensus caused David Remnick to lament that, when Solzhenitsyn's name comes up, now it is more often than not as a freak, a monarchist, an anti-Semite, a crank, a has-been, not as a hero. On the other hand, Solzhenitsyn was widely reported to be the most admired living Russian by a Western press that couldn't quite fathom why. Now that the abridged version of the Gulag Archipelago returns to print, the 25-30% to 30 of it that survived my knife, readers can form their judgments afresh. The usual first reaction to any act of abridgment is that it is a bad business, almost a desecration. Yet here is a book that has been translated into 35 languages and has sold more than 30 million copies nearly three million in the United States alone, and nonetheless remains more known about than known. On the many occasions when I have lectured on Solzhenitsyn, members of the audience have told me that they have read the first hundred or so pages of Volume 1, but never, despite good intentions, returned to read the rest. We can identify three obstacles that deflect readers. First, the work is very long, more than 1,800 pages. Second, some parts depend upon more knowledge of Russian and Soviet history than all but a few Western readers have. Third, the many accumulated horror stories engender a sense of depression that overwhelms all but the most persevering readers. Therefore, my work of abridgment has been governed by several specifiable principles and procedures. First and foremost, I have kept in mind a Western readership, one with only a limited knowledge of Russian history. Of course, it is impossible to take the Russianness out of this book, and I would not want to do so if I could. The work is, after all, written by a Russian and primarily for Russians. But the sections that highlight universal moral values preponderate in this volume. Second, I have retained the seven-part structure of the original, which actually can be perceived more clearly in a one-volume abridgment than in its three-volume entirety. I have sought to provide a sense of the whole work and its developing argument, not merely a series of disconnected excerpts. Third, I have resisted the urge to explain and comment. The few interpolated words of my own are strictly transitional. Fourth, I have tried to leave as few marks of excision as possible. Wherever possible, I have given no indication that passages have been deleted. Where the stitching is obvious, I have resorted to the semi-apology of inserting ellipsis points. For the most part, I hope that without consulting the original, it is not apparent where the stitching occurred. Chapters that have been deleted entirely are summarized in a sentence or two. The same is true of the few chapters which are cut so deeply that the sense of them cannot be gleaned from the remaining passages. At Solzhenitsyn's own suggestion, I have eliminated much of his personal story, though parts of it I treasure too much to drop. In sum, I have striven for maximum readability. This abridged text is designed for the general reader, not for the scholar. The full text, including footnotes and explanatory glosses, remains available for all those who wish to consult it. Surprisingly, this abridgment contains several short passages that have still not appeared in translations of the work as a whole, though they do appear in the author's collected works in Russian. We now know the fascinating story of how Solzhenitsyn composed the Gulag Archipelago, on the run and largely while at his hiding place in Estonia. From Invisible Allies, his tribute to his co-workers in the literary underground. This material will eventually appear in its proper place as part of an augmented edition of his autobiographical, The Oak and the Calf. Just as he lightened that work by holding parts out, so he initially withheld parts of Gulag. Such was the nature of the clandestine literature of the Soviet Gulag. One obstacle that an abridgment should not try too hard to resolve is the cumulative effect of unrelieved horror. Solzhenitsyn knows what he is up against. Does it seem, he asks at various times, that I am repeating myself? 
It is the gulag, he explains, that keeps repeating itself. Anyone who stays the course, however, will discover that the final note of this work, as of virtually all his works, is the note of hope. So even if the abridged version is too long for some readers, they should skip ahead to such chapters as The Ascent and The Forty Days of Kengir to discover why Solzhenitsyn is hopeful. There they will discover why, despite the common misimpression of him as a Jeremiah figure, he considers himself an unshakable optimist. As he wrote to me in a letter of advice about my work of abridging, the main goal, the main sense of Archipelago, is a moral uplifting and catharsis. I must add that the author gave me considerably more help on this project than I ever could have hoped for. I deeply appreciate his many personal kindnesses. Any errors of omission or commission are mine alone. Solzhenitsyn once told me he thought that in the long run, he would be best remembered in the West through this abridgment of the Gulag Archipelago. Perhaps one who has been right so often about so much will turn out to be right about this hope, too. End of the Gulag Archipelago Abridgment Introduction Introduction Part 2 by Alexander Solzhenitsyn In 1949, some friends and I came upon a noteworthy news item in Nature, a magazine of the Academy of Sciences. It reported in tiny type that in the course of excavations on the Kalima River, a subterranean ice lens had been discovered, which was actually a frozen stream. And in it were found frozen specimens of prehistoric fauna some tens of thousands of years old. Whether fish or salamander, these were preserved in so fresh a state, the scientific correspondent reported that those present immediately broke open the ice, encasing the specimens, and devoured them with relish on the spot. The magazine, no doubt, astonished its small audience with the news of how successfully the flesh of fish could be kept fresh in a frozen state. But few, indeed, among its readers were able to decipher the genuine and heroic meaning of this incautious report. As for us, however, we understood instantly. We could picture the entire scene right down to the smallest details. How those present broke up this ice in frenzied haste, how, flouting with the higher claims of ichthyology and elbowing each other to be the first, they tore off chunks of the prehistoric flesh and hauled them over to the bonfire to thaw them out and bolt them down. We understood because we ourselves were the same kind of people as those present at the event. We, too, were from that powerful tribe of Zex, unique on the face of the earth, the only people who could devour prehistoric salamander with relish. And the Kalima was the greatest and most famous island, the pole of ferocity that the amazing country of Gulag, which, through the scattered and archipelago geographically, was, in the psychological sense, fused into a continent, an almost invisible, almost imperceptible country inhabited by the Zek people. And this archipelago crisscrossed and patterned that other country within which it was located, like a gigantic patchwork, cutting into its cities, hovering over its streets. Yet there were many who did not even guess at its presence, and many, many others who had heard something vague, and only those who had been there knew the whole truth. But, as though stricken dumb on the islands of the archipelago, they kept their silence. By an unexpected turn of our history, a bit of the truth, an insignificant part of the whole, was allowed out in the open. But those same hands which once skewed tight our handcuffs now hold out their palms in reconciliation, no, don't dig up the past. Dwell on the past and you'll lose an eye. But the proverb goes on to say, forget the past and you'll lose both eyes. Decades go by, and the scars and sores of the past are healing over for good. In the course of this period, some of the islands of the archipelago have shuddered and dissolved, and the polar sea of oblivion rolls over them. And some day in the future, this archipelago, its air and bones of its inhabitants, frozen in a lens of ice, will be discovered by our descendants like some improbable salamander. I have never had the chance to read the documents, and, in fact, will anyone ever have the chance to read them? Those who do not wish to recall have already had enough time, and will have more, to destroy all the documents, down to the very last one. 
I have absorbed into myself my own eleven years there, not as something shameful nor as a nightmare to be cursed. I have come, almost, to love that monstrous world, and now, by a happy turn of events, I have also been entrusted with many recent reports and letters, so perhaps I shall be able to give some account of the bones and flesh of that salamander, which, incidentally, is still alive. End of Solzhenitsyn Introduction Chapter 1. Arrest How do people get to this clandestine archipelago? Hour by hour, planes fly there, ships steer their course, and trains thunder off to it, but all with nary a mark on them to tell of their destination. And at the ticket windows or at travel bureaus for Soviet or foreign tourists, the employees will be astounded if you were to ask for a ticket to go there. They know nothing, and they've never heard of the archipelago as a whole, or any of its innumerable islands. Those who go to the archipelago to administer it get there via the training schools of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Those who go there to be guards are conscripted via military conscription centers. And those who, like you and me, dear reader, go there to die must get there solely and compulsorily via arrest. Arrest. Need it be said that it is a breaking point in your life, a bolt of lightning which has scored a direct hit on you? That it is an unassimilable spiritual earthquake not every person can cope with, as a result of which people often slip into insanity? The universe has many different centers, as there are living beings in it. Each of us is a center of the universe, and that universe is shattered when they hiss at you, you are under arrest. If you are arrested, can anything else remain unshattered by this cataclysm? But the darkened mind is incapable of embracing these displacements in our universe, and the most sophisticated and the veriest simpleton among us, drawn on all life's experience, can gasp out only, Me? What for? And this is a question which, though repeated millions and millions of times before, has yet to receive an answer. Arrest is an instantaneous, shattering thrust, expulsion, somersault from one state into another. We have been happily born, or perhaps have unhappily dragged our weary way, down the long and crooked streets of our lives, past all kinds of walls and fences made of rotting wood, rammed earth, brick, concrete, iron railings. We have never given a thought to what lies behind them. We have never tried to penetrate them with our vision or our understanding. But this is where the Gulag country begins, right next to us, two yards away from us. In addition, we have failed to notice an enormous number of closely fitted, well-disguised doors and gates in these fences. All those gates were prepared for us, every last one. And all of a sudden the fateful gate swings quickly open, and four white male hands, unaccustomed to physical labor but nonetheless strong and tenacious, grab us by the leg, arm, collar, cap, ear, and drag us in like a sack. And the gate behind us, the gate to our past life, is slammed shut once and for all. That is all there is to it. You are arrested. And you'll find nothing better to respond with than a lamb-like bleat. Me? What for? That's what arrest is. It's a blinding flash and a blow which shifts the present instantly into the past and the impossible into omnipotent actuality. That's all. And neither for the first hour nor for the first day will you able to grasp anything else. Except that in your desperation the fake circus moon will blink at you. It's a mistake. They'll set things right. And everything, which is by now compromised in the traditional, even literary image of an arrest, will pile up and take shape, not in your own disordered memory, but in what your family and your neighbors in your apartment remember. The sharp nighttime ring or the rude knock at the door, the insolent entrance of the unwiped jackboots of the unsleeping state security operatives, the frightened and cowed civilian witness at their backs. And what function does this civilian witness serve? The victim doesn't even dare think about it, and the operatives don't remember, but that's what the regulations call for, and so he has to sit there all night long and sign in the morning. For the witness, jerked from his bed, it is torture, too, to go out night after night to help arrest his own neighbors and acquaintances. 
The traditional image of arrest is also trembling hands packing for the victim. A change of underwear, a piece of soap, something to eat. And no one knows what is needed, what is permitted, what clothes are best to wear. And the security agents keep interrupting and hurrying you. You don't need anything. They'll feed you there. It's warm there. It's all lies. They keep hurrying you to frighten you. The traditional image of arrest is also what happens afterward. When the poor victim has been taken away, it is an alien, brutal, and crushing force, totally dominating the apartment for hours on end, a breaking, ripping open, pulling from the walls, emptying things from wardrobes and desks onto the floor, shaking, dumping out, and ripping apart, piling up mountains of litter on the floor, and the crunch of things being trampled beneath jackboots. And nothing is sacred in a search. During the arrest of the locomotive engineer Inushen, a tiny coffin in his room containing the body of his newly dead child. The jurists dumped the child's body out of the coffin and searched it. They shake sick people out of their sick beds and they unwind bandages to search beneath them. For those left behind after the arrest, there is the long tail end of a wrecked and devastated life and the attempts to go and deliver food parcels. But from all the windows, the answer comes in barking voices. Nobody here by that name. Never heard of him. Yes, and in the worst days in Leningrad, it took five days of standing in crowded lines just to get to that window. And it may be only after half a year or a year that the arrested person responds at all. Or else the answer is tossed out, deprived of the right to respond. And that means once and for all. No right to correspondence. And that almost for certain means has been shot. That's how we picture arrest to ourselves. The kind of night arrest described is, in fact, a favorite, because it has important advantages. Everyone living in the apartment is thrown into a state of terror by the first knock at the door. The arrested person is torn from the warmth of his bed. He is in a daze, half asleep, helpless, and his judgment is befogged. In a night arrest, the state security men have a superiority in numbers. There are many of them, armed against one person who hasn't even finished buttoning his trousers. During the arrest and search, it is highly improbable that a crowd of potential supporters will gather at the entrance. The unhurried step-by-step -step visits, first to one apartment, then to another, tomorrow to a third and a fourth, provide an opportunity for the security operations personnel to be deployed with maximum efficiency and to imprison many more citizens of a given town than the police force itself numbers. There's an advantage to night arrests in that neither the people in neighboring apartment houses nor those on the city streets can see how many have been taken away. Arrests which frighten the closest neighbors are no event at all to those farther away. It's as if they had not taken place. Along that same asphalt ribbon on which the Black Marias scurry at night, a tribe of youngsters strides by day with banners, flowers, and gay, untroubled songs. But those who take whose work consists solely of arrests, for whom the horror is boringly repetitive, have a much broader understanding of how arrests operate. They operate according to a large body of theory, and innocence must not lead one to ignore this. The science of arrest is an important segment of the course on general penology and has been propped up with a substantial body of social theory. Arrests are classified according to various criteria. Nighttime and daytime, at home, at work, during a journey, first-time arrests and repeats, individual and group arrests. Arrests are distinguished by the degree of surprise required, the amount of resistance expected, even though in the tens of millions of cases no resistance was expected, and in fact there was none. Arrests are also differentiated by the thoroughness of the required search, by instructions either to make out or not to make out an inventory of confiscated property, or seal a room or apartment to arrest the wife after the husband and send the children to an orphanage, or to send the family into exile, or to send the old folks to a labor camp too. No, no, arrests very widely in form. In 1926, Irma Mendel, a Hungarian, obtained through the common turn two front row tickets to the Bolshoi Theater. Interrogator Klegel was courting her at the time and she invited him to go with her. They sat through the show very affectionately, and when it was over, he took her straight to the Lubyanka. And if on a flowering June day in 1927, 
Kuznetsky most, the plump-cheeked red-headed beauty Anna Skripnikova, who had just bought some navy blue material for a dress, climbed into a handsome cab with a young man about town, you can be sure it wasn't a lover's tryst at all. As the cabman understood very well and showed by his frown, he knew the organs don't pay. In just a moment they would turn on the Libyanka and enter the black maw of the gates. No, one certainly cannot say that daylight arrest, arrest during a journey, or arrest in the middle of a crowd has ever been neglected in our country. However, it has always been clean cut, and most surprising of all, the victims, in cooperation with the security men, have conducted themselves in the noblest conceivable manner, so as to spare the living from witnessing the death of the condemned. Not everyone can be arrested at home. With a preliminary knock at the door, and if there is a knock, then it has to be the house manager or else the postman. And not everyone can be arrested at work either. If the person to be arrested is vicious, then it's better to seize him outside his ordinary milieu away from his family and colleagues, from those who share his views, from any hiding places. It is essential that he have no chance to destroy, hide, or pass on anything to anyone. VIPs in the military or the party were sometimes first given new assignments, ensconced in a private railway car, and then arrested en route. Some obscure, ordinary mortal, scared to death by epidemic arrests all around him, and already depressed for a week by sinister glances from his chief, is suddenly summoned to the local party committee, where he is beamingly presented with a vacation ticket to a soaky sanitarium. The rabbit is overwhelmed and immediately concludes that his fears were groundless. After expressing his gratitude, he hurries home, triumphant, to pack his suitcase. It is only two hours till train time, and he scolds his wife for being too slow. He arrives at the station with time to spare, and there, in the waiting room or at the bar, he is hailed by an extraordinary pleasant young man. Don't you remember me, Pyotr Ivanik? Pyotr Ivanik has difficulty remembering. Well, not exactly, you see, although... The young man, however, is overflowing with friendly concern. Come now, how can that be? I'll have to remind you and he bows respectfully to Peter Vanek's wife. You must forgive us. I'll keep him only one minute. The wife accedes, and trustingly the husband lets himself be led away by the arm, forever or for ten years. The station is thronged, and no one notices anything. Oh, you citizens who love to travel, do not forget that in every station there are a GPU branch and several prison cells. This opportunity of alleged acquaintances is so abrupt that only a person who has not had the wolfish preparation of camp life is likely to pull back from it. Do not suppose, for example, that if you are an employee of the American Embassy by the name Alexander Dolgan, you cannot be arrested in broad daylight on Gorky Street, right by the Central Telegraph Office. Your unfamiliar friend dashes through the press of the crowd and opens his blundering arms to embrace you. Sasha! He simply shouts at you, with no effort to be inconspicuous. Hey, pal, long time no see. Come on over, let's get out of the way. At that moment, a Pobita sedan draws up to the curb, and several days later, TASS will issue an angry statement to all the papers alleging that informed circles of the Soviet government have no information on the disappearance of Alexander Dolgan. But what's so unusual about that? Our boys have carried out such arrests in Brussels, which was where Zora Blednov was seized, not just in Moscow. One has to give the organs their due. In an age when public speeches, the plays in our theaters, and women's fashions all seem to have come off assembly lines, arrests can be of the most varied kind. They take you aside in a factory corridor after you've had your pass checked, and you're arrested. They take you from a military hospital with a temperature of 102, as they did with Anz Berstein, and the doctors will not raise a peep about your arrest. Just let them try. They'll take you right off the operating table, as they took N. M. Voryabiev, a school inspector, in 1936, in the middle of an operation for a stomach ulcer, and drag you off to a cell, as they did him, half alive and all bloody, as Karpunik recollects. In the gastronome, the fancy food store, you are invited to the special order department and arrested there. You are arrested by a religious pilgrim whom you have put up for the night. 
for the sake of Christ. You are arrested by a meter man who has come to read your electric meter. You are arrested by a bicyclist who has run into you on the street, by a railway conductor, a taxi driver, a savings bank teller, the manager of a movie theater. Any one of them can arrest you, and you notice the concealed maroon-colored identification card only when it is too late. Sometimes arrests even seem to be a game. There is so much superfluous imagination, so much well-fed energy invested in them. After all, the victim would not resist anyway. Is it that the security agents want to justify their employment and their numbers? After all, it would seem enough to send notices to all the rabbits marked for arrest, and they would show up obediently at the designated hour and minute at the iron gates of state security with a bundle in their hands ready to occupy a piece of floor in the cell for which they were intended. And, in fact, that's the way collective farmers are arrested. Who wants to go all the way to a hut at night with no roads to travel on? They are summoned to the village Soviet and arrested there. Manual workers are called into the office. Of course, every machine has a point at which it is overloaded, beyond which it cannot function. In the strained and overloaded years of 1945 and 1946, when train load after train load poured in from Europe to be swallowed immediately and sent off to Gulag, all that excessive theatricality went out the window, and the whole theory suffered greatly. All the fuss and feathers of ritual went flying in every direction, and the arrest of tens of thousands took on the appearance of a squalid roll call. They stood there with lists, read off the names of those on one train, loaded them onto another, and that was the whole arrest. For several decades, political arrests were distinguished in our country precisely by the fact that people were arrested who were guilty of nothing and were therefore unprepared to put up any resistance whatsoever. There was a general feeling of being destined for destruction, a sense of having nowhere to escape from the GPU-NKVD, which, incidentally, given our internal passport system, was quite accurate. And even in the fever of epidemic arrests, when people leaving for work said farewell to their families every day, because they could not be certain they would return at night, even then almost no one tried to run away, and only in rare cases did people commit suicide. And that was exactly what was required. A submissive sheep is a find for a wolf. This submissiveness was also due to ignorance of the mechanics of epidemic arrests. By and large, the organs had no profound reasons for their choice of whom to arrest and whom not to arrest. They merely had overall assignments, quotas for a specific number of arrests. These quotas might be filled with an orderly basis or wholly arbitrary. In 1937, a woman came to the reception room of the Novocherkask NKVD to ask what she should do about the unfed, unweaned infant of a neighbor who had been arrested. They said, sit down, we'll find out. She sat there for two hours, whereupon they took her and tossed her into a cell. They had a total plan which had to be fulfilled in a hurry, and there was no one available to send out into the city, and here this woman already in their hands. Universal innocence also gave rise to the universal failure to act. Maybe they won't take you. Maybe it will all blow over. A.I. Ladyzhensky was the chief teacher in a school in remote Kaligriv. In 1937, a peasant approached him with an open market and passed him a message from a third person. Alexander Ivanik, get out of town. You are on the list. But he stayed. After all, the whole school rests on my shoulders and their own children are pupils here. How can they arrest me? Several days later, he was arrested. Not everyone was so fortunate as to understand at the age of fourteen, as did Vanya Levitsky. Every honest man is sure to go to prison. Right now my papa is serving time, and when I grow up they'll put me in too. They put him in when he was twenty-three years old. The majority sit quietly and dare to hope. Since you aren't guilty, then how can they arrest you? It's a mistake. They are already dragging you by the collar, and you still keep on exclaiming to yourself, It's a mistake. They'll set things straight and let me out. Others are being arrested en masse, and that's a bothersome fact. But in those other cases, there is always some dark area. Maybe he was guilty. But as for you, you are obviously innocent. 
You still believe that the organs are humanly logical institutions. They will set things straight and let you out. Why, then, should you run away? And how can you resist right then? After all, you'll only make your situation worse. You'll make it more difficult for them to sort out the mistake. And it isn't just that you don't put up any resistance. You even walk down the stairs on tiptoe, as you are ordered to do so, so your neighbors won't hear. At what exact point, then, should one resist? When one's belt is taken away? When one is ordered to face into a corner? When one crosses the threshold of one's home? An arrest consists of a series of incidental irrelevancies, of a multitude of things that do not matter, and there seems no point in arguing about any of them individually, especially at a time when the thoughts of the person arrested are wrapped tightly around the big question. What for? And yet all these incidental irrelevancies taken together implacably constitute the arrest. Almost anything can occupy the thoughts of a person who has just been arrested. This alone would fill volumes. There can be feelings which we never suspected. When 19-year-old Yevgenia Doyarenko was arrested in 1921, and three young Czechists were poking about her bed and threw the underwear in her chest of drawers, she was not disturbed. There was nothing there, and they would find nothing. But all of a sudden they touched her personal diary, which she would not have shown even to her own mother. And these hostile young strangers reading the words she had written was more devastating to her than the whole Libyanka with its bars and its cellars. It is true of many that the outrage inflicted by arrest on their personal feelings and attachments can be far, far stronger than their political beliefs or their fear of prison. A person who is not inwardly prepared for the use of violence against him is always weaker than the person committing the violence. There are few bright and daring individuals who understand instantly. Grigoryev, the director of the Geological Institute of the Academy of Sciences, barricaded himself inside and spent two hours burning up his papers when they came to arrest him in 1948. Sometimes the principal emotion of the person arrested is relief and even happiness. This is another aspect of human nature. It happened before the revolution, too. The Yekaterinodar schoolteacher Sirdi Yukova, involved in the case of Alexander Ulyanov, felt only relief when she was arrested. But this feeling was a thousand times stronger during epidemics of arrests, when all around you they were hauling in people like yourself and still had not come for you. For some reason, they were taking their time. After all, that kind of exhaustion, that kind of suffering, is worse than any kind of arrest. Vasily Vlasov, a fearless communist who we shall recall more than once later on, renounced the idea of escape proposed by his non-party assistants, and pined away because the entire leadership of the Katy district was arrested in 1937, and they kept delaying and delaying his own arrest. He could only endure the blow had on. He did endure it, and then he relaxed, and during the first days after his arrest he felt marvelous. In 1934, the priest father Irakli went to Alma'ada to visit some believers in exile there. During his absence, they came three times to his Moscow apartment to arrest him. When he returned, members of his flock met him at the station and refused to let him go home, and for eight years hid him in one apartment after another. The priest suffered so painfully from his harried life that when he was finally arrested in 1942, he sang hymns of praise to God. Resistance? Why didn't you resist? Today those who have continued to live on in comfort scold those who suffered. Yes, resistance should have begun right there, at the moment of the rest itself. But it did not begin. And so they are leading you. During a daylight arrest there is always that brief and unique moment when they are leading you. Either inconspicuously on the basis of a cowardly deal you have made, or else quite openly, their pistols unholstered, through a crowd of hundreds of just such doomed innocents as yourself. You aren't gagged. You really can, and you really ought to cry out. To cry out that you are being arrested. That villains in disguise are trapping people. That arrests are being made on the strength of false denunciations. That millions are being subjected to silent reprisals. If any such outcries had been heard all over the city in the course of a day, would not our fellow citizens perhaps have begun to bristle? 
and would arrests perhaps no longer have been so easy? In 1927, when submissiveness had not yet softened our brains to such a degree, two Czechists tried to arrest a woman on the Serpkov Square during the day. She grabbed hold of the stanchion of a street lamp and began to scream, refusing to submit. A crowd gathered. There had to have been that kind of woman. There had to have been that kind of crowd, too. Passers-by didn't all just close their eyes and hurry by. The quick young men immediately became flustered. They can't work in the public eye. They got into their car and fled. Right then and there, she should have gone to a railway station and left. But she went home to spend the night, and during the night, they took her off to the Libyanka. Instead, not one sound comes from your parched lips, and that passing crowd naively believes that you and your executioners are friend out for a stroll. I myself often had the chance to cry out. On the eleventh day after my arrest, three SMERSH bums, more burdened by four suitcases full of war booty than by me, they had come to rely on me in the course of this long trip, brought me to the Belarusian station in Moscow. They were called a special convoy, in other words, a special escort guard, but in actual fact their automatic pistols only interfered with their dragging along the four terribly heavy bags of loot they and their chiefs in the SMERSH counterintelligence on the second Belarusian front had plundered in Germany and were now bringing to their families in the fatherland under the pretext of convoying me. I myself lugged a fifth suitcase with no great joy, since it contained my diaries and literary works, which were being used as evidence against me. Not one of the three knew the city, and it was up to me to pick the shortest route to the prison. I had personally to conduct them to the Libyanka, where they had never been before, and which, in fact, I confused with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I had spent one day in the counterintelligence prison at Army Headquarters, and three days in the counterintelligence prison at the headquarters of the Front, where my cellmates had educated me in the deceptions practiced by the interrogators, their threats and beatings, in the fact that once a person was arrested he was never released, and in the inevitability of a tenor, a ten-year sentence, and then, by a miracle, I had suddenly burst out of there and for four days had traveled like a free person among free people. Even though my flanks had already lain on rotten straw beside the latrine bucket, my eyes had already beheld beaten up and sleepless men. My ears had heard the truth, and my mouth had tasted prison gruel. So why did I keep silent? Why, in my last minute, out in the open, did I not attempt to enlighten the hoodwinked crowd? I kept silent, too, in the Polish city of Brodnica. But maybe they didn't understand Russian there. I didn't call out one word on the streets of Bylostok, but maybe it wasn't a matter that concerned the Poles. I didn't utter a sound at the Volvovisk station, but there were very few people there. I walked along the Minsk station platform beside those same bandits as if nothing were amiss. But the station was still a ruin and now I was leading the SMERSH men through the circular upper concourse of the Belarusian radial subway station on the Moscow Circle Line, with its white ceiling dome and brilliant electric lights, and opposite us two parallel escalators thickly packed with Muscovites rising from below. It seemed as if they were all looking at me. They kept coming in an endless ribbon from down there, from the depths of ignorance, on and on beneath the gleaming dome, reaching toward me for at least one word of truth. So why did I keep silent? Every man always has handy a dozen glib little reasons why he is not right to sacrifice himself. Some still have hopes of a favorable outcome to their case and are afraid to ruin their chances by an outcry. For, after all, we get no news from that other world and we do not realize that from the very moment of arrest our fate has almost certainly been decided in the worst possible sense, and we cannot make it any worse. Others have not yet attained the mature concepts on which a shout of protest to a crowd must be based. Indeed, only a revolutionary has slogans on his lips that are crying to be uttered loud, and where would the uninvolved, peaceable average man come by such slogans? He simply does not know what to shout. 
And then, last of all, there is the person whose heart is too full of emotion, whose eyes have seen too much, for that whole ocean to pour forth in a few disconnected cries. As for me, I kept silent for one further reason, because those Muscovites thronging the steps of the escalators were too few for me. Too few. Here my cry will be heard by two hundred or twice two hundred, but what about the two hundred million? Vaguely, unclearly, I had a vision that some day I would cry out to the two hundred million. But for the time being I did not open my mouth, and the escalator dragged me implacably down into the netherworld. And when I got to Okotni Ryad, I continued to keep silent. Nor did I utter a cry at the Metropole Hotel, nor wave my arms on the Golgotha of the Libyanka Square. Mine was, probably, the easiest imaginable kind of arrest. It did not tear me from the embrace of kith and kin, nor wrench me from a deeply cherished home life. One pallid European February it took me from our narrow salient on the Baltic Sea, where, depending on one's point of view, either we had surrounded the Germans or they had surrounded us, and it deprived me of only my familiar artillery battery and the scenes of the last three months of the war. The brigade commander called me to his headquarters and asked me for my pistol. I turned it over without suspecting any evil intent, when suddenly, from a tense, immobile suite of staff officers in the corner, two counterintelligence officers stepped forward hurriedly, crossed the room in a few quick bounds, their four hands grabbed simultaneously at the star on my cap, my shoulder boards, my officer's belt, my map case, and they shouted theatrically, You are under arrest! Burning and prickling from head to toe, all I could exclaim was, Me? What for? And even though there is usually no answer to this question, surprisingly I received one. This is worth recalling, because it is so contrary to our usual custom. Across the sheer gap separating me from those left behind, the gap created by the heavy falling word, arrest, across that quarantine line not even a sound dared penetrate, came the unthinkable, magic words of the brigade commander. Solzhenitsyn, come back here. With a sharp turn I broke away from the hands of the SMERSH men and stepped back to the brigade commander. I had never known him very well. He had never condescended to run-of-the-mill conversations with me. To me his face had always conveyed an order, a command, wrath. But right now it was illuminated in a thoughtful way. Was it from shame for his own involuntary part of this dirty business? Was it from an impulse to rise above the pitiful subordination of a whole lifetime? Ten days before, I had led my own reconnaissance battery almost intact out of the fire pocket in which the twelve heavy guns of his artillery battalion had left, and now he had to renounce me because of a piece of paper with a seal on it? You have, he asked weightily, a friend on the first Ukrainian front? It's forbidden. You have no right the captain and the major of the counterintelligence shouted at the colonel. But he had already understood. But I had already understood. I knew instantly I had been arrested because of my correspondence with a school friend, and understood from what direction to expect danger. Zakhar Georgievich Travkin could have stopped right there, but no, continuing his attempt to expunge his part in this and to stand erect before his own conscience, he rose from behind his desk. He had never stood up in my presence in my former life, and reached across the quarantine line that separated us and gave me his hand, although he would never have reached out his hand to me had I remained a free man. And pressing my hand, while his whole suite stood there in mute horror, showing that warmth that may appear in a habitually severe face, he said fearlessly and precisely, I wish you happiness, Captain. Not only was I no longer a captain, but I had been exposed as an enemy of the people, for among us every person is totally exposed from the moment of arrest, and he had wished happiness to an enemy. This is not going to be a volume of memoirs about my own life, therefore I am not going to recount the truly amusing details of my arrest, which was like no other. That night the SMERSH officers gave up their last hope of being able to make out where we were on the map. They had never been able to read maps anyway. So they politely handed the map to me and asked me to tell the driver how to proceed to counterintelligence at Army headquarters. 
I, therefore, led them and myself to that prison. And in gratitude they immediately put me not in an ordinary cell, but in a punishment cell. And I really must describe that closet in a German peasant house which served as a temporary punishment cell. It was the length of one but it was the length of one human body and wide enough for three to lie packed tightly, four at a pinch. As it happened, I was the fourth, shoved in after midnight. The three lying there blinked sleepily at me in the light of the smoky kerosene lantern and moved over, giving me enough space to lie on my side, half between them, half on top of them, until gradually, by sheer weight, I could wedge my way in. And so four overcoats lay on the crushed straw floor, with eight boots pointing at the door. They slept, and I burned. The more self-assured I had been as a captain half a day before, the more painful it was to crowd onto the floor of that closet. Once or twice the other fellows woke up numb on one side, and we all turned over at the same time. Toward morning they awoke, yawned, grunted, pulled up their legs, moved into various corners, and our acquaintance began. What are you in for? But a troubled little breeze of caution had already breathed on me beneath the poisoned roof of S-M-E-R-S-H, and I pretended to be surprised. No idea. Do the bastards tell you? However, my cellmates, tank men in soft black helmets, hid nothing. They were three honest, open-hearted soldiers, people of a kind I had become attached to during the war years because I myself was more complex and worse. All three had been officers, their shoulder boards also had been viciously torn off, and in some places the cotton batting stuck out. On their stained field shirts, light patches indicated where decorations had been removed, and there were dark and red scars on their faces and arms, the results of wounds and burns. Their tank unit had, unfortunately, arrived for repairs in the village where the SMERSH counterintelligence headquarters of the 48th Army was located. Still damp from the battle of the day before, yesterday they had gotten drunk, and on the outskirts of the village broke into a bath where they had noticed two raunchy bras going to bathe. The girls, half-dressed, managed to get away all right from the soldiers' staggering, drunken legs. But one of them, it turned out, was the property of an army chief of counterintelligence, no less. Yes, for three weeks the war had been going on inside Germany. And all of us knew very well that if the girls were German, they could be raped and then shot. This was almost a combat distinction. Had they been Polish girls or our own displaced Russian girls, they could have been chased naked around the garden and slapped on the behind, an amusement no more. But just because this one was the campaign wife of the chief of counterintelligence, right off some deep in there our sergeant had viciously torn from three front-line officers, the shoulder boards awarded them by the front headquarters, and had taken off the decorations conferred upon them by the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. And now these warriors, who had gone through the whole war and who had no doubt crushed more than one line of enemy trenches, were waiting for a court-martial, whose members, had it not been for their tank, could have come nowhere near the village. We put out the kerosene lamp, which had already used up all the air there was to breathe. A Judas hole the size of a postage stamp had been cut in the door, and through it came indirect light from the corridor. Then, as if afraid that with the coming daylight we would have too much room in the punishment cell, they tossed in a fifth person. He stepped in wearing a newish red army tunic and a cap that was also new. And when he stopped opposite the peat pole, we could see a fresh face with a turned-up nose and red cheeks. "'Where are you from, brother? Who are you?' "'From the other side,' he answered briskly. "'A spy.' "'You're kidding!' We were astounded. To be a spy and admit it, Shinan and the brothers' tour have never written that kind of spy story. "'What is there to kid about in wartime?' the young fellow sighed reasonably. "'And just how else can you get back home from being a POW? Well, you tell me.' He had barely begun to tell us how, in some days back, the Germans led him through the front line so he could play the spy and blow up bridges, whereupon he had gone immediately to the nearest battalion headquarters to turn himself in. But the weary, sleep-starved battalion commander hadn't believed his story about being a spy, and had sent him off to the nurse to get a pill. And at that moment his new impressions burst upon us. "'Out for toilet call!' hollered a master sergeant hardhead as the door sprang open. 
He was just built for swinging the tail of a 122mm cannon. A circle of machine gunners had been strung around the peasant courtyard, guarding the path which was pointed out to us, and which went behind the barn. I was bursting with indignation that some ignoramus of a master sergeant dared to give orders to us officers. Hands behind your backs! But the tank officers put their hands behind them, and I followed suit. Back of the barn was a small square area in which the snow had been all trampled down, but not yet melted. It was soiled all over with human feces, so densely scattered over the whole square that it was difficult to find a spot to place one's two feet and squat. However, we spread ourselves about, and the five of us did squat down. Two machine gunners grimly pointed their machine pistols at us as we squatted, and before a minute had passed, the master sergeant briskly urged us on. Come on, hurry it up. With us, they do it quickly. Not far from me squatted one of the tank men, a native of Rostov, a tall, melancholy senior lieutenant. His face was blackened by a thin film of metallic dust or smoke, but the big red scar stretching across his cheek stood out nonetheless. What do you mean with us? he asked quietly, indicating no intention of hurrying back to the punishment cell that still stank of kerosene. In SMERSH counterintelligence! The master sergeant shot back proudly and more resonantly than was called for. The counterintelligence men used to love that tastelessly concocted word, SMERSH, manufactured from the initial syllables of the words for death to spies. They felt it intimidated people. And with us, we do it slowly, replied the senior lieutenant thoughtfully. His helmet was pulled back, uncovering his still untrimmed hair. His oaken, battle-hardened rear end was lifted toward the pleasant, coolish breeze. Where do you mean with us? The master sergeant barked at him more loudly than he needed to. In the Red Army, the senior lieutenant replied quietly from his heels, measuring with his look the cannon tailor that never was. Such were my first gulps of prison air. End of chapter one. Chapter two. The history of our sewage disposal system. When people today decree the abuses of the cult, they keep getting hung up on those years which are stuck in our throats, 37 and 38. And memory begins to make it seem as though those arrests never made before or after, but only in those two years. Although I have no statistics at hand, I am not afraid of erring when I say that the wave of 1937 and 1938 was neither the only one or even the main one, but only one, perhaps, of the three biggest waves which strained the murky, stinking pipes of our prison sewers to bursting. Before it came the wave of 1929 and 1930, the size of a good river ob, which drove a mere 15 million peasants, maybe more, out onto the taiga and the tundra. But peasants are a silent people, nor do they write complaints or memoirs. No interrogators sweated out the night with them, nor did they bother to draw up formal indictments. It was enough to have a decree from the village Soviet. This wave poured forth, sank down into the permafrost, and even our most active minds recall hardly a thing about it. It is as if it had not even scarred the Russian conscience. And yet Stalin, and you and I as well, committed no crime more heinous than this. And after it, there was the wave of 1944 to 1946, the size of a good Yenisei, when they dumped whole nations down the sewer pipes, not to mention millions and millions of others who, because of us, had been prisoners of war or carried off to Germany and subsequently repatriated. This was Stalin's method of cauterizing the wounds so that scar tissue would form more quickly, and thus the body politic as a whole world would not have to rest up, catch its breath, regain its strength. But in this wave, too, the people were of the simpler kind, and they wrote no memoirs. But the wave of 1937 swept up and carried off to the archipelago people of position, people with a party past, yes, educated people, around whom there were many who had been wounded and remained in the cities, and what a lot of them had pen in hand. And today they are all writing, speaking, remembering, 1937, 
a whole Volga of the people's grief. But just say 1937 to a Crimean Tatar, a Kalmyk, a Chechen, and he'll shrug his shoulders. And what's 1937 to Leningrad when 1935 had come before it? And for the second termers, i.e. repeaters, or people from the Baltic countries, weren't 1948 and 1949 harder on them? And if sticklers for style and geography should accuse me of having omitted some Russian rivers, and not yet having named some of the waves, then just give me more paper. There were enough waves to use up the names of all the rivers of Russia. It is well known that any organ withers away if it is not used. Therefore, if we know that the Soviet security organs, or organs, capitalized, and they christened themselves with this vile word, praised and exalted above all living things, have not died off even to the extent of one single tentacle, but instead have grown new ones and strengthened their muscles, it is easy to deduce that they have had constant exercise. Through the sewer pipes the flow pulsed. Sometimes the pressure was higher than had been projected, sometimes lower. But the prison sewers were never empty. The blood, the sweat, and the urine in which we were pulped pulsed through them continuously. The history of this sewage system is the history of an endless swallow and flow. Flood alternating with ebb and ebb again with flood. Waves pouring in, some big, some small. Brooks and rivulets flow in from all sides, and then just plain individually scooped up droplets. The chronological list which follows, in which waves made up of millions of arrested persons are given equal attention with ordinary streamlets of unremarkable handfuls, is quite incomplete. Meager, miserly, and limited by my own capacity to penetrate the past. What is really needed is a great deal of additional work by survivors familiar with the material. In considering now the period from 1918 to 1920, we are in difficulties. Should we classify among the prison waves all those who were done in before they even got to prison cells? And in what classification we put those whom the committees of the poor took behind the wing of the village Soviet or to the rear of the courtyard and finished off right there? Did the participants in the clusters of plots uncovered in every province at least succeed in setting foot on the land of archipelago, or did they not, and are they therefore not related to the subject of our investigations? Bypassing the repression of the now famous rebellions, Yaroslavl, Murom, Rabinsk, Arzamas, we know of certain events only by their names, for instance the Kalpino executions of June 1918. What were they? Who were they, and where should they be classified? There is also no little difficulty in deciding whether we should classify among the prison waves or on the balance sheets of the Civil War those tens of thousands of hostages, i.e. people not personally accused of anything, those peaceful citizens not even listed by name, who were taken off and destroyed simply to terrorize or wreak vengeance on a military enemy or a rebellious population. This action was, in fact, explained openly, Latsis in the newspaper Red Terror, November 1st, 1918. We are not fighting against single individuals. We are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. It is not necessary, during the interrogation, to look for evidence proving that the accused opposed the Soviets by word or action. The first question which you should ask him is what class does he belong to? What is his origin? his education, and his profession. These are the questions which will determine the fate of the accused. Such is the sense and the essence of Red Terror. A decree of the Defense Council on February 15th, 1919, the meeting was evidently presided over by Lenin, suggests that the Cheka and the NKVD take hostages among the peasants of those regions where the cleaning of snow from the railroads does not proceed quite satisfactorily and that these hostages be executed if the cleaning is not completed. But even restricting ourselves to ordinary arrests, we can note that by the spring of 1918 a torrent of socialist traitors had already begun. We can note by the spring of 1918 a torrent of socialist traitors had already begun that was to continue without slackening for many years. 
In 1919, suspicion of our Russians returning from abroad was already having its effect. Why? What was their alleged assignment? Thus the officers of the Russian Expeditionary Force in France were imprisoned on their homecoming. In 1919, too, what with the big halls in connection with such actual and pseudo-plots as the National Center and the Military Plot, executions were carried out in Moscow, Petrograd, and other cities on the basis of lists. In other words, free people were simply arrested and executed immediately. From January 1919 on, food requisitioning was organized and food collecting detachments were set up. They encountered resistance everywhere in the rural areas, sometimes stubborn and passive, sometimes violent. The suppression of this opposition gave rise to an abundant flood of arrests during the course of the next two years, not counting those who were shot on the spot. In May 1920 came the well-known decree of the Central Committee on Subversive Activity in the Rear. We know from experience that every such decree is a call for a new wave of widespread arrests. It is the outward sign of such a wave. It was in 1920 that we knew, or failed to know, of the trial of the Siberian Peasants Union, and at the end of 1920 the repression of the Tambov Peasants' Rebellion began. There was no trial for them. But the main drive to uproot people from the Tamba villages took place mostly in June 1921. Throughout the province, concentration camps were set up for the families of peasants who had taken part in the revolts. Even earlier, in March 1921, the rebellious Kronstadt sailors, minus those who had been shot, were sent to the islands of the archipelago. In that same year, the practice of arresting students began. Also in 1921, the arrests of members of all non-Bolshevik parties were expanded and systematized. In fact, all Russia's political parties had been buried, except the victorious one. In the spring of 1922, the Extraordinary Commission for Struggle Against Counter-Revolution, Sabotage, and Speculation, the Cheka, recently renamed the GPU, decided to intervene in church affairs. It was called on to carry out a church revolution, to remove the existing leadership and replace it with one which would have only one ear turned to heaven and the other to the Lubyanka. The so-called living church, people seemed to go along with this plan, but without outside help they could not gain control of the church apparatus. For this reason the patriarch Tycon was arrested and two resounding trials were held, followed by the execution in Moscow of those who had publicized the Patriarch's appeal and, in Petrograd, of the Metropolitan Vienemin, who had attempted to hinder the transfer of ecclesiastical power to the living church group. Here and there in the provincial centers and even further down in the administrative districts, Metropolitans and bishops were arrested and, as always in the wake of big fish, followed shoals of smaller fry, archpriests, monks and deacons. These arrests were not even reported in the press. They also arrested those who refused to swear to support the living church renewal movement. Men of religion were an inevitable part of every annual catch, and their silver locks gleamed in every cell and in every prisoner transport en route to the Solvetsky Islands. From the early twenties on, arrests were also made among groups of theosophists, mystics, spiritualists, Count Palin's group used to keep official transcripts of the communications with the spirit world. Also, religious societies and philosophers of the Berdyeyev Circle, the so-called Eastern Catholics, followers of Vladimir Solovev, were arrested and destroyed in passing, as was the group of A.I. Abrikosova, and of course ordinary Roman Catholics, Polish Catholic priests, etc., were arrested too as part of the normal course of events. However, the root destruction of religion in the country, which throughout the 20s and 30s was one of the most important goals of the GPU and KVD, could be realized only by mass arrests of Orthodox believers. Monks and nuns, whose black habits had been a distinctive feature of old Russian life, were intensively rounded up on every hand, placed under arrest, and sent into exile. They arrested and sentenced active laymen 
The circles kept getting bigger as they raked in ordinary believers as well, old people and particularly women who were the most stubborn believers of all and who, for many long years to come, would be called nuns in transit prisons and in camps. True, they were supposedly being arrested and tried not for their actual faith, but for openly declaring their convictions and for bringing up their children in the same spirit. As Tanya Kodakevich wrote, You can pray freely, but just so God alone can hear. She received a ten-year sentence for these verses. A person convinced that he possessed spiritual truth was required to conceal it from his own children. In the twenties, the religious education of children was classified as a political crime under Article 5810 of the Code. In other words, counter-revolutionary propaganda. True, one was still permitted to renounce one's religion at one's trial. It didn't happen often, but it nonetheless did happen that the father would renounce his religion and remain at home to raise the children while the mother went to the Solvetsky Islands. Throughout all those years, women manifested great firmness in their faith. All persons convicted of religious activity received tenors, the longest term then given. In those years, particularly 1927, in purging the big cities for the pure society that was coming into being, they sent prostitutes to the Solvetsky Islands along with the nuns. Those lovers of a sinful earthly life were given three-year sentences under a more lenient article of the Code. The conditions in prisoner transports and on the Solovetsky Islands were not of a sort to hinder them from plying their merry trade among the administrators and convoy guards, and three years later they would return with laden suitcases to the place they had come from. Religious prisoners, however, were prohibited from ever returning to their children and their home areas. As early as the early twenties, waves appeared that were purely national in character. The waves flowed underground through the pipes. They provided sewage disposal for the life flowering on the surface. In 1931, following the trial of the Prom Party, a grandiose trial of the Working Peasants Party was being prepared, on the grounds that they existed, never in actual fact, as an enormous organized underground force among the rural intelligentsia, including leaders of consumer and agriculture cooperatives and the more advanced upper layer of the peasantry, and supposedly were preparing to overthrow the dictatorship of the proletariat. At the trial of the Prom Party, this Working Peasants Party, the TKP, was referred to as if it were already known and under detention. Then, all of a sudden, one lovely night, Stalin reconsidered. Why? Maybe we will never know. Did he perhaps wish to save his soul? Too soon for that, it would seem. Did his sense of humor come to the fore? Was it all so deadly, monotonous, so bitter-tasting? But no one would ever dare to accuse Stalin of having a sense of humor. Likeliest of all, Stalin simply figured out that the whole countryside, not just two hundred thousand people, would soon die of famine anyway so why go to the trouble? And instantly this whole TKP trial was called off. All those who had confessed were told they could repudiate their confessions. One can picture their happiness. Paragraph piles on paragraph, year on year, and yet there is no way we can describe in sequence everything that took place. But the GPU did its job effectively. The GPU never let anything get by. But we must always remember that religious believers, of course, were being arrested uninterruptedly. There were, nonetheless, certain special dates and peak periods. There was a night of the struggle against religion in Leningrad on Christmas Eve, 1929, when they arrested a large part of the religious intelligentsia and held them, not just until morning either, and that was certainly no Christmas tale. Then in February 1932, again in Leningrad, Many churches were closed simultaneously while, at the same time, large-scale arrests were being made among the clergy, and there are still more dates and places, but they haven't been reported to us by anyone. Non-Orthodox sects were also under constant attack. The big solitaire game played with the socialists went on and on uninterruptedly, of course. In 1929, also, those historians who had not been sent abroad in time were arrested. 
From one end of the country to the other, nationalities kept pouring in. From 1928 on, it was time to call to a reckoning those late stragglers after the bourgeoisie, the NEP men. The usual practice was to impose them ever-increasingly and finally totally intolerable taxes. At a certain point, they could no longer pay. They were immediately arrested for bankruptcy, and their property was confiscated. The state needed property and gold. The famous gold fever began at the end of 1929. Who was arrested in the gold wave? All those who at one time or another, fifteen years before, had had a private business, had been involved in retail trade, had earned wages at a craft, and could have, according to the GPU's deductions, hoarded gold. But it so happened that they often had no gold. They had put their money into real estate or securities, which had been melted away or been taken away in the revolution, and nothing remained. They had high hopes, of course, in arresting dental technicians, jewelers, and watch repairmen. All were arrested, all were crammed into GPU cells in numbers no one had considered possible up to then. But that was all to the good. They would cough it up all the sooner. They even reached a point of such confusion that men and women were imprisoned in the same cells and used the latrine bucket in each other's presence. Who cared about those niceties? Give up your gold, vipers. The interrogators had one universal method. Feed the prisoners nothing but salty food and give them no water. Whoever coughed up gold got water. One gold piece for a fresh cup of water. People perish for cold metal. The crudest detective stories and operas about brigands were played out in real life on a vast national scale. And so the waves foamed and rolled, but over them all, in 1929 to 1930, billowed and gushed the multi-million wave of dispossessed kulaks. It was immeasurably large and could certainly have not been housed even in the highly developed network of Soviet interrogation prisons, which in any case were packed full by the gold wave. Instead, it bypassed the prisons, going directly to the transit prisons and camps, onto prisoner transports, into Gulag country. In sheer size, this non-recurring tidal wave, it was an ocean, swelled beyond the bounds of anything in the penal system of even an immense state can permit itself. There was nothing to be compared with it in all Russian history. It was the forced resettlement of a whole people, an ethnic catastrophe. This wave was also distinct from all those which preceded it, because no one fussed about with taking the head of the family first, and then working out what to do with the rest of the family. On the contrary, in this wave, they burned out whole nests, whole families, from the start. And they watched, jealously to be sure, that none of the children, fourteen, ten, even six years old, got away. To the last scrapings, all had to go down the same road, to the same common destruction. This was the first such experiment, at least in modern history. It was subsequently repeated by Hitler with the Jews, and again by Stalin with nationalities which were disloyal to him or suspected by him. Like raging beasts, abandoning every concept of humanity, abandoning all humane principles which had evolved through the millennia, the authorities began to round up the very best farmers and their families, and to drive them, stripped of their possessions, naked, into the northern wastes, into the tundra and the taiga. But new waves rolled from the collectivized villages. One of them was a wave of agricultural wreckers. Everywhere they began to discover wrecker agronomists. There was even a wave for snipping ears, the nighttime snipping of individual ears of grain in the field, a totally new type of agricultural activity, a new type of harvesting. The wave of those caught doing this was not small. It included many tens of thousands of peasants, many of them not even adults, but boys, girls, and small children whose elders had sent them out at night to snip because they had no hope of receiving anything from the collective farm for their daytime labor. For this bitter and not very productive occupation, an extreme of poverty to which the peasants had not been driven even in serfdom, the courts handed out a full measure, ten years for what ranked as an especially dangerous theft of socialist property.
Paradoxically enough, every act of the all-penetrating, eternally wakeful organs, over a span of many years, was based solely on one article of the 140 Articles of the Non-General Division of the Criminal Code of 1926. One can find more epithets in praise of this article than Turgenev once assembled to praise the Russian language, or Nukasrov to praise Mother Russia. Great, powerful, abundant, highly ramified, multiform, wide-sweeping, 58 which summed up the world not so much through the exact terms of its sections as in their extended dialectical interpretation. Who among us has not experienced its all-encompassing embrace? In all truth, there is no step, thought, action, or lack of action under the heavens which could not be punished by the heavy hand of Article 58. There was no section in Article 58 which is interpreted as broadly and with so ardent a revolutionary conscience as Section 10. Its definition was, Propaganda or agitation containing an appeal for the overthrow, subverting, or weakening of the Soviet power, and, equally, the dissemination or preparation of possession of literary materials of similar content. For this section, in peacetime, a minimum penalty was only set, not any less, not too light. No upper limit was set for the maximum penalty. Here's one vignette from those years as it actually occurred. A district party conference was underway in the Moscow province. It was presided over by a new secretary of the district party committee, replacing one recently arrested. At the conclusion of the conference, a tribute to Comrade Stalin was called for. Of course, everyone stood up, just as everyone had leaped to his feet during the conference at every mention of his name. The small hall echoed with stormy applause, rising to an ovation. For three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, the stormy applause, rising to an ovation, continued. But palms were getting sore, and raised arms were already aching and the older people were panting from exhaustion. It was becoming insufferably silly even to those who really adored Stalin. However, who would dare be the first to stop? The secretary of the district committee could have done it. He was standing on the platform, and it was he who had just called for the ovation. But he was a newcomer. He had taken the place of a man who'd been arrested. He was afraid. After all, NKVD men were standing in the hall applauding and watching to see who quit first. And in that obscure, small hall, unknown to the leader, the applause went on six, seven, eight minutes. They were done for. Their goose was cooked. They couldn't stop now till they collapsed with heart attacks. At the rear of the hall, which was crowded, they could of course cheat a bit, clap less frequently, less vigorously, not so eagerly, but up there with the presidium where everyone could see them, the director of the local paper factory, an independent and strong-minded man, stood with the presidium. Aware of all the falsity and all the impossibility of the situation, he still kept on applauding. Nine minutes. Ten. In anguish, he watched the secretary of the district party committee, but the latter dared not stop. Insanity to the last man with make-believe enthusiasm on their faces, looking at each other with faint hope. The district leaders were just going to go on and on, applauding till they fell where they stood, till they were carried out of the hall on stretchers. And even then, those who were left would not falter. Then, after eleven minutes, the director of the paper factory assumed a business-like expression and sat down in his seat. And, oh, a miracle took place. Where had the universal, uninhibited, indescribable enthusiasm gone? To a man, everyone else stopped dead and sat down. They had been saved. The squirrel had been smart enough to jump off his revolving wheel. That, however, was how they discovered who the independent people were, and that was how they went about eliminating them. That same night the factory director was arrested. They easily pasted ten years on him on the pretext of something quite different, but after he had signed Form 206, the final document of the interrogation, his interrogator reminded him, Don't ever be the first to stop applauding. 
And just what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to stop? Now that's what Darwin's natural selection is, and that's also how to grind people down with stupidity. But today a new myth is being created. Every story of 1937 that is printed, every reminiscence that is published, relates without exception the tragedy of the communist leaders. They have kept on assuring us, and we have unwittingly fallen for it, that the history of 1937 and 1938 consisted chiefly of the arrests of the big communists, and virtually no one else. But out of the millions arrested at that time, Important party and state officials could not possibly have represented more than 10%. Most of the relatives standing in line with food parcels outside the Leningrad prisons were lower-class women, the sort who sold milk. The real law underlying the arrests of those years was the assignment of quotas, the norms set, the planned allocations. Every city, every district, Every military unit was assigned a specific quota of arrests to be carried out by a stipulated time. From then on, everything else depended on the ingenuity of the security operations personnel. The former Czechist Alexander Kalganov recalls that a telegram arrived in Tashkent. Send 200. They had just finished one clean-out, and it seemed as if there was no one else to take. Well, true, they had just brought in about fifty more from the districts, and then they had an idea. They would reclassify as fifty-eights all the non-political offenders being held by the police. No sooner said than done. But despite that, they had still not filled the quota, and at that precise moment the police reported that a gypsy band had impudently encamped on one of the city squares and asked what to do with them. Someone had another bright idea. They surrounded the encampment and raked in all the gypsy men from seventeen to sixty as fifty-eights. They had fulfilled the plan. Just as the intelligentsia had never been overlooked in previous waves, it was not neglected in this one. A student's denunciation that a certain lecturer in a higher educational institution kept citing Lenin and Marx frequently, but Stalin, not at all, was all that was needed for the lecturer not to show up for lecturers any more. And what if he cited no one? Arrests rolled through the streets and apartment houses like an epidemic. Just as people transmit an epidemic infection from one to another without knowing it, by such innocent means as a handshake, a breath, handing someone something, so, too, they passed on the infection of inevitable arrest by a handshake by a breath, by a chance meeting on the street. For if you are destined to confess tomorrow that you organized an underground group to poison the city's water supply, and if today I shake hands with you on the street, that means I, too, am doomed. The reverse wave of 1939 was an unheard-of incident in the history of the organs, a blot on their record. But in fact, this reverse wave was not large. It included about 1-2% to 2 of those who had been arrested but not yet convicted, who had not yet been sent away to far-off places and had not yet perished. It was not large, but it was put to effective use. It was like giving back one kopeck change from a ruble, but it was necessary in order to heap all the blame on that dirty Yezov, to strengthen the newcomer, Beria, and to cause the leader himself to shine more brightly. With this kopeck, they skillfully drove the ruble right into the ground. After all, if they had sorted things out and freed some people, and even the newspaper wrote intrepidly about individual cases of persons who had been slandered, it meant that the rest of those arrested were indeed scoundrels, and those who returned kept silent. They had signed pledges not to speak out. They were mute with terror. And there were very few who knew even a little about the secrets of the archipelago. But for that matter, they soon took that kopeck back. During those same years, and via those same sections of the boundless Article 58. Well, who in 1940 noticed the wave of wives arrested for failure to renounce their husbands? And who in Tambov remembers that during that year of peace they arrested an entire jazz orchestra playing at the modern cinema theater because they all turned out to be enemies of the people? And who noticed the 30,000 Czechs who in 1939 fled from occupied Czechoslovakia 
to their Slavic kinfolk in the USSR. It was impossible to guarantee that a single one of them was not a spy. They sent them all off to northern camps. And was it not, indeed, in 1939 that we reached out our helping hands to the West Ukrainians and the West Belarusians and, in 1940, to the Baltic states and the Moldavians? It turns out that our brothers badly needed to be purged, and from them, too, flowed waves of social prophylaxis. They took those who were too independent, too influential, along with those who were too well-to-do, too intelligent, too noteworthy. They took, particularly, many Poles from the former Polish provinces. They arrested officers everywhere. Thus the population was shaken up, forced into silence, and left without any possible leaders of resistance. Thus it was that wisdom was instilled, that former ties and former friendships were cut off. Finland ceded its isthmus to us with zero population. Nevertheless, the removal and resettlement of all persons with Finnish blood took place throughout Soviet Karelia and in Leningrad in 1940. We didn't notice that wavelet. We have no Finnish blood. In the Finnish war, we undertook our first experiment in convicting our war prisoners as traitors to the motherland. The first such experiment in human history. And would you believe it? We didn't notice. That was the rehearsal. Just at that moment the war burst upon us, and with it a massive retreat. It was essential to evacuate swiftly everyone who could be got out of the western republics that were being abandoned to the enemy. In the rush, entire military units, regiments, anti-aircraft and artillery batteries were left behind intact in Lithuania. But they still managed to get out several thousand families of unreliable Lithuanians. From June 23rd on, in Latvia and Estonia, they speeded up the arrests. But the ground was burning under them, and they were forced to leave even faster. They forgot to take whole fortresses with them, like the one at Brest, but they did not forget to shoot down political prisoners in the cells and the courtyards of Lv, Rovno, Tallinn, and many other western prisons. In the Tartu prison they shot 192 prisoners and threw their corpses down a well. How can one visualize it? You know nothing. The door of your cell opens, and they shoot you. You cry out in your death agony, and there is no one to hear your cries or tell them except the prison stones. They say, however, that there were some who weren't successfully finished off, and we may someday read a book about that, too. In 1941, the Germans went around Tagenrog, cutting it off so swiftly that prisoners were left in freight wagons at the railway station where they had been brought to be evacuated. What should one do with them? Certainly not set them free nor leave them to the Germans. Oil tank trucks were rushed to the station and the wagons were drenched with oil and set on fire. All the prisoners were burned alive. In the rear, the first wartime wave was for those spreading rumors and panic. That was the language of a special decree, outside the code, issued in the first days of the war. Then there was a wave of those who failed to turn in radio receivers or radio parts. For one radio tube found, as a result of denunciation, they gave ten years. And there was the wave of Germans. Germans living on the Volga, colonists in the Ukraine and the North Caucasus, and all Germans in general who lived anywhere in the Soviet Union. The determinate factor here was blood, and even heroes of the Civil War and old members of the party who were German were sent off into exile. By the end of the summer of 1941, becoming bigger in the autumn, the wave of the encircled was surging in. These were the defenders of their native land, the very same warriors whom the cities had seen off to the front with bouquets and bands a few months before, who had then sustained the heaviest tank assaults of the Germans, and in the general chaos, and through no fault of their own, had spent a certain time as isolated units not in enemy imprisonment, not at all, but in temporary encirclement, and later had broken out. And instead of being given a brotherly embrace on their return, such as every other army in the world would have given them, instead of being given a chance to rest up, to visit their families, and then return to their units, they were held on suspicion, disarmed, deprived of all rights, 
and taken away in groups to identification points and screening centers where officers of the special branches started interrogating them, distrusting not only their every word but their very identity. The victory outside Moscow gave rise to a new wave, guilty Muscovites. Looking at things after the event, it turns out that those Muscovites it turned out that those Muscovites who had not run away and who had not been evacuated, but had fearlessly remained in the threatened capital, which had been abandoned by the authorities, were taken by that very token under suspicion either of subverting governmental authority, 5810, or of staying on to await the Germans. From 1943 on, when the war turned in our favor, there began the multi-million wave from the occupied territories and from Europe, which got larger every year up to 1946, and dismissed the thought that honorable participation in an underground anti-German organization would surely protect one from being arrested in this wave. More than one case proved this. Those who were in Europe got the stiffest punishments of all even though they went there as conscripted German slaves. That was because they had seen something of a European life and could talk about it. That was also the reason why they sentenced the majority of war prisoners. It was not simply because they had allowed themselves to be captured, particularly those POWs who had seen a little more of the West than a German death camp. This was obvious from the fact that interned persons were sentenced as severely as POWs. For example, during the first days of the war, one of our destroyers went aground on Swedish territory. Its crew proceeded to live freely in Sweden during all the rest of the war. After the war, Sweden returned them to us along with the destroyer. Their treason to the motherland was indubitable, but somehow the case didn't get off the ground. They let them go their different ways and pasted them with anti-Soviet agitation for their lovely stories in praise of freedom and good eating in capitalist Sweden. This was the Kadenko group. This is an anecdote of that group. What happened to this group later makes an anecdote. In camp, they kept their mouths shut about Sweden, fearing they'd get a second term. But people in Sweden somehow found out about their fate and published slanderous reports in the press. By that time, the boys were scattered far and near among various camps. Suddenly, on the strength of special orders, they were all yanked out and taken to the crusty prison in Leningrad. Then they were dressed with modest elegance, rehearsed on what to say and to whom, and warned that any bastard who dared to squeak out of turn would get a bullet in his skull. And they were led off to a press conference for a selected foreign known the entire crew in Sweden. The former internees bore themselves cheerfully, described where they were living, studying, and working, and expressed their indignation at the bourgeois slander they had read about not long before in the Western press. After all, Western papers are sold in the Soviet Union at every corner newsstand. And so they had written to one another and decided to gather in Leningrad. Their travel expenses didn't bother them in the least. Their fresh, shiny appearance completely gave the lie to the newspaper canard. The discredited journalists went off to write their apologies. It was wholly inconceivable to the Western imagination that there could be any other explanation and the men who had been the subjects of the interview were taken off to a bath, had their hair cut off again, were dressed in their former rags, and sent back to the same camps. But because they had conducted themselves properly, none of them was given a second term. During the last years of the war, of course, there was a wave of German war criminals who were selected from POW camps and transferred by court verdict to the jurisdiction of Gulag. In 1945, even though the war with Japan didn't last three weeks, great numbers of Japanese war prisoners were raked in for urgent construction projects in Siberia and Central Asia, and the same process of selecting war criminals for Gulag was carried out among them. At the end of 1944, when our army entered the Balkans, and especially in 1945, when it reached into Central Europe, a wave of Russian emigres flowed through the channels of Gulag. 
Most were old men who had left at the time of the revolution, but there were also young people who had grown up outside Russia. They usually dragged off the menfolk and left the women and children where they were. It is true that they did not take everyone, but they took all those who, in the course of twenty-five years, had expressed even the mildest political views, or who had expressed them earlier during the revolution. They did not touch those who had lived a purely vegetable existence. The main waves came from Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia. There were fewer from Austria and Germany. In the other countries of Eastern Europe, there were hardly any Russians. As if in response to 1945, a wave of emigres poured from Manchuria too. Some of them were not arrested immediately. Entire families were encouraged to return to the homeland as free persons. But once back in Russia, they were separated and sent into exile or taken to prison. All during 1945 and 1946, a big wave of genuine, at long last, enemies of the Soviet government flowed into the archipelago. These were the Vlasov men, the Krasnov Cossacks, and Muslims from the national units created under Hitler. Some of them had acted out of conviction, others had been merely involuntary participants. Along with them were seized not less than one million fugitives from the Soviet government, civilians of all ages and both sexes who had been fortunate enough to find shelter in Allied territory, but who in 1946 to 1947 were perfidiously returned by Allied authorities into Soviet hands. An excerpt. It is surprising that in the West, where political secrets cannot be kept long, since they inevitably come out in print or are disclosed, the secrets of this particular act of betrayal has been very well and carefully kept by the British and American governments. This is truly the last secret, or one of the last, of the Second World War. Having often encountered these peoples in having often encountered these people in camps, I was unable to believe for a whole quarter century that the public in the West knew nothing of this action of the Western governments, this massive handing over of ordinary Russian people to retribution and death. Not until 1973, in the Sunday Oklahoman of January 21st was an article published by Julius Epstein published, and I am here going to be so bold as to express gratitude on behalf of the mass of those who perished and those few left alive. One random little document was published from the many volumes of the hitherto concealed case history of forced repatriation to the Soviet Union. After having remained unmolested in British hands for two years, they had allowed themselves to be lulled into a false sense of security, and they were therefore taken completely by surprise. They did not realize they were being repatriated. They were mainly simple peasants with bitter personal grievances against the Bolsheviks. The English authorities gave them the treatment the English authorities gave them the treatment reserved in the case of every other nation for war criminals alone that of being handed over against their will to the captors who, incidentally, were not expected to give them a fair trial. They were all sent to destruction on the archipelago. The American authorities did the same. In Bavaria, as well as on the U.S. territory, they delivered tens of thousands of Soviet citizens to a cruel fate, turning them over to the Soviets against their will. A certain number of Poles, members of the Home Army, followers of Mikulicic, arrived in Gulag in 1945 via our prisons. There were a certain number of Romanians and Hungarians. At war's end and for many years after, there flowed uninterruptedly an abundant wave of Ukrainian nationalists. We have to remind our readers once again that this chapter does not attempt by any means to list all the waves which fertilized Gulag but only those which had a political coloration. And just as, in a course in physiology, after a detailed description of the circulation of the blood, one can begin over again and describe in detail the lymphatic system, one could begin again and describe the waves of non-political offenders and habitual criminals from 1918 to 1953. And this description, too, would run long. It would bring to light many famous decrees, now in part forgotten, 
even though they had never been repealed, which supplied abundant human material for the insatiable archipelago. We are not going to go into a lengthy, lavish examination of the waves of non-political offenders and common criminals, but, having reached 1947, we cannot remain silent about one of the most grandiose of Stalin's decrees. We have already mentioned the famous law of seven-eight, or seven-eighths, on the basis of which they arrested people right and left, for taking a stalk of grain, a cucumber, two small potatoes, a chip of wood, a spool of thread, all of whom got ten years. But the requirements of the times, as Stalin understood them, had changed, and the tenor, which had seemed adequate on the eve of a terrible war, seemed now, in the wake of a worldwide historical victory, inadequate. And so again, in complete disregard of the code, and totally overlooking the fact that many different articles and decrees on the subject of thefts and robberies already existed, on June 4, 1947, a decree was issued which outdid them all. It was instantly christened four-sixths by the undismayed prisoners. The advantages of the new decree lay first of all in its newness. From the very moment it appeared, a torrent of the crimes it specified would be bound to burst forth, thereby providing an abundant wave of newly sentenced prisoners. But it offered an even greater advantage in prison terms. If a young girl sent into the fields to get a few ears of grain, took along two friends for company, an organized gang, or some twelve-year-old youngsters went after cucumbers or apples, they were liable to get twenty years in camp. In factories, the maximum sentence was raised to twenty-five years. This sentence, called a quarter, had been introduced a few days earlier to replace the death penalty, which had been abolished as a humane act. And then, at long last, an ancient shortcoming of the law was corrected. Previously, the only failure to make a denunciation which qualified as a crime against the state had been in connection with political offenses. But now, simple failure to report the theft of state or collective farm property earned three years of camp or seven years of exile. Stalin's new line, suggesting it was necessary in the wake of victory over fascism, to jail more people more energetically and for longer terms than ever before, had immediate repercussions, of course, on political prisoners. The year 1948 to 1949, notable throughout Soviet public life for intensified persecution and vigilance, was marked by one tragic comedy hitherto unheard of even in Stalinist anti-justice, that of the repeaters. That is what, in the language of Gulag, they called those still undestroyed unfortunates of 1937 vintage who had succeeded in surviving ten impossible, unendurable years, and who in 1947 to 1948 had timidly stepped forth onto the land of freedom. Worn out, broken in health, but hoping to live out in peace what little of their lives remained, but some sort of savage fantasy, or stubborn malice, or unsated vengeance, pushed the victorious Generalissimo into issuing the order to arrest all those cripples over again, without any new charges. It was even disadvantageous, both economically and politically, to clog the meat grinder with his own refuse, but Stalin issued the order anyway. Here was a case in which a historical personality simply behaved capriciously toward historical necessity. At this point, the autocrat decided it wasn't enough to arrest just those who had survived since 1937. What about the children of his sworn enemies? They, too, must be imprisoned. They were growing up, and they might just have notions of vengeance. By 1948, after the great European displacement, Stalin had succeeded once again in tightly barricading himself in and pulling the ceiling down closer to him. In this reduced space, he had recreated the tension of 1937. And so, in 1948, 1949, and 1950, there flowed past alleged spies, 
ten years earlier they had been German and Japanese, now they were Anglo-American. Believers, this wave non-Orthodox for the most part. Those geneticists and plant breeders, disciples of the late Vavilov and of Mendel, who had not been previously arrested. Just plain ordinary thinking people, and students with particular severity, who had not been sufficiently scared away from the West. It was fashionable to charge them with V.A.T., Praise of American Technology, V.A.D., Praise of American Democracy, and P.Z., Toadyism Toward the West. These waves were not unlike those of 1937, but the sentences were different. The standard sentence was no longer the patriarchal ten-ruble bill, but the new Stalinist twenty-five. By now the tenor was for juveniles. By this time resistance in Lithuania and Estonia had already come to an end. But in 1945 new waves of social prophylaxis to assure collectivization kept coming. They took whole trainloads of city dwellers and peasants from the three Baltic republics into Siberian exile. The historical rhythm was disrupted in these republics. They were forced to recapitulate in brief, limited periods the more extended experience of the rest of the country. In 1948, one more nationalist wave went into exile, that of the Greeks who inhabited the areas around the Sea of Azov, the Kuban, and the Sukumi. They had done nothing to offend the father during the war, but now he avenged himself on them for his failure in Greece, or so it seemed. This wave, too, was evidently the fruit of his personal insanity. During the last years of Stalin's life, a wave of Jews became noticeable. From 1950 on, they were hauled in little by little as cosmopolites. And that was why the doctor's case was cooked up. It would appear that Stalin intended to arrange a great massacre of the Jews. But this became the first plan of his life to fail. God told him, apparently with the help of human hands, to depart from his ribcage. The preceding exposition should have made it clear, one would think, that in the removal of millions and in the populating of Gulag, consistent, cold-blooded planning and never-weakening persistence were at work. That we never did have any empty prisons, merely prisons which were full, or prisons which were very, very overcrowded. And that, while you occupied yourself to your heart's content studying the safe secrets of the atomic nucleus, researching the influence of Heidegger on Sather, or collecting Picasso reproductions, while you rode off in your railroad sleeping compartment to vacation resorts, or finished building your country house near Moscow, the Black Marias rolled incessantly through the streets and the gabesty, the state security men knocked at doors and rang doorbells. And I think this exposition proves the organs always earned their pay. End of chapter two. Chapter three. The Interrogation. If the intellectuals in the plays of Chekhov, who spent all their time guessing what would happen in the twenty, thirty, or forty years, had been told that in forty years interrogation by torture would be practiced in Russia, that prisoners would have their skulls squeezed with iron rings, that a human being would be lowered into an acid bath, that they would be trussed up naked to be bitten by ants and bedbugs, that a ramrod heated over a primus stove would be thrust up their anal canal, the secret brand, that a man's genitals would be slowly crushed beneath the toe of a jackboot, and that in the luckiest possible circumstances, Prisoners will be tortured by being kept from sleeping for a week, by thirst, and by being beaten to a bloody pulp. Not one of Chekhov's plays would have gotten to its end, because all the heroes would have gone off to insane asylums. Yes, not only Chekhov's heroes, but what a normal Russian at the beginning of the century, including any member of the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, could have believed, would have tolerated, such a slander against the bright future, what had been acceptable under Tsar Alexei Mikhailkovich in the 17th century, what had already been regarded as barbarism under Peter the Great, what might have been used against ten or twenty people in all during the time of Byron in the mid-18th century, what had already become totally impossible under Catherine the Great, was all being practiced 
during the flowering of the glorious 20th century. In a society based on socialist principles, and at a time when airplanes were flying and the radio and talking films had already appeared, not by one scoundrel alone in one secret place only, but by tens of thousands of specially trained human beasts standing over millions of defenseless victims. Was it only that explosion of atavism, which is now evasively called the cult of personality, that was so horrible? Or was it even more horrible that during those same years, in 1937 itself, we celebrated Pushkin's centennial? And that we shamelessly continued to stage those self-same Chekhov plays, even though the answers to them had already come in? Is it not still more dreadful that we are now being told, 30 years later, don't talk about it? If we start to recall the suffering of millions, we are told it will distort the historical perspective. If we doggedly seek out the essence of our mortality, we are told it will darken our material progress. Let's think rather about the blast furnaces, the rolling mills that were built, the canals that were dug. No, better not talk about the canals. Then maybe about the gold of the Kalima. No, maybe we ought not to talk about that either. Well, we can talk about anything, so long as we do it adroitly, so long as we glorify it. It is really hard to see why we condemned the Inquisition. Wasn't it true that beside the autos de fe, magnificent services were offered the Almighty? Is it hard to see why we are so down on serfdom? After all, no one forbade the peasants to work every day. And they could sing carols at Christmas, too. And for Trinity Day, the girls wove wreaths. In his Dictionary of Definitions, Dal makes the following distinction. An inquiry is distinguished from an investigation by the fact that it is carried out to determine whether there is a basis for proceeding to investigation. Oh, sacred simplicity! The organs have never heard of such a thing as an inquiry. Lists of names prepared up above, or an initial suspicion, or a denunciation by an informer, or any anonymous denunciation, were all that was needed to bring about the arrest of the suspect followed by the inevitable formal charge. The time allotted for investigation was not used to unravel the crime, but, in ninety-five cases out of a hundred, to exhaust, wear down, weaken, and render helpless the defendant, so that he would want it to end at any cost. As long ago as 1919, the chief method used by the interrogator was a revolver on the desk. That was how they investigated not only political, but also ordinary misdemeanors and violations. At the trial of the Main Fuels Committee in 1921, the accused Makrovskaya complained that at her interrogation she had been drugged with cocaine. The prosecutor replied, if she had declared that she had been treated rudely, that they had threatened to shoot her, this might just be barely believable. The frightening revolver lies there and sometimes it is aimed at you. And the interrogator doesn't tire himself out thinking of what you are guilty of, but shouts, Come on, talk! You know what about! That was what the interrogator, Kaken, demanded of Skripnikova in 1927. That was what they demanded of Vitovsky in 1929. And 25 years later, nothing had changed. In 1952, Anna Skripnikova was undergoing her fifth imprisonment and Sivakov, chief of the investigative department of the Orzanikis State Security Administration, said to her, The prison doctor reports you have a blood pressure of 2040 over 120. That's too low, you bitch! We're going to drive it up to 340 so you'll kick the bucket, you viper. And with no black and blue marks, no beatings, no broken bones, we'll just not let you sleep. She was in her fifties at the time, and if back in her cell, after a night spent in interrogation, she closed her eyes during the day, the jailer broke in and shouted, Open your eyes or I'll howl you off that cot by the legs and tie you to the wall standing up. As early as 1921, interrogations usually took place at night. At that time, too, they shone automobile lights in the prisoner's face, and at the Libyanka in 1926, they made use of the hot air heating system to fill the cell first with icy cold, and then with stinking hot air. And there was an airtight cork-lined cell in which there was no ventilation, and they cooked the prisoners. A participant in the Yaroslavl uprising of 1918, Vasily Alexandrovich Kasyanov, 
described how the heat in such a cell was turned up until your blood began to ooze through your pores. When they saw this happening through the peephole, they would put the prisoner on a stretcher and take him off to sign his confession. The hot and salty methods of the gold period are well known, and in Georgia in 1926 they used lighted cigarettes to burn the hands of prisoners under interrogation. In Mateki prison they pushed prisoners into a cesspool in the dark. There is a very simple connection here. Once it was established that charges had to be brought at any cost, and despite everything, threats, violence, tortures became inevitable. And the more fantastic the charges were, the more ferocious the interrogation had to be in order to force the required confession. Given the fact that the cases were always fabricated, violence and torture had to accompany them. This was not peculiar to 1937 alone. It was a chronic general practice. And that is why it seems strange today to read in the recollections of former Zex that torture was permitted from the spring of 1938 on. There were never any spiritual or moral barriers which could have held the organs back from torture. In the early post-war years, in the Cheka Weekly, The Red Sword and the Red Terror, the admissibility of torture from a Marxist point of view was openly debated. Judging by the subsequent course of events, the answer deduced was positive, though not universally so. It is more accurate to say that if before 1938, some kind of formal documentation was required as a preliminary to torture, as well as specific permission for each case under investigation, even though such permission was easy to obtain, then in the years 1937 to 1938, in the view of the extraordinary situation prevailing, the specified millions of admissions to the archipelago had to be ground through the apparatus of individual interrogation in specified limited periods something which had simply not happened in the mass ways of kulaks and nationalities. Interrogators were allowed to use violence and torture on an unlimited basis, at their own discretion, and in accordance with the demands of their work quotas and the amount of time they were given. The types of torture used were not regulated, and every kind of ingenuity was permitted, no matter what. In 1939, such indiscriminate authorization was withdrawn and once again written permission was required for torture, and perhaps it may not have been so easily granted. Of course, simple threats, blackmail, deception, exhaustion through enforced sleeplessness, and punishment cells were never prohibited. Then from the end of the war and throughout the post-war years, certain categories of prisoners were established by decree for whom a broad range of torture was automatically permitted. Among these were nationalists, particularly the Ukrainians and the Lithuanians, especially those in the cases where an underground organization existed, or was suspected, that had to be completely uncovered, which meant obtaining the names of everyone involved from those already arrested. It would also be incorrect to ascribe to 1937 the discovery that a personal confession of an accused person was more important than any other kind of proof or facts. This concept had already been formulated in the 20s, and 1937 was just the year when the brilliant teachings of Vyshinsky came into its own. Incidentally, even at that time, his teaching was transmitted only to interrogators and prosecutors for the sake of their morale and steadfastness. The rest of us only learned about it 20 years later, when it had already come into disfavor through subordinate clauses and minor paragraphs of newspaper articles which treated the subject as if it had long widely been known to all. It turns out that in that terrible year, Andrei Yanoerevik, one who longs to blurt out January Evik, Vyshinsky, availing himself of the most flexible dialectics, of a sort nowadays not permitted either Soviet citizens or electronic calculators, since to them yes is yes and no is no, pointed out in a report which became famous in certain circles that it is never possible for mortal men to establish absolute truth, but relative truth only. He then proceeded to a further step, which jurists of the last two thousand years had not been willing to take, that the truth established by interrogation and trial could not be absolute, but only, so to speak, relative. Therefore, when we sign a sentence ordering someone to be shot, we can never be absolutely certain, but only approximately, 
in view of certain hypotheses, and in a certain sense, that we are punishing a guilty person. Thence arose the most practical conclusion, that it was useless to seek absolute evidence, for evidence is always relative, or unchallengeable witnesses, for they can say different things at different times. The proofs of guilt were relative, approximate, and the interrogator could find them, even when there was no evidence and no witness, without leaving his office, basing his conclusions not only on his own intellect, but also on his party sensitivity, his moral forces. In other words, the superiority of someone who has slept well, has been well fed, and has not been beaten up. And on his character, i.e. his willingness to apply cruelty. In only one respect did Vyshinsky fail to be consistent and retreat from a dialectical logic. For some reason, the executioner's bullet, which he allowed, was not relative, but absolute. Thus it was that the conclusions of advanced Soviet jurisprudence, proceedings in a spiral, returned to barbaric or medieval standards. Like medieval torturers, our interrogators, prosecutors, and judges agreed to accept the confession of the accused as the chief proof of guilt. However, the simple-minded Middle Ages used dramatic and picturesque methods to squeeze out the desired confessions. The rack, the wheel, the bed of nails, impalement, hot coals, etc. In the 20th century, taking advantage of our more highly developed medical knowledge and extensive prison experience, and some seriously defended a doctoral dissertation on this theme, people came to realize that the accumulation of such impressive apparatus was superfluous in that, on a mass scale, it was also cumbersome. In addition, there was evidently one other circumstance. As always, Stalin did not pronounce that final word, and his subordinates had to guess what he wanted. Thus, like a jackal, he left himself an escape hole, so that he could, if he wanted, beat a retreat and write about dizziness from success. After all, for the first time in human history, the calculated torture of millions was being undertaken. And even with all his strength and power, Stalin could not be absolutely sure of success. In dealing with such an enormous mass of material, the effects of the experiment might differ from those obtained from a smaller sample. An unforeseen explosion might take place, a slippage in a geological fault, or even worldwide disclosure. In any case, Stalin had to remain innocent his sacred vestments angelically pure. We are therefore forced to conclude that no list of tortures and torments existed in printed form for the guidance of interrogators. Instead, all that was required was for every interrogation department to supply the tribunal within a specified period with a stipulated number of rabbits who had confessed everything. And it was simply stated, orally but often, that any measures and means employed were good, since they were being used for a lofty purpose, that no interrogator would be made to answer for the death of an accused, and that the prison doctor should interfere as little as possible with the course of the investigation. In all probability, they exchanged experiences in camaraderie fashion. They learned from the most successful workers. Then, too, material rewards were offered, higher pay for the night work, bonus pay for fast work. And there were also definite warnings that interrogators who could not cope with their tasks, even the chief of some provincial NKVD administration, if some sort of mess developed, he could show Stalin his hands were clean. He had issued no direct instructions to use torture, but at the same time he had ensured that torture would be used. Let us try to list some of the simplest methods which break the will and the character of the prisoner without leaving marks on his body. Let us begin with psychological methods. These methods have enormous and even annihilating impact on rabbits who have never been prepared for prison suffering. And it isn't easy even for a person who holds strong convictions. 1. First of all, night. Why is it that all the main work of breaking down human souls went on at night? Why, from their very earliest years, did the organs select the night? Because at night, the prisoner, torn from sleep, even though he has not yet been tortured by sleeplessness, 
lacks his normal daytime equanimity and common sense. He is more vulnerable. Number two. Persuasion in a sincere tone is the very simplest method. Why play at cat and mouse, so to speak? After all, having spent some time along others undergoing interrogation, the prisoner has come to see what the situation is. And so the interrogator says to him in a lazily friendly way, Look, you're going to get a prison term, whatever happens. But if you resist, you'll croak right here in prison. But if you resist, you'll croak right here in prison. You'll lose your health. But if you go to camp, you'll have fresh air and sunlight. So why not sign right now? Very logical. And those who agree and sign are smart if... If the matter concerns only themselves. But that is rarely so. A struggle is inevitable. Another variant of the persuasion is particularly appropriate to the party member. If there are shortages and even famine in the country, then you as a Bolshevik have to make up your mind. Can you admit the whole party is to blame? Or the whole Soviet government? No. Of course not. The director of the Flax Depot hastened to reply. Then be brave and shoulder the blame yourself. And he did. Number three, foul language is not a clever method, but it can have a powerful impact on people who are well brought up, refined, delicate. I know of two cases involving priests who capitulated to foul language alone. One of them, in the Butyrki in 1944, was being interrogated by a woman. At first, when he'd come back to our cell, he couldn't say often enough how polite she was, but once he came back very despondent. And for a long time he refused to tell us how, with her legs crossed high, she had begun to curse. I regret that I cannot cite one of her little phrases here. Number four, psychological contrast, was sometimes effective. Sudden reversals of tone, for example. For a whole or part of the interrogation period, the interrogator would be extremely friendly, addressing the prisoner formally by first name and patronymic, and promising everything. Suddenly, he would brandish a paperweight and shout, Foo, you rat! I'll put nine grams of lead in your skull! And he would advance on the accused, clutching, hands outstretched as to grab him by the hair, fingernails like needles. This worked very, very well with women prisoners. Or as a variation on this, two interrogators would take turns. One would shout and bully. The other would be friendly, almost gentle. Each time the accused entered the office, he would tremble. Which would it be? He wanted to do everything to please the gentle one because of his different manner, even to the point of signing and confessing things that had never happened. Number five, preliminary humiliation was another approach. In the famous cellars of the Rostovan the Don GPU, House 33, which were lit like lens-like insets of thick glass on the sidewalk above the former storage basement, prisoners awaiting interrogation were made to lie face down for several hours in the main corridor, and forbidden to raise their heads or make a sound. They lay this way like Muslims at prayer, until the guard touched a shoulder and took them off to interrogation. Another case, at the Lubyanka, Alexandra O., refused to give the testimony demanded of her. She was transferred to Lefortovo. In the admitting office, a woman jailer ordered her to undress, allegedly for a medical examination, took away her clothes, and locked her in a box naked. At that point, the men jailers begin to peer through the peephole and to appraise her female attributes with loud laughs. If one were systematically to question former prisoners, many more such examples would certainly emerge. They all had but a single purpose, to dishearten and humiliate. Number six. Any method of inducing extreme confusion in the accused might be employed. Here is how F.I.V. from Krasnogorsk, Moscow province, was interrogated. During the interrogation, the interrogator, a woman, undressed in front of him by stages, a striptease, all the time continuing the interrogation as if nothing were going on. She walked about the room and came close to him and tried to get him to give in. Perhaps this satisfied some personal quirk in her, but it may also have been cold-blooded calculation, an attempt to get the accused so muddled that he would sign. And she was in no danger, she had her pistol, and she had her alarm bell. Number seven. Intimidation was a very widely used and very varied. It was often accompanied by enticement and promises, which were, of course, false. 
in 1924. If you don't confess, you'll go to the Solovetsky Islands. Anyone who confesses is turned loose. In 1944, which camp you'll be sent to depends on us. Camps are different. We've got hard labor camps now. If you confess, you'll go to an easy camp. If you're stubborn, you'll get 25 years in handcuffs in the mines. Another form of intimidation was threatening a prisoner with a prison worse than the one he was in. If you keep on being stubborn, we'll send you to Lefortovo. If you are in the Libyanka. To Sukhanovka. If you are in Lefortovo, they'll find another way to talk to you there. You have already gotten used to things where they are. The regimen seems to be not so bad. And what kind of torments await you elsewhere? Yes, and you also have to be transported there. Should you give in? Intimidation worked beautifully on those who had not yet been arrested, but had simply received an official summons to the Bolshoi Dome. The big house. He, or she, still had a lot to lose. He, or she, was frightened of everything. That they wouldn't let him, or her, out today. That they would confiscate his, or her, belongings or apartment. He would be ready to give all kinds of testimony and make all kinds of concessions in order to avoid these dangers. She, of course, would be ignorant of the criminal code, and, at the very least, and at the start of the questioning, they would push a sheet of paper in front of her with a fake citation from the code. I have been warned that for giving false testimony, five years of imprisonment. In actual fact, under Article 95, it is two years. For refusal to give testimony, five years. In actual fact, under Article 92, it is up to three months. Here, then... One more of the interrogator's basic methods has entered the picture and will continue to re-enter it. Number 8. The Lie We lambs were forbidden to lie, but the interrogator to tell us all the lies he felt like. Those articles of the law did not apply to him. We had even lost the yardstick with which to gauge. What does he get for lying? He could confront us with as many documents as he chose, bearing the forged signatures of our kinfolk and friends, and it would be just a skillful interrogation technique. Intimidation through enticement and lies was the fundamental method for bringing pressure on the relatives of the arrested person when they were called in to give testimony. If you don't tell us such and such, whatever was being asked, it's going to be even worse for him. You'll be destroying him completely. How hard for a mother to hear that. Signing this paper, pushed in front of the relatives, is the only way you can save him. Destroy him. Under the harsh laws of the Tsarist Empire, close relatives could refuse to testify, and even if they gave testimony at a preliminary investigation, they could choose to repudiate it and refuse to permit it to be used in court. And curiously enough, kinship or acquaintance with a criminal was never in itself considered evidence. Playing on one's affection for those one loved was a game that worked beautifully on the accused as well. It was the most effective of all methods of intimidation. One could break even a totally fearless person through his concern for those he loved. Oh, how foresighted was the saying, a man's family are his enemies. Remember the Tatar who bore his sufferings, his own and those of his wife, but could not endure his daughters. In 1930, Rimalis, a woman interrogator, used to threaten, will arrest your daughter and lock her in a cell with syphilitics. And that was a woman. They would threaten to arrest everyone you loved. Sometimes this will be done with sound effects. Your wife has already been arrested, but her further fate depends on you. They are questioning her in the next room. Just listen. And through the wall they can actually hear a woman weeping and screaming. After all, they sound alike. You're hearing it through a wall, and you're under a terrific strain and not in a state to play the expert on voice identification. Sometimes they simply play a recording of the voice of a typical wife, soprano or contralto, a labor-saving device suggested by some inventive genius. And then, without fakery, they actually show her to you through a glass door, as she walks along in silence, her head bent in grief. Yes, your own wife in the corridors of state security. You have destroyed her by your stubbornness. She has already been arrested. In actual fact, she has simply been summoned in connection with some insignificant procedural question and sent into the corridor at just the right moment after being told, don't raise your head or you'll be kept here. Or they give you a letter to read, and the handwriting is exactly like hers. I renounce you. After the filth they have told me about you, I don't need you anymore. 
And since such wives do exist in our country, and such letters as well, you are left to ponder in your heart, is that the kind of wife she really is? Just as there is no classification in nature with rigid boundaries, it is impossible rigidly to separate psychological methods from physical ones. Where, for example, should we classify the following amusement? Number 10. Sound effects. The accused is made to stand 20 to 25 feet away, and is then forced to speak more and more loudly and to repeat everything. This is not easy for someone already weakened to the point of exhaustion. Or two megaphones are constructed of rolled-up cardboard, and two interrogators, coming close to the prisoner, bellow in both ears, CONFESS, YOU RAT! The prisoner is deafened. Sometimes he actually loses his sense of hearing. But this method is uneconomical. The fact is that the interrogators like some diversion in their monotonous work, and so they vie in thinking up new ideas. Number 11. Tickling. This is also a diversion. The prisoner's arms and legs are bound or held down, and then the inside of his nose is tickled with a feather. The prisoner writhes. It feels as though someone were drilling into his brain. Number 12. A cigarette is put out on the accused skin. Already mentioned above. Number 13. Light effects involve the use of an extremely bright electric light in the small white-walled cell or box in which the accused is being held, a light which is never extinguished. The electricity saved by economies of school children and housewives. Your eyelids become inflamed, which is very painful. And then, in the interrogation room, searchlights are again directed in your eyes. Here is another imaginative trick. On the eve of May 1st, 1933, in the Khabarovsk GPU, for twelve hours, all night Chebateryev was not interrogated. No but was simply kept in a continual state of being led to interrogation. Hey, you! Hands behind your back! They led him out of the cell, up the stairs quickly into the interrogator's office. The guard left, but the interrogator, without asking one single question, and sometimes without even allowing Chibataryev to sit down, would pick up the telephone. Take the prisoner from 107! And so they came to get him and took him back to his cell. No sooner had he lain down in his board bunk than the lock rattled. Chepatoriev, to interrogation, hands behind your back. And when he got there, take the prisoner from 107. For that matter, the methods of bringing pressure to bear can begin a long time before the interrogator's office. Number 15. Prison begins with the box. In other words, what amounts to a closet or packing case. The human being has just been taken from freedom still in a state of inner turmoil, ready to explain, to argue, to struggle, is, when he first sets foot in the prison, clapped into a box, which sometimes has a lamp and a place where he can sit down, but which is sometimes as dark and constructed in such a way where he could only stand up and even then is squeezed against the door. And he is held there for several hours, or for half a day, or a day. During those hours he knows absolutely nothing, Will he perhaps be confined there his whole life? He has never in his life encountered anything like this, and he cannot guess at the outcome. Those first hours are passing when everything inside him is still ablaze from the unstilled storm in his heart. Some become despondent, and that's the time to subject them to their first interrogation. Others become angry, and that too is all to the good, for they may insult the interrogator right at the start, or make a slip, and it will be all the easier to cook up their case. Number 16. When boxes were short in supply, they used to have another method. In the Novo Cherkask NKVD, Yelena Strutinskaya was forced to remain seated on a stool in the corridor for six days in such a way that she did not lean against anything. She did not sleep, did not fall off, and did not get up from it. Six days. Just try to sit that way for six hours. Then again, as a variation, the prisoner can be forced to sit in a tall chair, of the kind used in laboratories, so that his feet do not reach the floor. They become very numb in this position. He is left sitting that way from eight to ten hours. Or else, during the interrogation itself, when the prisoner is out in plain view, he can be forced to sit in this way, as far forward as possible on the front edge. Move further forward, further still! of the chair so he is under painful pressure during the entire interrogation. 
He is not allowed to stir for several hours. Is that all? Yes, that's all. Just try it yourself. Number 17. Depending on local conditions, a divisional pit can be substituted for the box, as was done in the Gorokovitz army camps during World War II. The prisoner was pushed into such a pit, ten feet in depth, six and a half feet in diameter, and beneath the open sky, rain or shine, this pit was, for several days, both his cell and his latrine, and ten and a half ounces of bread and water were lowered to him on a cord. Imagine yourself in this situation after you've been arrested. Then you're all in a boil. Either identical orders to all special branches of the Red Army, or else the similarities of their situations in the field, led to the broad use of this method. Thus, in the 36th Motorized Infantry Division, a unit which took part in the Battle of Kalkin Gull, and which was encamped in the Mongolian desert in 1941, a newly arrested prisoner was, without explanation, given a spade by the chief of the special branch, Samulev, and ordered to dig a pit, the exact dimensions of a grave. Here is a hybridization of physical and psychological methods. When the prisoner had dug deeper than his own waist, they ordered him to stop and sit down on the bottom. His head was no longer visible. One guard kept watch over several such pits, and it was as though he were surrounded by empty space. They kept the accused in the desert with no protection from the Mongolian sun, and with no warm clothing against the cold of the night. But no tortures. Why waste effort on tortures? The ration they gave was three and a half ounces of bread per day, and one glass of water. Lieutenant Chopenyev, a giant, a boxer, twenty-one years old, spent a month imprisoned this way. Within ten days he was swarming with lice. After fifteen days, he was summoned to interrogation for the first time. Number 18. The accused could be compelled to stand on his knees. Not in some figurative sense, but literally, on his knees, without sitting back on his heels and with his back upright. People could be compelled to kneel in the interrogator's office or the corridor for twelve or even twenty-four or forty-eight hours. The interrogator himself could go home, sleep, amuse himself in one way or another. This was an organized system. Watch was kept over the kneeling prisoner, and the guards worked in shifts. What kind of prisoner was most vulnerable to such treatment? One already broken, already inclined to surrender. It was also a good method to use with women. Ivanov Razumenek reports a variation of it. Having set young Lord Kibbenids on his knees, the interrogator urinated on his face. And what happened, unbroken by anything else, Lord Kippenids was broken by this, which shows that the method also worked well on proud people. Number 19. Then there is the method of simply compelling a prisoner to stand there. This can be arranged so that the accused stands only while being interrogated, because that too exhausts and breaks a person down. It can be set up another way so that the prisoner sits down during the interrogation, but is forced to stand up between interrogations. A watch is set over him, and the guards see to it that he doesn't lean against the wall, and if he goes to sleep and falls over, he is given a kick and straightened up. Sometimes even one day of standing is enough to deprive a person of all his strength, and to force him to testify to anything at all. Number 20. During all these tortures, which involved standing for three, four, and five days, they ordinarily deprived a person of water. The most natural thing of all is to combine the psychological and physical methods. It is also natural to combine all the preceding methods with 21. Sleeplessness, which they quite failed to appreciate in medieval times. They did not understand how narrow are the limits within which a human being can preserve his personality intact. Sleeplessness, yes, combined with standing, thirst, bright light, terror, and the unknown, what other tortures are needed? Befogs the reason, undermines the will, and the human being ceases to be himself, to be his own I, as in Chekhov's I want to sleep, but there it was much easier, for there the girl could lie down and slip into lapses of consciousness, which even in just a minute would revive and refresh the brain. A person deprived of sleep acts half unconsciously or altogether unconsciously, so that his testimony cannot be held against him. They used to say, 
You are not truthful in your testimony, and therefore you will not be allowed to sleep. Sometimes, as a refinement, instead of making the prisoner stand up, they made him sit down on a soft sofa, which made him want to sleep all the more. The jailer on duty sat next to him on the same sofa and kicked him every time his eyes began to shut. Here is how one victim, who had just sat out days in a box infested with bedbugs, describes his feeling after this torture. Chill from great loss of blood, irises of the eyes dried out as if someone were holding a red-hot iron in front of them, tongue swollen from thirst and prickling from a hedgehog at the slightest movement, throat racked by spasms of swallowing. Sleeplessness was a great form of torture. It left no visible marks and could not provide grounds for complaint, even if an inspection, something unheard of anyway, were to strike on the morrow. They didn't let you sleep? Well, after all, this is not supposed to be a vacation resort. The security officials were awake, too. They would catch up on their sleep during the day. One can say that sleeplessness became the universal method in the organs. From being one amongst, from being one among many tortures, it became an integral part of the system of state security. It was the cheapest possible method and did not require the posting of sentries. In all interrogation prisons, the prisoners were forbidden to sleep one minute from Revelle till taps. In Sukhanovka and several other prisons used specifically for interrogation, the cot was folded into the wall during the day. In others, the prisoners were simply forbidden to lie down, and even to close their eyes while seated. Since the major interrogations were all conducted at night, it was automatic. Whoever was undergoing interrogation got no sleep for at least five days and nights. Saturday and Sunday nights, the interrogators themselves tried to get some rest. Number 22. The above method was further implemented by an assembly line of interrogators. Not only were you not allowed to sleep, but for three or four days, shifts of interrogators kept up a continuous interrogation. Number 23. The bedbug-infested box has already been mentioned. In the darkest closet made of wooden planks, there were hundreds, maybe even thousands, of bedbugs, which had been allowed to multiply. The guards removed the prisoner's jacket or field shirt, and immediately the bedbugs assaulted him, crawling onto him from the walls or falling off the ceiling. At first he waged war with them strenuously, crushing them on his body and on the walls, suffocated by their stink. But after several hours he weakened and let them drink his blood without a murmur. Number 24. Punishment Cells No matter how hard it was in the ordinary cell, the punishment cells were always worse, and on return from there the ordinary cell always seemed like a paradise. In the punishment cell a human being was systematically worn down by starvation and also usually by cold. In Sukhanovka prison there were also hot punishment cells. For example, the Lefortovo punishment cells were entirely unheated. There were radiators in the corridor only, and in this heated corridor the guards on duty walked in felt boots and padded jackets. The prisoner was forced to undress down to his underwear and sometimes to his undershorts, and he was forced to spend from three to five days in the punishment cell without moving, since it was so confining. He received hot gruel on the third day only. For the first few minutes, you were convinced you'd not be able to last an hour. But by some miracle, a human being would indeed sit out his five days, perhaps acquiring in the course of it an illness that would last him the rest of his life. There were various aspects to punishment cells, as, for instance, dampness and water. In the Chernovsky prison after the war, Masha G. was kept barefooted for two hours and up to her ankles in icy water. Confess! She was 18 years old, and how she feared for her feet. She was going to have to live with them for a long time. Number 25. Should one consider a variation of the punishment cell when the prisoner was locked in an alcove? As long ago as 1933, this was one of the ways they tortured S.A. Chebatoryev in the Khabarovsk GPU. They locked him naked in a concrete alcove in such a way that he could neither bend his knees nor straighten up and change the position of his arms, nor turn his head. And that was not all. They began to drip cold water onto his scalp, a classic torture, which then ran down his body in rivulets. 
They did not inform him, of course, that this would go on for only twenty-four hours. It was awful enough, at any rate, for him to lose consciousness, and he was discovered the next day apparently dead. He came to on a hospital cot. They had brought him out of his faint with spirits of ammonia, caffeine, and body massage. At first he had no recollection of where he had been or what had happened. For a whole month he was useless even for interrogation. 26. Starvation has already been mentioned in a combination with other methods, nor was it an unusual method to starve the prisoner into confession. Actually, the starvation technique, like interrogation at night, was an integral element in the entire system of coercion. The miserly prison bread ration amounted to ten and a half ounces in the peacetime year of 1933, and to one pound in 1945 in the Lubyanka, and permitting only prohibiting food parcels from one's family and access to the commissary were universally applied to everyone. But there was also the technique of intensified hunger. For example, Chalpenyev was kept for a month on three and a half ounces of bread, after which, when he had just been brought in from the pit, the interrogator Sokol placed in front of him a pot of thick borscht and half a loaf of white bread sliced diagonally. What does it matter, one might ask, how it was sliced? But Chalpenyev, even today, will insist that it was really sliced very attractively. However, he was not given a thing to eat. How ancient it all is, how medieval, how primitive. The only new thing about it was that it was applied in a socialist society. Others, too, tell about such tricks. They were often tried. But we are going to cite another case involving Chebedaryev because it combined so many methods. They put him in the interrogator's office for 72 hours, and the only thing he was allowed was to be taken to the toilet. For the rest, they allowed him neither food nor drink, even though there was water in a carafe right next to him, nor was he permitted to sleep. Throughout there, there were three interrogators in the office, working in shifts. One kept writing something, silently, without disturbing the prisoner. The second slept on the sofa, and the third walked around the room, and as soon as Chebataryev fell asleep, beat him instantly. Then they switched roles. Maybe they themselves were being punished for failure to deliver. And then, all of a sudden, they brought Chebatari of a meal, a fat Ukrainian borscht, a chop, fried tomatoes, and red wine in a crystal carafe. But because Chebataryev had an aversion to alcohol all his life, he refused to drink the wine, and the interrogator couldn't go too far in forcing him to, because that would have spoiled the whole game. After he had eaten, they said to him, Now, here's what you have testified to in the presence of two witnesses. Sign here. In other words, he was to sign what had been silently composed by one interrogator in the presence of another, who had been asleep, and a third, who had been actively working. On the very first page, Chebataryev learned he had been on intimate terms with all the leading Japanese generals, and that he had received espionage assignments from all of them. He began to cross out whole pages. They beat him up and threw him out. Blaginin, another Chinese Eastern Railroad man, arrested with him, was put through the same thing. But he drank the wine and, in a state of pleasant intoxication, signed the confession, and was shot. Even one tiny glass can have an enormous effect on a famished man, and that was a whole carafe. Number 27 beatings. Of a kind that leave no marks. They use rubber truncheons, and they use wooden mallets and small sandbags. It is very, very painful when they hit a bone. For example, an interrogator's jackboot on the shin, where the bone lies just beneath the skin. They beat Brigade Commander Karpunik Braven for 21 days in a row. And today, he says, even after 30 years, all my bones ache, and my head too. In recollecting his own experience and the stories of others, he counts up to fifty-two methods of torture. Here is one. They grip the hand in a special vice, so the prisoner's palm lies flat on the desk, and they hit the joints with the thin edge of a ruler. And one screams. Should we single out particularly the technique by which teeth are knocked out? They knocked out eight of Karpunik's. As everyone knows, a blow of the fist in the solar plexus, catching the victim in the middle of a breath, leaves no mark whatsoever. The Lefortovo Colonel Sidorov, in the post-war period, used to take a penalty kick with his overshoes at the dangling genitals of male prisoners. 
Soccer players who at one time or another have been hit in the groin by a ball know what kind of blow is like. There is no pain comparable to it, and ordinarily the recipient loses consciousness. 28. In the Novorossisk NKVD, they invented a machine for squeezing fingernails. As a result, it could be observed later at transit prisons that many of those from Novorossisk had lost their fingernails. 29. And what about that straight jacket? Number 30. And breaking the prisoner's back? As in that same Kabarosk GPU in 1933. 31. Or bridling, also known as the swan dive. This was a Sukhanova method, also used in Archangel, where the interrogator Ivkov applied it in 1940. A long piece of rough toweling was inserted between the prisoner's jaws like a bridle. The ends were then pulled back over his shoulders and tied to his heels. Just try lying on your stomach like a wheel with your spine breaking, and without water and food for two days. Is it necessary to go on with the list? Is there much left to enumerate? What won't well-fed, unfeeling people invent? Brother mine, do not condemn those who, finding themselves in such a situation, turn out to be weak and confess to more than they should have. Do not be the first to cast a stone at them. From childhood on, we are educated and trained for our own profession, for our civil duties, for military service, to take care of our bodily needs, to behave well, even to appreciate beauty, well, well, this lasts not really all that much, but neither our education, nor our upbringing, nor our experience prepares us in the slightest for the greatest trial of our lives, being arrested for nothing and interrogated about nothing. Novels, plays, films, their authors, should themselves be forced to drink the cup of gulag to the bottom, depict the types one meets in the offices of interrogators as chivalrous guardians of truth and humanitarianism, as our loving fathers. We are exposed to lectures on everything under the sun, and are even herded in to listen to them. But no one is going to lecture to us about the true and extended significance of the criminal code. And the codes themselves are not on open shelves in our libraries, nor sold at newsstands, nor do they fall in the hands of the heedless young. It seems a virtual fairy tale that somewhere, at the ends of the earth, an accused person can avail himself of a lawyer's help. This means having beside you, in the most difficult moment of your life, a clear-minded ally who knows the law. The principle of our interrogation consists further in depriving the accused of even the knowledge of the law. An indictment is presented, and here, incidentally, is how it's presented. Sign it. It's not true. Sign. But I'm not guilty of anything. It turns out that you are being indicted under the provisions of Article 5810, Part 2, and 5811 of the Criminal Code of the Russian Republic. Sign. But what do these sections say? Let me read the code. I don't have it. Well, get it from your department head. He doesn't have it either. Sign. But I want to see it. You are not supposed to see it. It isn't written for you, but for us. You don't need it. I'll tell you what it says. These sections spell out exactly what you are guilty of. And anyway, at this point, your signature doesn't mean that you agree with the indictment, but that you've read it, and it's been presented to you. All of a sudden, a new combination of letters, U-P-K, flashes by on one of these pieces of paper. Your sense of caution is aroused. What's the difference between U-P-K and the U-K, the criminal code? If you've been lucky enough to catch the interrogator when he is in a good mood, he will explain it to you. The UPK is the Code of Criminal Procedure. What? This means that there are two distinct codes, not just one, of whose contents you are completely ignorant even as you are being trampled under their provisions. Since that time, ten years have passed, then fifteen. The grass has grown thick over the grave of my youth. I served out my term and even eternal exile as well. And nowhere, neither in the cultural education section of the camps, nor in district libraries, nor even in medium-sized cities, have I seen with my own eyes, held in my own hands, been able to buy, obtain, or even ask for the code of Soviet law. 
and of the hundreds of prisoners I knew who had gone through interrogation and trial, and more than once too, who had served sentences in camp and in exile, none have ever seen the code or held it in his hand. It was only when both codes were thirty-five years old, and on the point of being replaced by the new ones that I saw them, two little paperback brothers, the UK or Criminal Code, and the UPK or Code of Criminal Procedure, on a newsstand in the Moscow subway, because they were outdated, it had been decided to release them for general circulation. I read them today, touched with emotion. For example, the UPK, the Code of Criminal Procedure. Article 136. The interrogator does not have the right to extract testimony or a confession from an accused by means of compulsion and threats. It was as though they had foreseen it. Article 111. The interrogator is obliged to establish clearly all the relevant facts, both those tending toward acquittal and any which might lessen the accused measure of guilt. But it was I who helped establish Soviet power in October. It was I who shot the Kolchak. I took part in the dispossession of the Kulaks. I saved the state ten million rubles in lowered production costs. I was wounded twice in the war. I have three orders and decorations. You're not being tried for that. History. The bare teeth of the interrogator. Whatever good you may have done has nothing to do with the case. Article 139. The accused has a right to set forth his testimony in his own hand and to demand the right to make corrections in the disposition written by the interrogator. Oh, if we had only known that in time. But what I should say is, if that were the only way it really was, we were always vainly imploring the interrogator not to write my repulsive, slanderous fabrications instead of my mistaken statements, or not to write our underground weapons arsenal instead of my rusty Finnish knife. If only the defendants had first been taught some prison science. If only interrogation had been run through first in rehearsal, and only afterward for real. They didn't, after all, play that interrogation game with the second termers of 1948. It would have gotten them nowhere. But newcomers had no experience, no knowledge, and there was no one from whom to seek advice. The loneliness of the cute that was one more factor in the success of unjust interrogation. The entire apparatus threw its full weight on one lonely and inhibited will. From the moment of his arrest and throughout the entire shock period of the interrogator, the prisoner was, ideally, to be kept entirely alone. In his cell, in the corridor, on the stairs, in the offices, he was not supposed to encounter others like himself in order to avoid the risk of his gleaning a bit of sympathy, advice, support from someone's smile or glance. The organs did everything to blot out for him his future and distort his present, to lead him to believe that his friends and family had all been arrested and that material proof of his guilt had been found. It was their habit to exaggerate their power to destroy him and those he loved, as well as their authority to pardon, which the organs didn't even have. They pretended that there was some connection between the sincerity of a prisoner's repentance and a reduction in his sentence or an easing of the campaign regimen. No such connection ever existed. While the prisoner was still in a state of shock and torment and totally beside himself, they tried to get from him very quickly as many irreparably damaging items of evidence as possible and to implicate him with as many totally innocent persons as possible. Some defendants became so depressed in these circumstances that they even asked not to have the depositions read to them. They could not stand hearing them. They asked merely to be allowed to sign them, just to sign and get it over with. Only after all this was over would the prisoner be released from solitary into a large cell, where in belated desperation he would discover and count over his mistakes one by one. How was it possible not to make mistakes in such a duel? Who could have failed to make a mistake? We said that, ideally, he was to be kept alone. However, in the overcrowded prisons of 1937 and, for that matter, of 1945 as well, this ideal of solitary confinement for a newly arrested defendant could not be attained. Almost from his first hours, the prisoner was in fact in a terribly overcrowded common cell. 
But there were virtues to this arrangement, too, which more than made up for its flaws. The overcrowding of the cells not only took the place of the tightly confined solitary box, but also assumed the character of a first-class torture in itself, one that was particularly useful because it continued for whole days and weeks, with no effort on the part of the interrogators. The prisoners tortured the prisoners. The jailers pushed so many prisoners into the cell that not everyone had even had a piece of floor. Some were sitting on others' feet, and people walked on people and couldn't even move at all. Thus, in the kitchen of KPZ's Cells for Preliminary Detention in 1945, they pushed 18 prisoners into a cell designed for the solitary confinement of one person. In Lugansk in 1937, it was 15. And in 1938, Ivanov Rosmanik found 140 prisoners in a standard Butyrki cell intended for 25, with toilets so overburdened that prisoners were taken to the toilet only once a day, sometimes at night, and the same thing was true of their outdoor walk as well. Those newly arrested, who had already been processed through the bath and the boxes, sat on the stairs for several days at a stretch waiting for departing prisoner transports to leave and release space in the cells. T.V. had been imprisoned in the Butyrki seven years earlier, in 1931, and says that it was overcrowded under the bunks and that prisoners lay on the asphalt floor. I myself was imprisoned seven years later, in 1945, and it was just the same. But recently I received from M.K.B., a valuable personal testimony about overcrowding in the Butyrki in 1918. In October of that year, during the second month of the Red Terror, it was so full that they even set up a cell for 70 women in the laundry. When, then, was the Butyrki not crowded? It was Ivanov Razumnik, who in the Lubyanka reception kennel, calculated that for weeks at a time there were three persons for each square yard of floor space just as an experiment, try to fit three people into that space. But this, too, is no miracle. In the Vladimir internal prison in 1948, 30 people had to stand in a cell 10 feet by 10 feet in size. In this kennel, there was neither ventilation nor a window, and the prisoner's body heat and breathing raised the temperature to 40 or 45 degrees centigrade, 104 to 113 Fahrenheit, and everyone sat there in undershorts with their winter clothing piled beneath them. Their naked bodies were pressed against one another, and they got eczema from another's sweat. They sat like that for weeks at a time, and were given neither fresh air nor water, except for gruel and tea in the morning. And if at the same time the latrine bucket replaced all other types of toilet, or if, on the other hand, there was no latrine bucket for use in between trips to an outside toilet, as was the case in several Siberian prisons, and if four people ate from one bowl, sitting on each other's knees, and if someone was hauled out for interrogation, and then someone else was pushed in, beaten up, sleepless and broken, and if the appearance, and if the appearance of such broken men was more persuasive than any other threats on the part of interrogators, and if, by then, death and any camp whatsoever seemed easier to a prisoner who had left unsummoned for months than his tormented current situation, perhaps this really did replace the theoretically ideal isolation in solitary. And you could not always decide in such a porridge of people with whom to be forthright, and you could not always find someone from whom to seek advice, and you would believe in the tortures and beatings not when the interrogator threatened you with them, but when you saw their results on other prisoners. You could learn from those who had suffered that they could give you a saltwater douche in the throat and then leave you in a box for a day, tormented by thirst, or that they might scrape the skin off a man's back with a grater till it bled, and then oil it with turpentine. Brigade Commander Rudolf Pintsov underwent both treatments. In addition, they pushed needles under his nails and poured water into him to the bursting point demanding that he confess to having wanted to turn his brigade of tanks against the government during the November parade. And from Alexandrov, the former head of the arts section at the All-Union Society for Cultural Relations with Foreign Countries, who has a broken spinal column which tilts to one side, and who cannot control his tear ducts 
and thus cannot stop crying, one can learn how Abakamov himself could beat in 1948. Yes, yes, Minister of State Security Abakamov himself did not by any means spurn such menial labor. He was not averse to taking a rubber truncheon in his hands every once in a while, and his deputy, Ryman, was even more willing. He did this at Sukhanovka in the General's interrogation office. The office had imitation walnut paneling on the walls, silk portieres at the windows and doors, and a great Persian carpet on the floor. In order not to spoil all this beauty, a dirty runner bespattered with blood was rolled out on top of the carpet when a prisoner was beaten. When Ryman was doing the beating, he was assisted not by some ordinary guard, but a colonel. And so, Ryman politely stroking his rubber truncheon, which was four centimeters, an inch and a half thick, you have survived trial by sleeplessness with honor. Alexander Dogan had cleverly managed to last a month without sleep, by sleeping while he was standing up. So now we will try the club. Prisoners can't take more than two or three sessions of this. Let down your trousers and lie down on the runner. The colonel sat down in the prisoner's back. Alexander Dolgan was going to count the blows. He didn't yet know about a blow from a rubber truncheon on the sciatic nerve when the buttocks have disappeared as a consequence of prolonged starvation. The effect is not felt in the place where the blow is delivered. It explodes inside the head. After the first blow, the victim was mad with pain and broke his nails on the carpet. Ryman, beating away, trying to hit accurately. The colonel pressed down on Alexander Dolgan's torso. This was just the right sort of work for three big shoulder-board stars, assisting the all-powerful Ryman. After the beating, the prisoner could not walk and, of course, was not carried. They just dragged him along the floor. What was left of his buttocks was soon so swollen that he could not button his trousers. And yet, there were practically no scars. He was hit by a violent case of diarrhea, and, sitting there on the latrine bucket in solitary, Alexander Dolgan guffawed. He went through a second and a third session, and his skin cracked, and Ryuman went wild and started to beat him on the stomach, breaking through the intestinal wall and creating an enormous hernia through which Alexander Dolgan's intestines protruded. The prisoner was taken off to the Butyrki hospital with a case of peritonitis, and for the time being their attempts to compel him to commit a foul deed were suspended. That is how they can torture you, too. After that, it could seem a simply father caress, when the Kishinev interrogator, Danilov, beat Father Victor Shipovolnikov across the back of the head with a poker and pulled him by his long hair. It is very convenient to drag a priest around in that fashion. Ordinary laymen can be dragged by the beard from one corner of the office to the other, and Richard Ola, a Finnish Red Guard and a participant in the capture of the British agent Sidney Riley, and commander of a company during the suppression of the Kronstadt Revolt, was lifted up with pliers first by one end of his great mustache, and then by the other, and held for ten minutes with his feet off the floor. But the most awful thing they can do to you is this. Undress you from the waist down, place you on your back on the floor, pull your legs apart, seat assistance on them from the glorious corps of sergeants, who also hold down your arms, and then the interrogator, and women interrogators have not shrunk from this, stands between your legs and with the toe of his boot, or of her shoe, gradually, steadily, and with ever greater pressure, crushes against the floor those organs which once made you a man. He looks into your eyes and repeats and repeats his questions, or the betrayal he is urging on you. Or the betrayal he is urging on you. If he does not press down too quickly, or just a shade too powerfully, you still have fifteen seconds left in which to scream that you will confess to everything, that you are ready to see arrested all twenty of those people he's been demanding of you, or that you will slander in the newspapers everything you hold holy. And you may be judged by God, but not by people. There is no way out. You have to confess to everything, whisper the stoolies who have been planted in the cell. It's a simple question. Hang on to your health, say the people with common sense. You can't get new teeth. Those who have already lost them nod at you. They are going to convict you in any case, whether you confess or whether you don't. 
conclude those who have gotten to the bottom of things. Those who don't sign get shot, prophecies someone else in the corner, out of vengeance so as to not risk any leaks about how they conduct interrogations. And if you die in the interrogator's office, they'll tell your relatives you've been sentenced to camp without the right of correspondence, and just let them look for you. If you are an orthodox communist, then another orthodox communist will sidle up to you, peering about with hostile suspicion, and he'll begin to whisper in your ear so that the uninitiated cannot overhear. It's our duty to support Soviet interrogation. It's a combat situation. We ourselves are to blame. We were too soft-hearted. And now look at all the rot that has multiplied in the country. There is a vicious secret war going on. Even here we are surrounded by enemies. Just listen to what they are saying. The party is not obliged to account for what it does to every single one of us, to explain the whys and the wherefores. If they ask us to, that means we should sign. And another orthodox communist sidles up. I signed denunciations against 35 people, against all my acquaintances, and I advise you too, drag along as many names as you can in your wake, as many as you can. That way it will become obvious that the whole thing is an absurdity and they'll let everyone out. But that is precisely what the organs need. The conscientiousness of the orthodox communist and the purpose of the NKVD naturally coincide. Indeed, the NKVD needs just that arched fan of names, that fat multiplication of them. That is the mark of quality of their work, and these are also new patches of woods in which to set out snares. Your accomplices! Accomplices! Others who share your views! That is what they keep pressing to shake out of everyone. They say that R. Relov, named Cardinal Richelieu, as one of his accomplices, and that the cardinal was in fact so listed in his depositions. And no one was astonished by this, until Rolov was questioned about it at his rehabilitation proceedings in 1956. Apropos of the Orthodox Communists, Stalin was necessary. For such a purge as that, yes, but a party like that was necessary too. The majority of those in power up to the very moment of their own arrest, were pitiless in arresting others, obediently destroyed their peers in accordance with those same instructions, and handed over retribution to any friend or comrade in arms of yesterday. And all those big Bolsheviks who now wear martyrs' halos managed to be the executioners of other Bolsheviks not even taking into account how all of them in the first place had been the executioners of non-communists. Perhaps 1937 was needed in order to show how little their whole ideology was worth. That ideology, of which they boasted so enthusiastically, turning Russia upside down, destroying its foundations, trampling everything it held sacred underfoot, that Russia where they themselves had never been threatened by such retribution. The victims of the Bolsheviks from 1918 to 1946 never conducted themselves so despicably as the leading Bolsheviks when the lightning struck them. If you study in detail the whole history of the arrests and the trials of 1936 to 1938, the principal revulsion you feel is not against Stalin and his accomplices, but against the humiliatingly repulsive defendants. Nausea at their spiritual baseness after their former pride and implacability. So what is the answer? How can you stand your ground when you are weak and sensitive to pain, when people you love are still alive, when you are unprepared? What do you need to make you stronger than the interrogator and the whole trap? From the moment you go to prison, you must put your cozy past firmly behind you. At the very threshold, you must say to yourself, My life is over, a little early, to be sure, but there's nothing to be done about it. I shall never return to freedom. I am condemned to die, now or a little later. But later on, in truth, it will be even harder, and so the sooner the better. I no longer have any property whatsoever. For me, those I love died, and for them I died. And for them I have died. From today on, my body is useless and alien to me. Only my spirit and my conscience remain precious and important to me. 
Confronted by such a prisoner, the interrogator will tremble. Only the man who has renounced everything can win that victory. But how can one turn one's body to stone? Well, they managed to turn some individuals from the Berdyaev circle into puppets for a trial. But they didn't succeed with Berdyaev. They wanted to drag him into an open trial. They arrested him twice, and in 1922, he was subjected to a night interrogation by Derzinski himself. Kamenev was there too, which means that he, too, was not averse to using the Cheka in an ideological conflict. But Berdyaev did not humiliate himself. He did not beg or plead. He set forth firmly those religious and moral principles which had led him to refuse to accept the political authority established in Russia. And not only did they come to the conclusion that he would be useless for a trial, but they liberated him. A human being has a point of view. And Staliarova recalls an old woman who was her neighbor on the Butyrki bunks in 1937. They kept on interrogating her every night. Two years earlier, a former metropolitan of the Orthodox Church, who had escaped from exile, had spent a night at her home on his way through Moscow. But he wasn't the former metropolitan. He was the metropolitan. Truly, I was worthy of receiving him. All right, then. To whom did he go when he left Moscow? I know, but I won't tell you. The Metropolitan had escaped to Finland via an underground railroad of believers. At first the interrogators took turns, and then they went after her in groups. They shook their fists in the little old woman's face, and she replied, There is nothing you can do to me, even if you cut me into pieces. After all, you are afraid of your bosses, and you are afraid of each other. And you are even afraid of killing me. They would lose contact with the Underground Railroad. But I am not afraid of anything. I would be glad to be judged by God right this minute. There were such people in 1937, too. People who did not return to their cell for their bundles of belongings, who chose death, who signed nothing denouncing anyone. One can't say that the history of Russian revolutionaries has given us any better examples of steadfastness. But there is no comparison anyway, because none of our revolutionaries ever knew what a really good interrogation could be, with 52 different methods to choose from. Just as ox cart drivers of Gogol's time could not have imagined the speed of a jet plane, those who have never gone through the receiving line meat grinder of Gulag cannot grasp the true possibilities of interrogation. We read in Izvestaya for May 24, 1959, that Yulia Romasantseva was confined in internal prison of a Nazi camp, where they tried to find out from her the whereabouts of her husband, who had escaped from that same camp. She knew, but she refused to tell. For a reader who is not in the know, this is a model of heroism. For a reader with a bitter gulag past, it's a model of inefficient interrogation. Yulia did not die under torture, and she was not driven insane. A month later, she was simply released. Still very much alive and kicking. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 The Blue Caps Throughout the grinding of our souls and the gears of the great nighttime institution, when our souls are pulverized and our flesh hangs down in tatters like a beggar's rags, we suffer too much and are too immersed in our own pain to rivet with penetrating and far-seeing gaze those pale night executioners who torture us. A surfeit of inner grief floods our eyes. Otherwise, what historians of our torturers we would be? For it is certain they will never describe themselves as they actually are, but alas... Every former prisoner remembers his own interrogation in detail. How they squeezed him, and what foulness they squeezed out of him. But often he does not even remember their names, let alone think about them as human beings. So it is with me, I can recall much more, and much more that's interesting, about any one of my cellmates than I can about Captain of State Security Yezipov, with whom I spent no little time face to face, the two of us alone in his office. There is one thing, however, which remains with us all as an accurate, generalized recollection. Foul rot, a space totally infected with putrefaction, 
and even when, decades later, we are long past fits of anger or outrage, in our own quieted hearts, we retain this firm impression of low, malicious, impious, and possibly muddled people. There's an interesting story about Alexander II, the Tsar surrounded by revolutionaries, who were to make seven attempts on his life. He once visited the house of preliminary detention on Spalernaya, the uncle of the big house, where he ordered them to lock him up in solitary confinement cell number 227. He stayed in it for more than an hour, attempting thereby to sense the state of mind of those he had imprisoned there. One cannot but admit that for a monarch this was evidence of a moral aspiration, to feel the need and make the effort to take a spiritual view of the matter. But it is impossible to picture any of our interrogators, right up to Abakamov and Beria, wanting to slip into a prisoner's skin even for one hour, or feeling compelled to sit and meditate in solitary confinement. Their branch of service does not require them to be educated people of broad culture and broad views, and they are not. Their branch of service does not require them to think logically, and they do not. Their branch of service requires only that they carry out orders exactly and be impervious to suffering. And that is what they do, and that is what they are. We who have passed through their hands feel suffocated when we think of that legion, which is stripped bare of universal human ideals. Although others might not be aware of it, it was clear to the interrogators, at least, that the cases were fabricated. Except at staff conferences, they could not seriously say to one another or to themselves that they were exposing criminals. Nonetheless, they kept right on producing depositions page after page to make sure that we rotted. So the essence of it all turns out to be the credo of the Blatney, the underworld of Russian thieves, you today, me tomorrow. They understood that the cases were fabricated, yet they kept on working year after year. How could they? Either they forced themselves to not think, and this in itself means the ruin of a human being, and simply accepted that this was the way it had to be, and that the person who gave them their orders was always right. But didn't the Nazis, too, it comes to mind, argue that same way? Or else was it a matter of the progressive doctrine, the granite ideology? An interrogator in the awful Oratukan sent there lo the Kalima in 1938 as a penalty assignment. So touched when M. Lure, former director of the Cravoy rog Industrial Complex, readily agreed to sign an indictment, which meant a second camp term that he used the time they had thus saved to say, You think we get any satisfaction from using persuasion? We have to do what the party demands of us. You are an old party member. Tell me what would you do in my place? Apparently Lurie nearly agreed with him, and it may have been the fact that he already had been thinking in such terms that led him to sign so readily. It is, after all, a convincing argument. But most often, it was merely a matter of cynicism. The Blue Caps understood the workings of the meat grinder and loved it. In the Zhidos camps in 1944, interrogator Miranenko said to the condemned Bebi with pride and his faultless logic, Interrogation and trial are merely judicial corroboration. They cannot alter your fate, which was previously decided. If it is necessary to shoot you, then you will be shot even if you are altogether innocent. If it is necessary to acquit you, then no matter how guilty you are, you will be cleared and acquitted. Just give us a person, and we'll create the case. That was what many of them said jokingly, and it was their slogan. What we think of as torture, they think of as good work. The wife of the interrogator, Nikolai Grabyshenko, the Volga Canal Project, said touchingly to her neighbors, Kalia is a very good worker. One of them didn't confess for a long time, and they gave him to Kolia. Kolia talked with him for one night, and he confessed. What prompted them all to slip into harness and pursue so zealously not truth but totals of the processed and condemned? Because it was the most comfortable for them not to be different from the others. And because these totals meant an easy life, supplementary pay, awards and decorations, promotions in rank, and the expansion and prosperity of the organs themselves, if they ran up high totals, 
then they could loaf when they felt like it, or do poor work or go out and enjoy themselves at night. And that is just what they did. Low totals led to their being kicked out to loss of their feed bag. For Stalin could never be convinced that in any district or city or military unit, he might suddenly cease to have enemies. That is why they felt no mercy. But, instead, an explosion of resentment and rage toward those maliciously stubborn prisoners who opposed being fitted into the totals, who would not capitulate to sleeplessness or the punishment cell or hunger. By refusing to confess, they menaced the interrogator's personal standing. It was as though they wanted to bring him down. In such circumstances, all measures were justified. If it's to be war, then war it will be. We'll ram the tube down your throat. Swallow that salt water. Excluded by the nature of their work and by deliberate choice from the higher sphere of human existence, the servitors of the Blue Institution lived in their lower sphere with all the greater intensity and avidity, and there they were possessed and directed by the two strongest instincts of the lower sphere, other than hunger and sex, greed for power and greed for gain particularly for power, in recent decades it turned out to be more important than money. Power is a poison well known for thousands of years, if only no one were to ever require material power over others. But to the human being who has faith in some force that holds dominion over all of us, and who is therefore conscious of his own limitations, power is not necessarily fatal. For those, however, who are unaware of any higher sphere, it is a deadly poison. For them, there is no antidote. Here, attraction is not the right word. It is intoxication. After all, it is intoxicating. You are still young, still, shall we say, parenthetically, a sniveling youth. Only a little while ago, your parents were deeply concerned about you and didn't know where to turn to launch you in life. You were such a fool you didn't even want to study, but you got through three years of that school, and then how you took off and flew, how your situation changed, how your gestures changed, your glance, the turn of your head. The learned council of the scientific institute is in session. You enter and everyone notices you and trembles. You don't take the chairman's chair. Those headaches are for the rector to take on. You sit off to one side, but everyone understands that you are the head man there. You are the special department and you can sit there for just five minutes and then leave. You have that advantage over the professors. You can be called away by more important business, but later on, when you're considering their decision, you will raise your eyebrows or, better still, purse your lips and say to the rector, You can't do that. There are special considerations involved. That's all. And it won't be done. Or else you are an ozobist a state security representative in the army, a smirsh man, and a mere lieutenant. But the portly old colonel, the commander of the unit, stands up when you enter the room and tries to flatter you, to play up to you. He doesn't even have a drink with his chief of staff without inviting you to join them. You have a power over all the people in that military unit, or factory, or district, incomparably greater than that of the military commander or factory director, or secretary of the district communist party. These men control people's military or official duties, wages, reputations, but you control the people's freedom. And no one dares speak about you in meetings, and no one will ever dare write about you in the newspaper. Not only something bad, but anything good. They don't dare. Your name, like that of a jealously guarded deity, cannot even be mentioned. You are there, Everyone feels your presence, but it's as though you didn't exist. From that moment, you don that heavenly blue service cap. You stand higher than the publicly acknowledged power. No one dares check up on what you do, but no one is exempt from your checking up on him. And therefore, in dealing with ordinary so-called citizens, who, for you are mere blocks of wood, it is altogether appropriate for you to wear an ambiguous and deeply thoughtful expression. For, of course, you are the one, and no one else, who knows about the special considerations. And therefore, you are always right. There is just one thing you must never forget. You, too, would have been just such a poor block of wood 
if you had not had the luck to become one of the little links in the organs, that flexible, unitary organism inhabiting a nation as a tapeworm inhabits a human body. Everything is yours now. Everything is for you. Just be true to the organs. They will always stand up for you. They will always help you swallow up anyone who bothers you. They will help move every obstacle from your path. But be true to the organs. Do everything they order you to do. Do everything they order you to. They will do the thinking for you in respect to your functions, too. The duties of an interrogator require work, of course. You have to come in during the day, at night sit for hours and hours, but not split your skull over proof. Let the prisoner's head ache over that. And you don't have to worry about whether the prisoner is guilty or not, but simply do what the organs require, and everything will be all right. It will be up to you to make the interrogation periods pass as pleasurably as possible and not get overly fatigued. And it would be nice to get some good out of it, at least to amuse yourself. You have been sitting a long time, and all of a sudden, a new method of persuasion occurs to you. Eureka! So you call up your friends on the phone, and you go around to the other offices and tell them about it. What a laugh! Who shall we try it on, boys? It's really pretty monotonous to keep doing the same thing all the time. Those trembling hands, those imploring eyes, that cowardly submissiveness. They are really a bore. If you could just get one of them to resist. I love strong opponents. It's such fun to break their backs. And if your opponent is so strong that he refuses to give in, all your methods have failed, and you are in a rage, then don't control your fury. It's tremendously satisfying, that outburst. Let your anger have its way. Don't set any bounds to it. Don't hold yourself back. That's when interrogators spit in the open mouth of the accused and shove his face into a full cuspidor. That's the state of mind in which they drag priests around by their long hair or urinate in a kneeling prisoner's face. After such a storm of fury, you feel yourself a real honest-to-God man. Or else you are interrogating a foreigner's girlfriend. So you curse her out and then you say, Come on now, does an American have a special kind of... Is it that? Weren't there enough Russian ones for you? All of a sudden you get an idea. Maybe she learns something from those foreigners. Here's a chance not to be missed, like an assignment abroad. And so you begin to interrogate her energetically. How? What positions? More! In detail. Every scrap of information. You can use the information yourself, and you can tell the other boys, too. The girl is blushing all over and in tears. It doesn't have anything to do with the case, she protests. Yes, it does. Speak up. That's power for you. She gives you the full details. If you want, she'll draw a picture for you. If you want, she'll demonstrate with her body. She has no way out. In your hands, you hold the punishment cell and her prison term. And if you have asked for a stenographer to take down the questions and answers, and they send in a pretty one, you can shove your paw down her bosom right in front of the boy being interrogated. He's not a human being, after all, and there's no real reason to feel shy in his presence. In fact, there's no reason for you to feel shy with anyone. And if you like the broads, and who doesn't, you'd be a fool not to make use of your position. Some will be drawn to you because of your power, and others will give in out of fear. So you've met a girl somewhere, and she's caught your eye? She'll belong to you, never fear. She can't get away. Someone else's wife has caught your eye? She'll be yours too, because after all, there's no problem about removing the husband. No, indeed. To know what it meant to be a blue cap, one had to experience it. Anything you saw was yours. Any apartment you looked at was yours. Any woman was yours. Any enemy that was struck from your path, the earth beneath your feet was yours. The heaven above you was yours. It was, after all, like your cap. Sky blue. The passion for gain was their universal passion. After all, in the absence of any checking up, such power is inevitably used for personal enrichment. One would have had to be holy to refrain. If we were able to discover the hidden motivation behind individual arrests, we would be astounded to find that, granting the rules governing arrests in general, 75% of the time the particular choice of whom to arrest, the personal cast of the die, 
was determined by human greed and vengefulness, and that of 75%, half were the result of material self-interest on the part of the local NKVD, and of course the prosecutor too, for on this point I do not distinguish between them. The motivations and actions of the blue caps are sometimes so petty that one can only be astounded. Security officer Senchenko took a map case and dispatch from an officer he'd arrested and started to use them right in his presence. And by manipulating the documentation, he took a pair of foreign gloves from another prisoner. When the armies were advancing, the blue caps were especially irritated because they only got second pick of the booty. The counterintelligence officer of the 49th Army who arrested me had a yen for my cigarette case. And it wasn't even a cigarette case, but a small German army box, of a tempting scarlet, however. And because of that piece of shit, he carried out a whole maneuver. As his first step, he omitted it from the list of belongings that were confiscated from me. You can keep it. He thereupon ordered me to be searched again, knowing all the time that it was all I had in my pockets. Aha! What's that? Take it away! And to prevent my protests, put him in the punishment cell. What czar's gendarme would have dared behave that way toward a defender of the fatherland? Every interrogator was given an allowance of a certain number of cigarettes to encourage those willing to confess and reward stool pigeons. Some of them kept all the cigarettes for themselves. Even in accounting for hours spent in interrogation, they used to cheat. They got higher pay for night work, and we used to note the way they wrote down more hours on the night interrogations than they really spent. During the Leningrad blockade, interrogator Nikolai Fedorovich Krushkov told Yelizaveta Viktorovna Strakovic, wife of the prisoner he was interrogating, K.I. Strakovic, I want a quilt, bring it to me, when she replied. All of our warm things are in the room they've sealed. He went to her apartment and, without breaking the state security seal on the lock, unscrewed the entire doorknob. That's how the MGB works, he explained gaily. And he went in and began to collect the warm things, shoving some crystal in his pocket at the same time. She herself tried to get whatever she could out of the room, but he stopped her. That's enough for your... And he kept on raking in the booty. There is no end to such cases. One could issue a thousand white papers. And beginning in 1918, too, one would only need to question systematically former prisoners and their wives. Maybe there are and were blue caps who never stole anything or appropriated anything for themselves, but I find it impossible to imagine one. I simply do not understand, given the blue caps' philosophy of life, what was there to restrain them if they liked some particular thing? Way back at the beginning of the thirties, when all of us were marching around in the German uniforms of the Red Youth Front, and were building the first five-year plan, they were spending their evenings in salons like the one in the apartment of Concordia Iossi, behaving like members of nobility or westerners, and their lady friends were showing off their foreign clothes. Where were they getting those clothes? As the folk saying goes, if you speak for the wolf, speak against him as well. Where did this wolf tribe appear from among our people? Does it really stem from our own roots, our own blood? It is our own. And just so we don't go around flaunting too proudly the white mantle of the just, let everyone ask himself, If my life had turned out differently, might I myself not have become just such an executioner? It is a dreadful question if one really answers it honestly. I remember my third year at the university in the fall of 1938. We young men of the Komsomol were summoned before the District Komsomol Committee not once but twice. Scarcely bothering to ask our consent, they shoved an application form at us. You've had enough physics, mathematics, and chemistry. It's more important to your country for you to enter the NKVD school. That's the way it always is. It isn't just some person who needs you. It's always your motherland. And it's always some official or other who speaks on your behalf of your motherland and who knows what she needs. One year before, the district committee had conducted a drive among us to recruit candidates for the Air Force schools. We avoided getting involved that time, too, because we didn't want to leave the university. Twenty-five years later, we could think, well, yes, we understood the sort of arrests that were being made at the time, 
and the fact that they were torturing people in prisons, and the slime they were trying to drag us into. But it isn't true. After all, the Black Marias were going through the streets at night, and we were the same young people who were parading with banners during the day. How could we know anything about those arrests, and why should we think about them? All the provincial leaders had been removed, but as far as we were concerned, it didn't matter. Two or three professors had been arrested, but after all, they hadn't been our dancing partners, and it might even be easier to pass our exams as a result. Twenty-year-olds, we marched in the ranks of those born the year the revolution took place, and because we were the same age as the revolution, the brightest of futures lay ahead. It would be hard to identify the exact source of that inner intuition, not founded on rational argument, which prompted our refusal to enter the NKVD schools. It certainly didn't derive from the lectures on historical materialism we listened to. It was clear from them that the struggle against the internal enemy was a crucial battlefront, and to share in it was an honorable task. Our decision even ran counter to our material interests. At the time, the provincial university we attended could not promise us anything more than the chance to teach in a rural school in a remote area for miserly wages. The NKVD school dangled before us special rations and double or triple pay. Our feelings could not be put into words, and even if we had found the words, fear would have prevented our speaking them aloud to one another. It was not our minds that resisted, but something inside our breasts. People can shout at you from all sides, You must! And your own head can be saying also, You must! But inside your breast there is a sense of revulsion, repudiation. I don't want to. It makes me feel sick. Do what you want without me. I want no part of it. Still, some of us were recruited at that time. And I think that if they had really put the pressure on, they could have broken everybody's resistance. So I would like to imagine, if, by the time the war broke out, I had already been wearing an NKVD officer's insignia on my blue tabs, what would I have become? What do shoulder boards do to a human being? And where have all the exhortations of grandmother, standing before an icon, gone? And where are the young pioneer's daydreams of future sacred equality? And at that moment, when my life was turned upside down and the SMERSH officers at the brigade command point tore off those cursed shoulder boards and took my belt away and shoved me along to their automobile, I was pierced to the quick by worrying how, in my stripped and sorry state, I was going to make my way through the telephone operator's room. The rank and file must not see me in that condition. So let the reader who expects this book to be a political expose slam its covers shut right now. If only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? During the life of any heart, this line keeps changing place. Sometimes it is squeezed one way by exuberant evil, and sometimes it shifts to allow enough space for good to flourish. One and the same human being is, at various ages, under various circumstances, a totally different human being. At times he is close to being a devil, at times to sainthood. But his name doesn't change. And to that we ascribe the whole lot, good and evil. Socrates taught us, Know thyself. Confronted by the pit into which we are about to toss those who have done us harm, we halt, stricken dumb. It is, after all, only because of the way things worked out that they were the executioners and we weren't. From good to evil is one quaver, says the proverb and correspondingly, from evil to good. Whoever got in by mistake, either adjusted to the malu, or else was thrown out, eased out, or even fell across the rails himself. Still, were there no good people left out there? In Kishinev, a young lieutenant gabist went to Father Viktor Shepolnikov a full month before he was arrested. Get away from here! Go away! They plan to arrest you! 
Did he do this on his own, or did his mother send him to warn the priest? After the arrest, this young man was assigned to Father Victor as an escort guard, and he grieved for him. Why didn't you go away? When the interrogator Goldman gave Vera Kornieva the 206 form on non-disclosure to sign, she began to catch on to her rights, and then she began to go into the case in detail, involving as it did all 17 members of their religious group. Goldman raged, but he had to let her study the file. In order not to be bored waiting for her, he led her to a large office where half a dozen employees were sitting, and left her there. At first, she read quietly, but then a conversation began, perhaps because the others were bored, and Vera launched aloud into a real religious sermon. One would have to know her to appreciate this to the full. She was a luminous person with a lively mind and a gift of eloquence, even though in freedom she had been no more than a lathe operator, a stable girl, and a housewife. Now and then asking questions in order to clarify something or other, it was catching them from an unexpected side of things. People came in from other offices and the room filled up, even though they were only typists, stenographers, file clerks, and not interrogators. In 1946, this was still their milieu, the organs. It is impossible to reconstruct her monologue. She managed to work in all sorts of things, including the question of traitors of the motherland. Why were there no traitors in the 1812 War of the Fatherland when there was still serfdom? It would have been natural to have traitors then. But mostly she spoke about religious faith and religious believers. Formerly, she declared, unbridled passions were the basis for everything. Steal the stolen goods. And, in that state of affairs, religious believers were naturally a hindrance to you. But now, when you want to build and prosper in this world... Why do you persecute your best citizens? They represent your most precious material. After all, believers don't need to be watched, they do not steal, and they do not shirk. Do you think you can build a just society on a foundation of self-serving and envious people? Everything in the country is falling apart. Why do you spit in the hearts of your best people? Separate church and state properly and do not touch the church. You will not lose a thing thereby. Are you materialists? In that case, put your faith in education, in the possibility that it will, as they say, disperse religious faith. But why arrest people? At this point, Goldman came in and started to interrupt rudely, but everyone shouted at him, Oh, shut up! Keep quiet! Go ahead, woman, talk! And how should they have addressed her? Citizeness? Comrade? Those forms of address were forbidden and these people were bound by the conventions of Soviet life. But woman, that was how Christ had spoken, and you couldn't go wrong there. And Vera continued in the presence of her interrogator. So there in the MGB office, those people listened to Cornea Vand. Why did the words of an insignificant prisoner touch them so near the quick? And why is it that for nearly two hundred years the security forces have hung on to the color of the heavens? That was what they wore in Lermontov's lifetime. And you, blue uniforms! Then came the blue service caps, blue shoulder boards, blue tabs, and then they were ordered to make themselves less conspicuous, and the blue brims were hidden from the gratitude of the people, and everything blue on the heads and shoulders was made narrower, until what was left was piping narrow rims, but still blue. Is this only a masquerade? Or is it that even blackness must, every so often, however rarely, partake of the heavens? It would be beautiful to think so, but when one learns, for example, the nature of Yagoda's striving toward the sacred, an eyewitness from the group around Gorky, who was close to Yagoda at the time, reports that in the vestibule of the bathhouse on Yagoda's estate near Moscow, Icons were placed so that Yagoda and his comrades, after undressing, could use them as targets for revolver practice before going in to take their baths. Just how are we to understand that? As the act of an evildoer? What sort of behavior is it? Do such people really exist? We would prefer to say that such people cannot exist, that there aren't any. It is permissible to portray evildoers in the story for children, so as to keep the picture simple. But when the great world literature of the past, Shakespeare, Schiller, Dickens, 
inflates and inflates images of evildoers of the blackest shades, it seems somewhat farcical and clumsy to our contemporary perception. The trouble lies in the way these classic evildoers are pictured. They recognize themselves as evildoers, and they know their souls are black, and they reason, I cannot live unless I do evil, so I'll set my father against my brother. I'll drink the victim's sufferings until I'm drunk with them. Iago very precisely identifies his purposes and his motives as being black and born of hate. But no, that's not the way it is. To do evil, a human being must first of all believe that what he's doing is good, or else that it's a well-considered act in conformity with natural law. Fortunately, it is in the nature of the human being to seek a justification for his actions. Macbeth's self-justifications were feeble, and his conscience devoured him. Yes, even Iago was a little lamb, too. The imagination and the spiritual strength of Shakespeare's evildoers stopped short at a dozen corpses. Because they had no ideology. Ideology. That is what gives evildoing its long-sought justification and gives the evildoer the necessary steadfastness and determination. That is the social story which helps to make his acts seem good instead of bad in his own and others' eyes, so that he won't hear reproaches and curses, but will receive praise and honors. That was how the agents of the Inquisition fortified their wills, by invoking Christianity. The conquerors of foreign lands, by extolling the grandeur of their motherland. The colonizers, by civilization. The Nazis, by race and the Jacobins, early and late, by equality, brotherhood, and the happiness of future generations. Thanks to ideology, the 20th century was fated to experience evildoing on a scale calculated in the millions. This cannot be denied, nor passed over, nor suppressed. How, then, do we dare insist that evildoers do not exist? And who was it that destroyed these millions? Without evildoers, there would have been no archipelago. There was a rumor going the rounds between 1918 and 1920 that the Petrograd Cheka, headed by Yuritsky, and the Odessa Cheka, headed by Deitch, did not shoot all those condemned to death, but fed some of them alive to the animals in the city zoos. I do not know whether this is truth or calumny, or, if there were any such cases, how many there were. But I would not set out to look for proof, either. Following the practice of the blue caps, I would propose that they prove to us that this was impossible. How else could they get food for the zoos in those famine years? Take it away from the working class? Those enemies were going to die anyway, so why couldn't their deaths support the zoo economy of the Republic and thereby assist our march into the future? Wasn't it expedient? That is the precise line the Shakespearean evildoer could not cross. But the evildoer, with an ideology, does cross it, and his eyes remain dry and clear. Physics is aware of the phenomena which occur only at threshold magnitudes, which do not exist at all until a certain threshold encoded by and known to nature has been crossed. No matter how intense a yellow light you shine on a lithium sample, it will not emit electrons, but as soon as a weak bluish light begins to glow, it does emit them. The threshold of a photoelectric effect has been crossed. You can cool oxygen to 100 degrees below centigrade and exert as much pressure as you want. It does not yield, but remains a gas. But as soon as minus 183 degrees is reached, it liquefies and begins to flow. Evidently, evil doing... Evidently, evildoing also has a threshold magnitude. Yes, a human being hesitates and bobs back and forth between good and evil all his life. He slips, falls back, clamors up, repents, things begin to darken again. But just so long as the threshold of evildoing is not crossed, the possibility of returning remains, and he himself is still within reach of our hope. But when, through the density of evil actions, the result either of their own extreme degree or of the absoluteness of his power, he suddenly crosses that threshold, he has left humanity behind, and without, perhaps, the possibility of return. 
From the most ancient times, justice has been a two-part concept. Virtue triumphs, and vice is punished. We have been fortunate enough to live in a time when virtue, though it does not triumph, is nonetheless not always tormented by attack dogs. Beaten down, sickly, virtue has now been allowed to enter in all its tatters and sit in the corner, as long as it doesn't raise its voice. However, no one dares say a word about vice. Yes, they did mock virtue, but there was no vice in that. Yes, so-and-so many millions did get mowed down, but no one was to blame for it. And if someone pipes up, what about those who... The answer comes from all sides, reproachfully and amicably at first. What are you talking about, comrade? Why open old wounds? Then they go after you with an oaken club. Shut up! Haven't you had enough yet? You think you've been rehabilitated? In that same period, by 1966, 86,000 Nazi criminals had been convicted in West Germany. And still we choke with anger here. We do not hesitate to devote to the subject page after newspaper page and hour after hour of radio time. We even stay after work to attend protest meetings and vote. Too few. 86,000 are too few. And 20 years is too little. It must go on and on. And during the same period, in our own country, according to the reports of the Military Collegium of the Supreme Court, about 10 men have been convicted. What takes place beyond the Yoder and the Rhine gets us all worked up. What goes on in the environs of Moscow and behind the green fences near Soki, or the fact that the murderers of our husbands and fathers ride through our streets and we make way for them as they pass, doesn't get us worked up at all, doesn't touch us. That would be digging up the past. Meanwhile, if we translate 86,000 West Germans into our own terms, on the basis of comparative population figures, it would become one quarter of a million. But in a quarter century, we have not tracked down anyone. We have not brought anyone to trial. It is their wounds we are afraid to reopen. The smug and stupid Maltov lives on at Granovsky, number three, a man who has learned nothing at all, even now, though he is saturated with our blood and nobly crosses the sidewalk to seat himself in his long, wide automobile. Here is a riddle not for us contemporaries to figure out. Why is Germany allowed to punish its evildoers and Russia is not? What kind of disastrous path lies ahead of us if we do not have the chance to purge ourselves of that putrefaction rotting inside our body? What, then, can Russia teach the world? In the German trials, an astonishing phenomenon takes place from time to time. The defendant clasps his head in his hands, refuses to make any defense, and from then on asks no concessions from the court. He says that the presentation of his crimes, revived and once again confronting him, has filled him with revulsion and he no longer wants to live. That is the ultimate height a trial can attain, when evil is so utterly condemned that even the criminal is revolted by it. A country which has condemned evil 86,000 times from the rostrum of a court and irrevocably condemned it in literature and among its young people year by year, step by step, is purged of it. What are we to do? Someday our descendants will describe our several generations as generations of driveling do-nothings. First we submissively allowed them to massacre us by the millions, and then, with devoted concern, we tended the murderers in their prosperous old age. What are we to do if the great Russian tradition of penitence is incomprehensible and absurd to them? What are we to do if the animal terror of hearing even one hundredth part of all they subjected others to outweighs in their hearts any inclination to justice? If they cling greedily to the harvest of benefits they have watered with the blood of those who perished, it is clear enough that those men who turned the handle of the meat grinder, even as late as 1937, are no longer young. They are fifty to eighty years old. They have lived the best years of their lives prosperously, well nourished and comfortable, so that it is too late for any kind of equal retribution as far as they are concerned. But let us be generous. We will not shoot them. We will not pour salt water into them, nor bury them in bedbugs, nor bridle them into a swan dive. 
nor keep them on sleepless stand-up for a week, nor kick them with jackboots, nor beat them with rubber truncheons, nor squeeze their skulls in iron rings, nor push them into a cell so that they lie atop one another like pieces of baggage. We will not do any of the things they did, but for the sake of our country and our children, we have the duty to seek them all out and bring them all to trial, not to put them on trial so much as their crimes, and to compel each one of them to announce loudly, Yes, I was an executioner and a murderer. And if these words were spoken in our country only one quarter of a million times, a just proportion if we are not to fall behind West Germany, would it perhaps be enough? It is unthinkable in the twentieth century to fail to distinguish between what constitutes an abominable atrocity that must be prosecuted and what constitutes that past which ought not to be stirred up. We have to condemn publicly the very idea that some people have the right to repress others. In keeping silent about evil, in burying it so deeply within us that no sign of it appears on the surface, we are implanting it. And it will rise up a thousandfold in the future. When we neither punish nor reproach evildoers, we are not simply protecting their trivial old age. We are thereby ripping the foundations of justice from beneath new generations. It is for this reason, and not because of the weakness of the indoctrinational work, that they are growing up indifferent. Young people are acquiring the conviction that foul deeds are never punished on earth, that they always bring prosperity. It is going to be uncomfortable, horrible, to live in such a country. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 First Cell, First Love How is one to take the title of this chapter? A cell and love in the same breath? Ah, well, probably it has to do with Leningrad during the blockade. And you were in prison in the big house. In that case, it would be very understandable. That's why you are still alive. Because they shove you in there. It was the best place in Leningrad, not only for the interrogators, who even lived there and had offices in the cellars in case of shelling. Joking aside, in Leningrad in those days, no one washed, and everyone's face was covered with a black crust. But in the big house, prisoners were given a hot shower every tenth day. While it's true that only the corridors were heated, for the jailers. The cells were left unheated, but after all, there were water pipes in the cells that worked, and a toilet, and where else in Leningrad could you find that? And the bread ration was just like the ration outside, barely four and a half ounces. In addition, there was broth made from slaughtered horses once a day, and thin gruel once a day as well. It was a case of the cats being envious of the dog's life. You sit down and half close your eyes and try to remember them all how many different cells you were imprisoned in during your term. It is difficult even to count them. And in each one there were people. People. There might be two people in one, one hundred and fifty in another. You were imprisoned for five minutes in one, and all summer long in another. But in every case, out of all the cells you've been in, your first cell is a very special one. The place where you first encountered others like yourself doomed to the same fate. All your life you will remember it with an emotion that you otherwise experience only in remembering your first love. And those people who shared with you the floor and air of that stone cubicle during those days when you rethought your entire life will from time to time be recollected by you as members of your own family. Yes, in those days they were your only family. What you experience in your first interrogation cell parallels nothing in your entire previous life or your whole subsequent life. No doubt prisons have stood for thousands of years before you came along, and may continue to stand after you too, longer than one would like to think. But that first interrogation cell is unique and inimitable. Maybe it was a terrible place for a human being, a lice-laden, bedbug-infested lockup, without windows, without ventilation without bunks, and with a dirty floor. Or maybe it was solitary in the Archangel prison, where the glass had been smeared over with red lead so that only rays of God's maimed light, which crept into you, were crimson, 
and where a 15-watt bulb burned constantly in the ceiling, day and night, or solitary in the city of Choibalsen, where, for six months at a time, fourteen of you were crowded onto seven square yards of floor space, in such a way that you could only shift your bent legs in unison, or it was one of the Lefortevos psychological cells, like number 111, which was painted black and also had a day and night 25-watt bulb, but was in all other respects like every other at Leforto cell. Asphalt floor, the heating valve out in the corridor where only the guards had access to it, all that interminable, irritating roar from the wind tunnel of the neighboring Central Aero and Hydrodynamics Institute, a roar which made it useless to converse and during which one could sing at the top of one's lungs and the jailer wouldn't even hear. And then when the roar stopped, there would ensue a sense of relief and the felicity superior to freedom itself. But it was not the dirty floor, nor the murky walls, nor the odor of the latrine bucket that you loved, but those fellow prisoners with whom you about faced at command, and that something which beat between your heart and theirs. And their sometimes astonishing words, and then, too, the birth within you, on that very spot, of free-floating thoughts you had so recently been unable to leap or rise to. And how much it had cost you to last out until that first cell. You had been kept in a pit, or in a box, or in a cellar. No one had addressed a human word to you. No one had looked at you with human gaze. All they did was to peck at your brain and heart with iron beaks. When you cried out or groaned, they laughed. For a week or a month you had been in an abandoned waif, alone among enemies, and you had already said goodbye to reason and to life, and you had already tried to kill yourself by falling from the radiator in such a way as to smash your brains against the iron cone of the valve. Then all of a sudden you were alive again, and you were brought in to your friends, and reason returned to you. That's what your first cell is. You waited for that cell. You dreamed of it almost as eagerly as of freedom. Meanwhile, they kept shoving you around between cracks in the wall and holes in the ground, from Lefortovo into some legendary diabolical Sukhanovka. Sukhanovka was the most terrible prison the MGB had. Its very name was used to intimidate prisoners. Interrogators would hiss it threateningly, and you would not be able to question those who had been there. Either they were insane and talking only disconnected nonsense, or they were dead. Sukhanovka was a former monastery dating back to Catherine the Great. It consisted of two buildings, one which prisoners served out their terms, and the other a structure that contained 68 monks' cells and was used for interrogations. The journey there in a black mariah took two hours and only a handful of people knew that the prison was really just a few miles from Lenin's Gorky estate and near the former estate of Zineda Volkanskaya. The countryside surrounding it was beautiful. There they stunned the newly arrived prisoner with a stand-up punishment cell again, so narrow that when he was no longer able to stand, he had to sag, supported by his bent knees propped against the wall. There was no alternative. They kept prisoners thus for more than a day to break their resistance, but they ate tender, tasty food at Sukhanovka, which was like nothing else in the MGB, because it was brought in from the architect's rest home. They didn't maintain a separate kitchen to prepare hogwash. However, the amount one architect would eat, including fried potatoes and meatballs, was divided among twelve prisoners. As a result, the prisoners were not only always hungry, but also exceedingly irritable. The cells were all built for two, but prisoners under interrogation were usually kept in them singly. The dimensions were five by six and a half feet. To be absolutely precise, they were 156 centimeters by 209 centimeters. How do we know? Through a triumph of engineering, calculation, and a strong heart that even Sukhanovka could not break, the measurements were the work of Alexander Dolgan, who would not allow them to drive him to madness or despair. He resisted by striving to use his mind to calculate distances. In Lefortovo, he counted steps, converted them into kilometers, remembered from a map how many kilometers it was from Moscow to the border, and then how many across all Europe and how many across the Atlantic Ocean. He was sustained in this by the hope of returning to America, 
and in one year in Lefortevo's solitary he got, so to speak, halfway across the Atlantic. Thereupon they took him to Sukhanovka. Here, realizing how few would survive to tell of it, and all our information about it comes from him, he invented a method of measuring the cell. The numbers 10-22 were stamped on the bottom of his prison bowl, and he guessed that 10 was the diameter of the bottom and 22 the diameter of the outside edge. Then he pulled a thread from a towel, made himself a tape measure, and measured everything with it. Then he began to invent a way of sleeping standing up, propping his knees against the small chair, and of deceiving the guard into thinking his eyes were open. He succeeded in this deception, and that was how he managed to not go insane when Ryuman kept him sleepless for a month. Two little round stools were welded to the stone floor. Like stumps at night, if the guard unlocked a cylinder lock, a shelf dropped from the wall on each stump and remained there for seven hours. In other words, during the hours of interrogation, since there was no daytime interrogation at Sukhanovka at all, and a little straw mattress large enough for a child also dropped down. During the day, the stool was exposed and free, but one was forbidden to sit on it. In addition, a table lay, like an ironing board, on four upright pipes. The fortochka, in the window, the small hinged pane for ventilation, was always closed except for ten minutes in the morning when the guard cranked it open. The glass in the little window was reinforced. There were never any exercise periods out of doors. Prisoners were taken to the toilet at 6 a.m. only, i.e. when no one's stomach needed it. There was no toilet period in the evening. There were also two guards for each block of seven cells, so that was why the prisoners could be under almost constant inspection through the peephole, the only interruption being the time it took the guard to step past two doors to a third. And that was the purpose of silent Sukhanovka, to leave the prisoner not a single moment for sleep, not a single stolen moment for privacy. You were always being watched and always in their power. But if you endured the whole duel with insanity and all the trials of loneliness and had stood firm, you deserved your first cell. And now, when you got into it, your soul would heal. If you had surrendered, if you had given in and betrayed everyone, you were all so ready for your first cell. But it would have been better for you not to have lived until that happy moment and to have died a victor in the cellar without having signed a single sheet of paper. Now for the first time you were about to see people who were not your enemies. Now for the first time you were about to see others who were alive, who were traveling your road, and whom you could join to yourself with the joyous word, WE. Yes, that word which you may have despised out in freedom, when they used it as a substitute for your own individuality, all of us, like one man, or WE are deeply angered, or we demand, or we swear, is now revealed to you as something sweet. You are not alone in the world. Wise, spiritual beings, human beings, still exist. I had been dueling for four days with the interrogator when the jailer, having waited until I lay down to sleep in my blindingly lit box, began to unlock my door. I heard him all right, but before he could say, Get up! Interrogation! I wanted to lie for another three hundredths of a second with my head on the pillow and pretend I was sleeping. But instead of the familiar command, the guard ordered, Get up! Pick up your bedding! Uncomprehendingly and unhappy because this was my most precious time, I wound on my foot cloths, put on my boots, my overcoat, my winter cap, and clasped the government-issue mattress in my arms. The guard was walking on tiptoe and kept signaling me to not make any noise as he led me down a corridor silent as the grave. Through the fourth door of the Lubyanka, past the desk of the section supervisor, past the shiny numbers on the cells and the olive-colored covers of the peepholes, and unlocked cell 67. I entered and he locked it behind me immediately. Even though only a quarter of an hour or so had passed since the signal to go to sleep had been given, the period allotted the prisoners for sleeping was so fragile and undependable and brief 
that by the time I had arrived, the inhabitants of cell 67 were already asleep on their metal cots with their hands on top of the blankets. At the sound of the door opening, all three started and raised their heads for an instant. They, too, were waiting to learn which of them might be taken to interrogation. And those three lifted heads, those three unshaven, crumpled, pale faces, seemed to me so human, so dear, that I stood there, hugging my mattress, and smiled with happiness. And they smiled. And what a forgotten look that was, after only one week. "'Are you from freedom?' they asked me. That was the question customarily put to a newcomer. "'No,' I replied. And that was a newcomer's usual first reply. They had in mind that I had already been arrested recently, which meant that I came from freedom. And I, after ninety-six hours of interrogation, hardly considered that I was from freedom. Was I not already a veteran prisoner? Nonetheless, I was from freedom. The beardless old man with the black and very lively eyebrows was already asking me for military and political news. Astonishing, even though it was late February, they knew nothing about the Yalta Conference, nor the encirclement of East Prussia, nor anything at all about our own attack below Warsaw in mid-January, nor even about the woeful December retreat of the Allies. According to regulations, those under interrogation were not supposed to know anything about the outside world, and here, indeed, they didn't. I was prepared to spend half the night telling them all about it, with pride, as though all the victories and advances were the work of my own hands. But at this point the duty jailer brought in my cot, and I had to set it up without making any noise. I was helped by a fellow my own age, also a military man. His tunic and aviator's cap hung on his cot. He had asked me, even before the old man spoke, not for news of the war, but for tobacco. But although I felt open-hearted toward my new friends, and although not many words have been exchanged in the few minutes since I joined them, I sensed something alien in this front-line soldier who was my contemporary, and, as far as he was concerned, I clammed up immediately and forever. I had not yet even heard the word Nasidka, stool pigeon, nor learned that there had to be one such stool pigeon at each cell, and I had not yet had time to think things over and conclude that I did not like this fellow, Georgi Kramarenko. But a spiritual relay, a sensor relay, had clicked inside me, and it had closed him off from me for good and all. I would not bother to recall this event if it had not been the only one of its kind. But soon, with astonishment and alarm, I became aware of the work of this internal sensor relay as a constant inborn trait. The years passed, and I lay in the same bunks, marched in the same formations, and worked in the same work brigades with hundreds of others. And always that secret censor relay, for whose creation I deserved not the least bit of credit, worked even before I remembered it was there, worked at the first sight of a human face and eyes, at the first sound of a voice, so that I opened my heart to that person either fully or just the width of a crack, or else shut myself off from him completely. This was so consistently unfailing that all the efforts of the state security officers to employ stool pigeons began to seem to me as insignificant as being pestered by gnats. After all, a person who has undertaken to be a traitor always betrays the fact in his face and in his voice, and even though some were more skilled in pretense, there was always something fishy about them. On the other hand, the censor relay helped me distinguish those to whom I could, from the very beginning of our acquaintance, completely disclose my most precious depths and secrets. Secrets for which heads roll. Thus it was that I got through eight years of imprisonment, three years of exile, and another six years of underground authorship, which were in no wise less dangerous. During all those seventeen years I recklessly revealed myself to dozens of people, and didn't make a misstep even once. I have never read about this trait anywhere, and I mention it here for those interested in psychology. It seems to me that such spiritual sensors exist in many of us, but because we live in too technological and rational an age, we neglect this miracle and don't allow it to develop. We set up the cot, and I was then ready to talk. 
in a whisper, of course, and lying down, so as to not be sent from this cozy nest into a punishment cell. But our third cellmate, a middle-aged man whose cropped head already showed the white bristles of imminent grayness, peered at me discontentedly and said with characteristic northern severity, "'Tomorrow night is for sleeping.' That was the most intelligent thing to do. At any minute, one of us could have been pulled out for interrogation and held until 6 a.m., when the interrogator would go home to sleep, but we were forbidden to. One night of undisturbed sleep was more important than all the fates on earth. One more thing held me back, which I didn't quite catch right away, but had felt nonetheless from the first words of my story, although I could not at this early date find a name for it. As each of us had been arrested, everything in our world had switched places. A 180-degree shift in all our concepts had occurred, and the good news I had begun to recount with such enthusiasm might not be good news for us at all. My cellmates turned on their sides, covered their eyes with their handkerchiefs to keep out the light from the 200-watt bulb, wound towels around their upper arms, which were chilled from lying on the top of the blankets, hid their lower arms furtively beneath them, and went to sleep. And I lay there, filled to the brim with the joy of being among them. One hour ago I could not have counted on being with anyone, I could have come to my end with a bullet in the back of my head, which was what the interrogator kept promising me, without having seen anyone at all. Interrogation still hung over me, but how far it had retreated! Tomorrow I would be telling them my story, though not talking about my case, of course. And they would be telling me their stories, too. How interesting tomorrow would be, one of the best days of my life! Thus, very early and very clearly, I had this consciousness that prison was not an abyss for me, but the most important turning point in my life. And there was no reason to be bored with my companions in my new cell. They were people to listen to and people with whom to compare notes. The old fellow with the lively eyebrows, and at sixty-three he in no way bore himself like an old man. It was Anatoly Ilyik Fastenko. He was a big asset to a Libyanka cell both as a keeper of the old Russian prison traditions and as a living history of Russian revolutions. Thanks to all that he remembered, he somehow managed to put in perspective everything that had taken place in the past and everything that was taking place in the present. Such people are valuable not only in a cell. We badly need them in our society as a whole. Right there in our cell, we read Festingo's name in a book about the 1905 revolution. He had been a social democrat for such a long, long time that in the end, it seemed, he had ceased to be one. He had been sentenced to his first prison term in 1904 while still a young man, but he had been freed outright under the manifesto proclaimed on October 17, 1905. There was so much about Festenko I could not yet understand. In my eyes, perhaps the main thing about him, and the most surprising, was that he had known Lenin personally yet he was quite cool in recalling this. Such was my attitude at the time when someone in the cell called Festenko by his patronymic alone, without using his given name, in other words simply asking, Iliak, is it your turn to take out the latrine bucket? I was utterly outraged and offended because it seemed sacrilege to me not to use Lenin's patronymic name in the same sentence as latrine bucket. But even to call anyone on earth Iliak, except that one man, Lenin. For this reason, no doubt, there was much that Festenko would have liked to explain to me that he still could not bring himself to. Nonetheless, he did say to me, in the clearest Russian, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. But I failed to understand him. Observing my enthusiasm, he more than once said to me insistently, You're a mathematician. It's a mistake for you to forget that maxim of Descartes. Question everything. Question everything? What did he mean, everything? Certainly not everything. It seemed to me that I had questioned enough things as it was, and that was enough of that. Or, he said, hardly any of the old hard labor political prisoners of the Tsarist times are left. I am one of the last. All of the hard labor politicals have been destroyed, and they even dissolved our society in the thirties. Why? I asked. So we would not get together and discuss things. 
And although these simple words, spoken in a calm tone, should have been shouted to the heavens, should have shattered window panes, I understood them only as indicating one more of Stalin's evil deeds. It was a troublesome fact, but without roots. One thing is absolutely definite. Not everything that enters our ears penetrates our consciousness. Anything too far out of tune with our attitude is lost, either in the ears themselves or somewhere beyond, but it is lost. And even though I clearly remember Festenko's many stories, I recall his opinions but vaguely. He gave me the names of various books which he strongly advised me to read whenever I got back to freedom. In view of his age and his health, he evidently did not count on getting out of prison alive, and he got some satisfaction from hoping that I would some day understand his ideas. Fastenko was the most cheerful person in the cell, even though, in view of his age, he was the only one who could not count on surviving and returning to freedom. Flinging an arm around my shoulders, he would say, To stand up for the truth is nothing. For truth, you have to sit in jail. Or else he taught me to sing this song from the Tsarist hard labor days. And if we have to perish, in mines and prison wet, Our cause will never find renown in future generations yet. And I believe this. May these pages help his faith come true. Spring promises everyone happiness, and tenfold to the prisoner. Oh, April Sky, it didn't matter that I was in prison. Evidently they were not going to shoot me. And in the end I would become wiser here. I would come to understand many things here, heaven. I would correct my mistakes yet, O oh heaven, not for them, but for you, heaven. I had come to understand those mistakes here, and I would correct them. The walk in the fresh air lasted only twenty minutes, but how much there was about it to concern oneself with, how much one had to accomplish while it lasted. During that outdoor walk you concentrated on breathing as much fresh air as possible. There, too, alone beneath that bright heaven, you had to imagine your bright future life, sinless and without error. There, too, was the best place to talk about the most dangerous subjects— it didn't matter that conversation during the walk was forbidden. One simply had to know how to manage it. The compensation was that in all likelihood you could not be overheard either by a stoolie or by a microphone. During these walks I tried to get into a pair with Susie, once a leading lawyer in Estonia. We talked together in the cell, but we liked to try talking about the main things here. We hadn't come together quickly. It took some time but he had already managed to help me a great deal. I acquired a new capability from him, to accept patiently and purposely things that had never had any place in my own plans and had, it seemed, no connection at all with the clearly outlined direction of my life. From childhood on, I had somehow known that my objective was the history of the Russian Revolution, and nothing else concerned me. To understand the revolution, I had long since required nothing beyond Marxism. I cut myself off from everything else that came up and turned my back on it. And now fate brought me together with Susie. He breathed a completely different sort of air, and he would tell me passionately about his own interests, and these were Estonia and democracy. And although I had never expected to become interested in Estonia, much less bourgeois democracy, I nevertheless kept listening and listening to his loving stories of twenty free years in that modest, work-loving, small nation of big men whose ways were slow and set. I listened to the principles of the Estonian constitution, which had been borrowed from the best of European experience, and to how their hundred-member, one-house parliament had worked, and, though the why of it wasn't clear, and stored away in my experience. I listened willingly to their fatal history. The tiny Estonian anvil had, from way, way back, been caught between two hammers, the Teutons and the Slays. Blows showered on it from east and west in turn. There was no end to it, and there still isn't. And there was the well-known, totally unknown, story of how we Russians wanted to take them over in one fell swoop in 1918, but they refused to yield. 
and how later on Udenik spoke contemptuously of their Finnish heritage, and how we ourselves christened them White Guard Bandits. Then the Estonian gymnasium students enrolled as volunteers. We struck at Estonia again in 1940, and again in 1941, and again in 1944. Some of their sons were conscripted by the Russian army, and others by the German army, and still others ran off into the woods. The elderly Tallinn intellectuals discussed how they might break out of that iron ring, break away somehow, and live for themselves and by themselves. Their premier might, possibly, have been Tief, and their minister of education, say, Susie. But neither Churchill nor Roosevelt cared about them in the least. But Uncle Joe did. And during the first nights after the Soviet armies entered Tallinn, all these dreamers were seized in their Tallinn apartments. Fifteen of them were imprisoned in various cells of the Moscow Lubyanka, and were charged under Article 58-2 with the criminal desire for national self-determination. Each time we returned to the cell from our walk was like being arrested again. Even in our very special cell, the air seemed stifling after the outdoors, and it would have been good to have a snack afterward, too. But it was best not to think about it. Not at all. I often argued with Yuri Yevtukovich. Yuri spoke German fluently. In 1941, they dressed him as a German POW officer, provided him with the necessary documents, and set him on a reconnaissance mission. He fulfilled his mission and on the way back changed into a Soviet uniform, which he took off a dead officer. Then he was taken prisoner by the Germans. They sent him to a concentration camp near Vilnius. In every life there is one particular event that is decisive for the entire person, for his fate, his convictions, his passions. Two years in that camp shook Yuri up once and for all. It is impossible to catch with words or to circumvent with syllogisms what that camp was. That was a camp to die in, and whoever did not die was compelled to reach certain conclusions. The slops for which POW officers stood in line with their mess tins from 6 a.m. on, while the ordiners beat them with sticks and the cooks with ladles, were not enough to sustain life. At evening, Yuri could see from the windows of their room the one and only picture for which his artistic talent had been given him. The evening mist hovering above a swampy meadow encircled by barbed wire, a multitude of bonfires and, around the bonfires, beings who had once been Russian officers but had now become beast-like creatures, who gnawed the bones of dead horses, who baked patties from potato rinds, who smoked manure, and were all swarming with lice. Not all those two-legged creatures had died as yet. Not all of them had lost the capacity for intelligible speech, and one of them could see in the crimson reflections of bonfires how a belated understanding was dawning on those faces which were descending to the Neanderthal. Wormwood on the tongue, that life which Yuri had preserved was no longer precious to him for its own sake. He was not one of those who easily agreed to forget. No, if he was going to survive, he was obliged to draw certain conclusions. It was already clear to them that the Germans were not the heart of the matter, or at least not the Germans alone, that among the POWs of many nationalities, only the Soviets lived like this and died like this. None were worse off than the Soviets. Even the Poles, even the Yugoslaves, existed in far more tolerable conditions, and as for the English and the Norwegians, they were inundated by the International Red Cross with parcels from home. They didn't even bother to line up for German rations. Wherever there were Allied POW camps next door, their prisoners, out of kindness, threw our men handouts over the fence, and our prisoners jumped on these gifts like a pack of dogs on a bone. The Russians were carrying the whole war on their shoulders, and this was the Russian lot. Why? What is the right course of action if our mother has sold us to the gypsies? No, even worse, thrown us to the dogs. Does she really remain our mother? If a wife had become a whore, are we really still bound to her in fidelity? A motherland that betrays its soldiers, is that really a motherland? 
When, in the spring of 1942, recruiters from the first Belarusian legions put in an appearance, some POWs signed up with them to escape starvation. Yuri went with them out of conviction, with a clear mind. Just where could one draw the line, which step was the fatal one? Yuri became a lieutenant in the German army. In all, Yuri spent three weeks in our cell. I argued with him during all those weeks. I said that our revolution was magnificent and just, that only its 1929 distortion was terrible. He looked at me regretfully, compressing his nervous lips. Just before May 1st, they took down the blackout shade on the window. The war was perceptibly coming to an end. That evening, it was quieter than ever before in the Libyanka. It was, I remember, almost like the second day of Easter, since May Day and Easter came one after the other that year. All the interrogators were out in Moscow celebrating. No one was taken to interrogation. In the silence, we could hear someone across the corridor protesting. They took him from the cell and into a box. By listening, we could detect the location of all the doors. They left the door of the box open, and they kept beating him a long time. In the suspended silence, every blow on his soft and choking mouth could be heard clearly. On May 2nd, a thirty-gun salute roared out. That meant a European capital. Only two had not yet been captured, Prague and Berlin. We tried to guess which it was. On the 9th of May, they brought us our dinner at the same time as our lunch, which was done at the Libyanka only on May 1st and November 7th. And that was how we guessed that the war had ended. That evening, they shot off another 30-gun salute. We then knew that there were no more capitals to be captured. And later that same evening, one more salute roared out. Forty guns, I seem to remember. And that was the end of all the ends. Above the muzzle of our window, and from all the other cells of the Libyanka, and from all the windows of all the Moscow prisons, we, too, former prisoners of war and former frontline soldiers, watched the Moscow heavens, patterned with fireworks and crisscrossed by the beams of searchlights. Boris Gemerov, a young anti-tank man, already demobilized because of his wounds, with an incurable wound in his lung, having been arrested with a group of students, was in prison that evening in an overcrowded Butyrki cell, where half the inmates were former POWs and frontline soldiers. He described this last salute of the war in a terse eight-stanza poem, in the most ordinary language, how they were already lying down on their board bunks, covered with their overcoats, how they were awakened by the noise, how they raised their heads, squinted up at the muzzle, oh, it's just a salute, and then lay down again, and once again covered themselves with their coats, with those same overcoats which had been in the clay of trenches, in the ashes of bonfires, and been torn to tatters by German shell fragments. That victory was not for us, and that spring not for us either. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6. That Spring Through the windows of the Butyrki prison, every morning and evening in June 1945, we could hear the brassy notes of bands not far away, coming from either Lesnaya Street or Nova Slobotskaya. They kept playing marches over and over. Behind the murky green muzzles of reinforced glass, we stood at the wide-open but impenetrable prison windows and listened. Were they military units that were marching, or were they workers cheerfully devoting their free time to marching practice? We didn't know, but the rumor had already gotten through to us that preparations were underway for a big victory parade on Red Square on June 22nd, the fourth anniversary of the beginning of the war. The foundation stones of a great building are destined to groan and be pressed upon. It is not for them to crown the edifice but even the honor of being part of the foundation was denied those who doomed heads and ribs had borne the first blows of this war and thwarted the foreigner's victory, and who were now abandoned for no good reason. Joyful sounds mean naught to the traitor. That spring of 1945 was, in our prisons, 
predominantly the spring of the Russian prisoners of war. They passed through the prisons of the Soviet Union in vast, dense gray schools like ocean herring. The first trace of those schools I glimpsed was Yuri Yevtukovic, but I was soon entirely surrounded by their purposeful motion, which seemed to know its own fated design. Not only war prisoners passed through those cells. A wave of those who had spent any time in Europe was rolling, too. Emigres from the Civil War, the Astovsky workers, recruited as laborers by the Germans during World War II, Red Army officers who had been too astute and far-sighted in their conclusions, so that Stalin feared they might bring European freedom back from their European crusade, like the Decemberists 120 years before. And yet, it was the war prisoners who constituted the bulk of the wave. And among the war prisoners of various ages, most were my own age, not precisely my age, but the Twins of October, those born along with the Revolution, who in 1937 had poured forth undismayed to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Revolution, and whose age group at the beginning of the war made up the standing army, which had been scattered in a matter of weeks. That tedious prison spring had, to the tune of the victory marches, become the spring of reckoning for my whole generation. Over our cradles the rallying cry had resounded, All power to the Soviets! It was we who had reached out our sun-tanned childish hands to clutch the pioneer's bugle, and who, in response to the pioneer challenge, Be Prepared, had saluted and answered, we are always prepared. It was we who had smuggled weapons into Buchenwald and joined the Communist Party there. And it was we who were now in disgrace only because we had survived. Back when the Red Army had cut through East Prussia, I had seen downcast columns of returning war prisoners, the only people around who were grieving instead of celebrating. Even then their gloom had shocked me, though I didn't quite grasp the reason for it. I jumped down and went over to those voluntarily formed up columns. Why were they marching in columns? Why had they lined themselves up in ranks? After all, no one had compelled them to, and the war prisoners of all other nations went home as scattered individuals. But ours wanted to return as submissively as possible. I was wearing a captain's shoulder boards, and they, plus the fact that I was moving forward, helped prevent my finding out why our POWs were so sad. But then fate turned me around and sent me in the wake of those prisoners along the same path they had taken. I had already marched with them from Army Counterintelligence Headquarters to the headquarters at the front, and when we got there I had heard their first stories, which I didn't yet understand. And then Yuri Yatukovic told me the whole thing. And here, beneath the domes of the brick-red Butiri Castle, I felt that the story of these several million Russian prisoners had got me in its grip once and for all, like a pin through a specimen beetle. My own story of landing in prison seemed insignificant. I stopped regretting my torn-off shoulder boards. It was mere chance that had kept me from ending up exactly where these contemporaries of mine had ended. I came to understand that it was my duty to take upon my shoulders a share of their common burden and to bear it to the last man, until it crushed us. Sometimes we try to lie, but our tongue will not allow us to. These people were labeled traitors, but a remarkable slip of the tongue occurred, on the part of the judges, prosecutors, and interrogators, and the convicted prisoners, the entire nation, and the newspapers repeated and reinforced this mistake, involuntarily letting the truth out of the bag. They intended to declare them traitors to the motherland, but they were universally referred to, in speech and in writing, even in the court documents, as traitors of the motherland. You said it. They were not traitors to her. They were her traitors. It was not they, the unfortunates, who had betrayed the motherland, but their calculating motherland who had betrayed them, and not just once, but thrice. The first time she betrayed them was on the battlefield, through ineptitude, when the government, so beloved by the motherland, did everything it could to lose the war, destroyed the lines of fortifications, set up the whole air force for annihilation, dismantled the tanks and artillery, 
removed the effective generals, and forbade the armies to resist. And the war prisoners were the men whose bodies took the blow and stopped the Wehrmacht. The second time they were heartlessly betrayed by the motherland was when she abandoned them to die in captivity. And the third time they were unscrupulously betrayed was when, with motherly love, she coaxed them to return home, which such phrases as, The motherland has forgiven you! The motherland calls you! and snared them the moment they reached the frontiers. It would appear that during one thousand... It would appear that during the 1,100 years of Russia's existence as a state, there have been, ah, how many foul and terrible deeds. But among them was there ever so multi-million foul a deed as this, to betray one's own soldiers and proclaim them traitors. How many wars Russia has been involved in? It would have been better if there had been fewer. And were there many traitors in all those wars? Had anyone observed that treason had become deeply rooted in the hearts of Russian soldiers? Then, under the most just social system in the world, came the most just war of all, and out of nowhere millions of traitors appeared, from among the simplest, lowliest elements of the population. How is this to be understood and explained? Capitalist England fought at our side against Hitler. Marx had eloquently described the poverty and suffering of the working class in that same England. Why was it that in this war only one traitor could be found among them, the businessman Lord Ha Ha, but our country millions? It is frightening to open one's trap about this, but might the heart of the matter not be in the political system? All the Western peoples behave the same in our war. Parcels, letters, all kinds of assistance flowed freely through the neutral countries. The Western POWs did not have to lower themselves to accept ladlefuls from German soup kettles. They talked back to the German guards. Western governments gave their captured soldiers their seniority rights, their regular promotions, even their pay. The only soldier in the world who cannot surrender is the soldier of the world's one and only Red Army. That's what it says in our military statutes. The Germans would shout at us from their trenches, Ivan Plan Knight! I've been no prisoner. Who can picture all that means? There is war, there is death, but there is no surrender. What a discovery! What it means is, go and die, we will go on living. And if you lose your legs, yet manage to return from captivity on crutches, we will convict you. Our soldiers alone, renounced by their motherland and degraded to nothing in the eyes of enemies and allies, had to push their way to the swine swill being doled out in the backyards of the Third Reich. Our soldiers alone had the doors shut tight to keep them from returning to their homes, although their young souls tried hard not to believe this. There was something called Article 58-1-B, and, in wartime, it provided only for execution by shooting. For not wanting to die from a German bullet, the prisoner had to die from a Soviet bullet for having been a prisoner of war. Some get theirs from the enemy, we get it from our own. Very few of the war prisoners returned across the Soviet border as free men, and if one happened to get through by accident because of the prevailing chaos, he was seized later on, even as late as 1946 or 1947. Some were arrested in assembly points in Germany. Others weren't arrested openly right away, but were transported from the border in freight cars, under convoy, to one of the numerous identification and screaming camps, PFLs, scattered throughout the country. These camps differed in no way from the common run of corrective labor camps, ITLs, except that their prisoners had not yet been sentenced, but would be sentenced there. All these PFLs were attached to some kind of factory or mine or construction project, and the former POWs, looking out on the motherland newly restored to them through the same barbed wire through which they had seen Germany, could begin work from their first day on a ten-hour workday. Those under suspicion were questioned during their rest periods, in the evenings and at night, and there were large numbers of security officers and interrogators in the PFLs for this purpose. As always, the interrogation began with the hypothesis that you were obviously guilty, and you, without going outside the barbed wire, 
had to prove that you were not guilty. Your only available means to this end was to rely on witnesses who were exactly the same kind of POWs as you. Obviously, they might not have turned up in your own PFL. They might, in fact, be at the other end of the country. In that case, the security officers of, say, Kemerovo would send off inquiries to the security officers of Solikimsk, who would question the witnesses and send back their answers along with new inquiries, and you yourself would be questioned as a witness in some other case. True, it might take a year or two before your fate was resolved, but after all, the motherland was losing nothing in the process. You were out mining coal every day, and if one of your witnesses gave the wrong sort of testimony about you, or if none of your witnesses was alive, you had only yourself to blame, and you were sure to be entered in the documents as a traitor of the motherland, and the visiting military court would rubber-stamp your tenor. And if, despite all their twisting things about, it appeared that you really hadn't worked for the Germans, and if, and this was the main point, you had not had the chance to see the Americans and the English with your own eyes, to have been liberated from captivity by them instead of by us was a gravely aggravating circumstance. Then the security officers would decide the degree of isolation in which you were to be held. Oh, if I had only known! That was the refrain in the prison cells that spring. If I had only known that this was how I would be greeted, that they would deceive me so, that this would be my fate, would I have really returned to my motherland? Not for anything. The only ones who did not sigh, oh, if I had only known, because they knew very well what they were doing, and the only ones who did not expect any mercy and did not expect any amnesty, were the Vlasov men. I had known about them and been perplexed about them long before our unexpected meeting on the board bunks of prison. First, there had been the leaflets reporting the creation of the ROA, the Russian Liberation Army, not only were they written in bad Russian, but they were imbued with an alien spirit that was clearly German and, moreover, seemed little concerned with a presumed subject. Besides, and on the other hand, they contained crude boasting about the plentiful chow available and the cheery mood of the soldiers. Somehow one couldn't believe in that army and, if it really did exist, what kind of cheery mood could it be in? Only a German could lie like that. Actually, no Russian Liberation Army ever existed until almost the very end of the war. During all those years, several hundred thousand voluntary helpers, the Hilfswillage, were scattered throughout all sorts of German units as enlisted men, or in even more subordinate positions. In addition, there were a few volunteer anti-Soviet units, made up of former Soviet citizens but under the command of German officers. The Lithuanians were the first to start supporting the Germans. Understandably so, we had really hurt them beyond endurance in just one year. Then the Ukrainians formed a voluntary SS division, and the Estonians joined a few SS units. In Belarusia, there was a people's militia fighting against the partisans, 100,000 men. There was a Turkestan battalion, and in Crimea, a Tartar one. All this was a harvest of what the Soviets had sowed like the senseless persecution of Islam in Crimea, whose far-sighted conqueror, Catherine II, had assigned state funds to build new mosques and enlarge others. Hitler's military units occupying the area had also enough common sense to protect the mosques. When the Germans conquered our southern regions, the number of volunteer battalions increased. There was a Georgian one, an Armenian one, a battalion of the northern Caucasus peoples, and sixteen Kalmyk battalions and there were almost no Soviet partisans in the south. During the German retreat from the Don region, about 15,000 Cossacks followed the German army. Half of them were able to fight. In the Bryansk region near Lukat, in 1941, before the arrival of the Germans, the local population dissolved the Caucasus and readied itself to fight the Soviet partisans. The autonomous region that was then created remained in existence until 1943 headed by an engineer, Vaska Boynikov. It had 20,000 armed men whose flag bore the image of St. George. They called themselves the Russian National Liberation Army. In the fall of 1942, 
Vlasov allowed the use of his name in order to unite all the anti-Bolshevik units. And during that same fall, Hitler's headquarters turned down a proposal from the middle rank army officers that Germany should renounce all plans for Eastern colonization and substitute them for the creation of Russian national military units. Vlasov had only just made his fatal choice and taken the first step on this road when he became entirely useless except for propaganda purposes. The situation never changed until the very end. Wearing a homemade brown uniform which did not belong to any army, with the red lapels of a general's coat but without any insignia of rank, Vlasov made his first trip in March 1943, and a second one in April. These trips caused much enthusiasm among the Russian populations. They seemed to prove that a Russian national movement was being born and that an independent Russia could be resurrected. Vlasov made public appearances in the theaters of Smolensk and Peskov, both filled to capacity. He spoke about the goals of the liberation movement and then proceeded to declare openly that National Socialism was unacceptable for Russia, but that, on the other hand, it was impossible to overthrow the Bolsheviks without the Germans. Just as openly, people asked him whether it was true that the Germans intended to turn Russia into a colony and the Russian people into beasts of burden. They asked, Why has nobody so far stated clearly what will be Russia's future after the war? Why don't the Germans allow Russia self-government in the occupied regions? Why must the anti-Stalin volunteers fight under the command of German officers? Vlasov answered these questions with some embarrassment, displaying more optimism than he could truly have felt at that time. The German general headquarters reacted with an order issued by Marshal Keitel. In view of the incompetent and shameless decorations made by the prisoner of war, Russian General Vlasov, during his trip to the Northern Army Group, which was undertaken without the Fuhrer and my knowledge, he is to be immediately transferred to a POW camp. The general's name could be used only for propaganda purposes, and if he were ever to make a public statement again, he would be turned over to the Gestapo and rendered harmless. Those were the last months during which millions of Soviet people were still out of Stalin's reach and could fight against Bolshevik slavery and organize their own independent existence. But the German leadership had no hesitations. On June 8, 1943, on the eve of the kursk orov battle, Hitler confirmed that a Russian independent army would never be created and that Germany needed Russians only as manpower. Hitler was unable to understand the historical fact that the opportunity to overthrow a communist regime can come only from a popular movement, from an uprising of the long-suffering population. But Hitler was more afraid of such a Russia and such a victory than of a defeat. Even after Stalingrad, even after he lost the Caucasus, Hitler did not notice anything new. While Stalin was assuming the role of the supreme defender of a nation, introducing the old Russian epaulets, restoring the Orthodox Church, and dissolving the Comintern, Hitler was helping him as much as he could by ordering, in September 1943, that all volunteer units be disarmed and assigned to guarding coal mines. Later, he changed his mind and transferred them to the Western Front to fight against the Allies. Such was, fundamentally, the end of the entire project of an independent Russian army. So what did Vlasov do? He did not quite know how bad things really were. He did not know that after his March and April journeys, he was again considered a prisoner of war and was in danger. He adopted the irreparable and fatal course of hoping and, to a certain extent, attempting to reach an agreement with the Beast. Whereas in dealing with the apocalyptic beasts, there is only one way to safety, unswerving firmness from the first minute to the last. But here one must ask whether such an avenue to safety ever existed for the liberation movement of the citizens of Russia. It was doomed right from the start to be one more victim of the 1917 sacrificial altar, which had not yet cooled off completely. The first war winter of 1941 to 1942, which destroyed several million Soviet prisoners of war, extending the long chain made of victims' bones, the chain begun in the summer, when unarmed people's militia units had been sent to save Bolshevism. 
Thus, the already fading significance of this bitter volunteer struggle was altogether lost. These people were sent as cannon fodder in the fight against the Allies and against the French resistance, that is, against the only forces with whom the Russians and Germany could have had a genuine feeling of solidarity, having experienced both the cruelty and self-satisfaction of the Germans. This was the end of the secret hope cherished by those around Vlasov. If the British and Americans support communists against Hitler, they simply must help a democratic non-communist Russia in the same struggle. At the downfall of the Third Reich, when it will become quite clear that the Soviet Union is increasing the pressure to extend its regime to all Europe and to the whole world, how could the West continue to support the Bolshevik dictatorship? But there was a gap between the Russian and the Western conscience which exists to this day. The West was fighting only against Hitler, and for this purpose all means and all allies were good, the Soviets above all. Not only could the West not concede that the Soviet people might have their own purposes which did not coincide with the goals of the communist government, it did not want to admit any such thought, because it would have been embarrassing and difficult to live with. It is a tragicomic fact that on the leaflets which the Western Allies were distributing among the anti-Bolshevik volunteer battalions on the Western Front, they wrote, We promise all defectors that they will be immediately sent back to the Soviet Union, to prison. We soon discover that there really were Russians fighting against us, and that they fought harder than any SS men. In July 1943, for example, near Orel, a platoon of Russians in German uniform defended Sobokaninsky Veselki. They fought with a desperation that might have been expected if they had built the place themselves. One of them was driven into a root cellar. They threw hand grenades in after him, and he fell silent. But they had no more than stuck their heads in than he let them have another volley from his automatic pistol. Only when they lobbed in an anti-tank grenade did they find out that, within the root cellar, he had another foxhole in which he had taken shelter from the infantry grenades. Just try to imagine the degree of shock, deafness, and hopelessness in which he had kept on fighting. In East Prussia, a trio of captured Vlasov men was being marched along the roadside a few steps away from me. At that moment, a T-34 tank thundered down the highway. Suddenly, one of the captives twisted around and dived underneath the tank. The tank veered, but the edge of its track crushed him nevertheless. The broken man lay writhing, bloody foam coming from his mouth, and one could certainly understand him. He preferred a soldier's death to being hanged in a dungeon. They had no choice. There was no other way for them to fight. They had no chance to find a way out, to safeguard their lives, by some more cautious mode of fighting. If pure surrender was considered unforgivable treason to the motherland, then what about those who had taken up enemy arms? Our propaganda, in all its crudity, explained their conduct as, one, treason. Was it biologically based, carried in the bloodstream? Or two, cowardice which it certainly was not. A coward tries to find a spot where things are easy, soft, safe, and men could be induced to enter the Wehrmacht Vasov detachments only in the last extremity, only at the limit of desperation, only out of inexhaustible hatred of the Soviet regime, only with total contempt for their own safety, for they knew they would never have the faintest glimpse of mercy. When we captured them, we shot them as soon as their first intelligible Russian word came from their mouths. In Russian captivity, as in German captivity, the worst lot of all was reserved for the Russians. In general, this war revealed to us the worst thing in the world was to be a Russian. The Vlasov men had a presentiment of all of this. They knew it ahead of time. Nevertheless, on the left sleeve of their German uniforms, they sewed the shield with the white-blue-red edging, the field of St. Andrew, and the letters R.O.A. However, by February 1945, the first division of the Russian Liberation Army had been formed, and the formation of the second division had begun. It was too late to even hypothesize that these divisions would ever fight together with the Germans. The old secret hope of the Vlasov leadership that a conflict would arise between the Soviets and the Allies was now gaining strength. 
This hope was reflected in a report by the German Ministry of Propaganda in February 1945. The Vlasov movement does not consider itself bound for life and for death to Germany. There are within it strong pro-English feelings, and they are thinking about a change of course. It is not a national socialist movement. They simply do not recognize the existence of the Jewish problem. The breakdown of Germany, which by that time was total, made it possible for the commander of the division, Bunyachenko, to take it out of the front line by his own decision, despite the opposition of the German generals. The division started fighting its way to Czechoslovakia. On the way, it freed Soviet prisoners of war, who joined it so that Russians may all be together. The men reached the outskirts of Prague at the beginning of May. The Czechs had started an uprising on the capital on May 5th and asked them for help. On May 6, Bunyachenko's division entered Prague and, in a violent battle on May 7th, saved both the uprising and the city. As if ironically, as if to confirm the far-sightedness of the most short-sighted Germans, the first and last independent action of the first glass of division was a blow dealt the Germans. It must have been a relief for all those Russian hearts which during the past three senseless and cruel years had accumulated so much bitterness and anger against them. In those days, the Czechs welcomed the Russians with flowers. They understood. But who knows whether all of them remembered later which Russians had saved their city. The official Soviet version is that Prague was liberated by the Soviet army. It is true that, in accordance with Stalin's wishes, Churchill was in no hurry in those days to arm the inhabitants of Prague. And as to the U.S. Army, it slowed down its advance in order to allow Soviets to enter the city first. Joseph Smirkovsky, who at that time was a leading Czech communist, did not foresee the distant future and insulted the traitors of the Vlasov units. The only freedom which he wanted had to come from the Soviets. Vlasov consistently refused to escape alone. A plane was ready to take him to Spain. In what must have been a paralysis of will, he gave up and accepted the end. During these last weeks, his activity was limited to dispatching secret delegations in an effort to establish a contact with the British and Americans. The only sense the Vlasovites could see in all these events, so as to justify somehow their long dangling in the German noose, was in getting a chance to be useful to the Allies now that everything was finished. The hope kept glimmering, or rather burning high, that at this time, after the end of the war, the powerful English and American allies would ask Stalin to change his domestic policy. The armies coming from the west and from the east were getting closer and closer. They might well clash over Hitler's crushed remains. And that would be the time when the west could gain by saving and using the anti-Bolshevik Russians. The west simply had to understand that Bolshevism is an enemy for all mankind. But the West did not understand at all. The democratic West simply could not understand. What do you mean when you call yourselves a political opposition? An opposition exists inside your country? Why has it never publicly declared its existence? If you are dissatisfied with Stalin, go back home and, in the first subsequent... If you are dissatisfied with Stalin, go back home. In the first subsequent election, do not re-elect him. That would be the honest course. But why did you have to take up arms, and, what is worse, German arms? No, we have to extradite you. It would be terribly bad form to act otherwise, and we might spoil our relations with a gallant ally. In World War II, the West kept defending its own freedom, and defended it for itself. As for us, and as for Eastern Europe, it buried us in an even more absolute and hopeless slavery. Vlasov's last effort was his statement that the leadership of the ROA was ready to appear before an international court and that turning the army over to the Soviets for extermination contravened international law, since it would involve extraditing an opposition movement. Most of the American military commanders were amazed to learn about the existence of Russians who were not Soviets. They thought it quite natural to hand them all over to Soviet state. The ROA not only surrendered to the Americans, it implored them to accept its capitulation and begged for one thing only, the promise that the Americans would not extradite them to the Soviets. 
mid-level American officers who did not know anything about big politics sometimes naively gave such promises, but all of them were broken. The ROA soldiers were deceived. The 1st Division, on May 11th near Pilsen, found itself facing an armed wall of American military men. It was almost the same with the 2nd Division. The Americans refused to consider them prisoners of war and refused to let them go into their zone. In Yalta, Churchill and Roosevelt had signed the agreement to repatriate all Soviet citizens, and especially the military, without specifying whether the repatriation was to be voluntary or enforced. How could any people on earth not be willing to return to their homes? The nearsightedness of the West was condensed into what was written at Yalta. At the same time, in May 1945, Great Britain also acted as a loyal ally to the Soviets. The usual modesty of the Soviet leadership prevented this action from being publicized. The English turned over to the Soviet Army Command a Cossack Corps of 40 to 45,000 men, which had fought its way to Austria from Yugoslavia. The extradition was carried out with a perfidy of which is characteristic of British diplomatic tradition. The gist of the matter is that the Cossacks meant to fight to the death or emigrate overseas, maybe to Paraguay, maybe to Indochina, anywhere, as long as they would not have to surrender to the Soviets alive. The British provided the Cossacks with military food rations of extra quality, dressed them in fine British uniforms, promised them that they could serve in the British Army, and even held military reviews. Therefore, the Cossacks did not grow suspicious when they were asked to turn in their weapons, on the grounds that this was necessary in order to standardize their equipment. On May 28th, all officers, from squadron commanders upward, were summoned separately from their soldiers to the town of Judenburg, on the pretext that they would confer with Field Marshal Alexander about the future fate of the army. En route, the officers were surreptitiously placed under a strong escort, the British beat them until they bled, and the whole motorcade was gradually surrounded by Soviet tanks. When they arrived in Judenburg, police vans were waiting, as were armed guards holding lists of names. They could not even shoot or stab themselves to death, since all their weapons had been taken away. Some jumped off the high viaduct into the river onto the stones. Among the generals, thus turned over to the Soviets, the majority were emigres, who had fought as allies of the British during World War I. During the Civil War, the British had not had enough time to show their gratitude. Now they were paying their debt. In the following days, the British extradited the enlisted men as treacherously in trains which were covered in barbed wire. In the meantime, a Cossack transport had arrived from Italy, carrying 35,000 people. They stopped in the Drava Valley near Lines. There were Cossack soldiers among them, but also many old people, children, and women. None of them wanted to go back to their beloved Cossack rivers. The hearts of the British were not troubled, nor were their democratic minds. The British commanding officer, Major Davies, whose name will certainly survive from now on in Russian history at least, could be exuberantly friendly or merciless as needed. After the surreptitious extradition of the officers, he openly announced on June 1st, that there would be a compulsory extradition. Thousands of voices yelled, We will not go! Black flags appeared over the refugees' camp, where church services were being celebrated non-stop, people arranging their own funeral services while they were still alive. British tanks and soldiers arrived. The order was given through loudspeakers for everybody to get into the trucks. The crowd was singing hymns from the requiem service, the priests lifted their crosses high above their heads. The young people formed a chain around the elderly, the women, and the children. Then British soldiers started beating them with rifle butts and clubs, grabbing them and throwing them onto the trucks, including the wounded, as if they were packages. As the crowd retreated, first the platform on which the priests were standing broke down under their weight. Then the camp fence collapsed. The crowd rushed to the bridge over the Drava. British tanks rolled on to stop them, but entire families sought death by throwing themselves into the river. Meanwhile, the British units in the neighborhood pursued and shot at the fugitives. The cemetery where the people who were shot or trampled to death were buried still exists in lines. 
In those same days, just as treacherously and mercilessly, the British extradited to the Yugoslav communists thousands of their regime's enemies who had been Great Britain's allies in 1941. They, too, were to be shot and exterminated without trial. But even that was only the beginning. During all of 1946 and 1947, the Western Allies, faithful to Stalin, continued to turn over him Soviet citizens, former soldiers as well as civilians. It did not really matter who they were as long as the West could get rid of this human confusion as quickly as possible. People were extradited from Austria, Germany, Italy, France, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden from the American occupation zones, and from the territory of the United States as well. I myself fell under Vlas of fire for a few days before my arrest. There were Russians in the East Prussian sack, which we had surrounded, and one night at the end of January their unit tried to break through our position to the west, without artillery preparation, in silence. There was no firmly delineated front in any case, and they penetrated us in depth, catching my sound locator battery, which was out in front, in a pincers. I barely managed to pull it back by the last remaining road. But then I went back for a piece of damaged equipment, and, before dawn, I watched as they suddenly rose from the snow where they dug in, wearing their winter camouflage cloaks, hurled themselves with a cheer on the battery of a 152mm gun battalion at Adlig Schwenketen and knocked out twelve heavy cannon with grenades before they could fire a shot. Pursued by their tracer bullets, our last little group ran almost two miles in fresh snow to the bridge across the Passage River, and there they were stopped. Soon after that I was arrested, and now, on the eve of the victory parade, here we all were sitting together on the board bunks of the Butyrki. I took puffs from their cigarettes, and they took puffs from mine and paired with one or another of them, I used to carry out the six-bucket tin latrine barrel. Now, a quarter of a century later, when most of the Vlas of men have perished in camps, and those who have survived are living out their lives in far north, I would like to issue a reminder, through these pages, that this was a phenomenon totally unheard of in all world history, that several hundred thousand young men, aged twenty to thirty, took up arms against their fatherland as allies of its most evil enemy. Perhaps there is something to ponder here. Who was more to blame, those youths or the gray fatherland? One cannot explain this treason biologically. It has to have a social cause. Because, as the old proverb says, well-fed horses don't rampage. Then picture yourself in a field in which starved, neglected, crazed horses are rampaging back and forth. That same spring, many Russian emigres were also in those cells. It was very like a dream, the resurrection of buried history, the weighty tomes on which the Civil War had long since been completed and their covers shut tight. The causes for which people fought in it had been decided. The chronology of its events had been set down in textbooks. The leaders of the white movement were, it appeared, no longer our contemporaries on earth, but mere ghosts of a past that had melted away. The Russian emigres had been more cruelly dispersed than the tribes of Israel. And, in our Soviet imagination, if they were still dragging out their lives somewhere, it was as pianists in stinking little restaurants, as lackeys, laundresses, beggars, morphine and cocaine addicts, and virtual corpses. Right up to 1941, when the war came, it would have been impossible to find out from any hints in our newspapers, our lofty literature, our criticism of the arts, nor did our well-fed masters of art and literature help us find out, that Russia abroad was a great spiritual world, that in it Russian philosophy was living and developing, that there were philosophers like Bulkakov, Berdayev, and Lasky that Russian art had enchanted the world, that Rachmaninoff, Jelyapin, Benoit, Diaghilev, Pavlova, and the Don Cossack Chorus of Jeroff were out there, that profound studies of Dostoevsky were being undertaken, at a time when he was the anathema of the Soviet Union, that the incredible writer Nabokov Sirin also existed out there, 
that Bunin himself was still alive and had been writing all these twenty years, that journals of the arts were being published, that theatrical works were being produced, that Russians from the same areas of Russia came together in groups where their mother tongue could be heard, and that emigre men had not given up marrying emigre women, who in turn presented them with children, which meant young people our own age. The picture of emigration presented in our country was so falsified that if one had conducted a mass survey to ask which side the Russian emigres were on in the Spanish Civil War, or else perhaps what side they were on in the Second World War, with one voice everyone would have replied, For Franco! For Hitler! Even now people in our country do not know that many white emigres fought on the Republican side in Spain. The emigres did not support Hitler. They ostracized Marikovsky and Gypius, who took Hitler's part, leaving them to alienated loneliness. There was a joke, except it wasn't a joke, to the effect that Denikin wanted to fight for the Soviet Union against Hitler, and that at one time Stalin planned to arrange his return to the motherland, not for military reasons, obviously, but as a symbol of national unity. During the German occupation of France, a horde of Russian emigres, young and old, joined the resistance, and after the liberation of Paris they swarmed to the Soviet embassy to apply for permission to return to the motherland. No matter what kind of Russia it was, it was still Russia. That was their slogan, and that is how they proved they had not been lying previously about their love for her. Imprisoned in 1945 and 1946, they were almost happy that these prison bars and these jailers were their own Russian and they observed with surprise the Soviet boys scratching their heads, saying, Why the hell did we come back? Wasn't there enough room for us in Europe? But, given that Stalinist logic which said that every Soviet person who had lived abroad had to be imprisoned in camp, how could the emigres possibly escape the same lot? In the Balkans, Central Europe, Harbin, they were arrested as soon as the Soviet armies arrived. They were arrested in their apartments and on the street, just like Soviet citizens. For a while state security arrested only men, and not all of them, only those who in one way or another revealed a political bias. Later on their families were transported to exile in Russia, but some were left where they were in Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia. In France they were welcomed into Soviet citizenship with honors and flowers, and sent back to the motherland in comfort and only when they got to the USSR were they raked in. Things dragged out no longer for the Shanghai emigres. In 1945, Russian hands didn't reach that far, but a plenipotentiary from the Soviet government went to Shanghai and announced a decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet extending forgiveness to all emigres. Well, now, how could one refuse to believe that? The government certainly couldn't lie. Whether or not there was actually such a decree, it did not, in any case, tie the hands of the organs. The Shanghai Russians expressed their delight. They were told they could take with them as many possessions as they wanted, and whatever they wanted. They went home with automobiles. The country could put them to good use. They were told they could settle wherever they wanted to in the Soviet Union and, of course, work at any profession or trade. They were transported from Shanghai in steamships. The fate of the passengers varied. On some of the ships, for some reason, they were given no food at all. They also suffered various fates after reaching the port of Nakotka, which was, incidentally, one of the main transit centers of Gulag. Almost all of them were loaded into freight cars, like prisoners, except that they had, as yet, no strict convoy, and there were no police dogs. Some of them were actually delivered to inhabited places, to cities, and allowed to live there for two or three years. Others were delivered in train loads straight to their camps and were dumped out somewhere off a high embankment into the forest beyond the Volga, together with their white pianos and their jardinaires. In 1948 to 1949, the former Far Eastern emigres who had until then managed to stay out of the camps were scraped up to the last man. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 In the Engine Room There was a box at the so-called Butyrki station. 
the famous frisking box where new arrivals were searched. It had space enough for five or six jailers to process up to twenty zecks in one batch. Now, however, it was empty and the rough-hewn search tables had nothing on them. Over at one side of the room, seated behind the small nondescript table beneath a small lamp, was a neat black-haired NKVD major. Patient boredom was what his face chiefly revealed. The intervals during which the Zecks were brought in and let out one by one were a waste of his time. Their signatures could have been collected much, much faster. He indicated that I was to sit down on the stool opposite him, on the other side of his table. He asked my name. To the right and left of the inkwell lay two piles of white papers the size of a half-sheet of typewriter paper, all looking much the same. In format, they were just like the fuel requisitions handed out in apartment house management offices, or warrants in official institutions for purchase of office supplies. Leafing through the pile on the right, the Major found the paper which referred to me. He pulled it out and read it aloud to me in a bored patter. I understood I had been sentenced to eight years. Immediately, he began to write a statement on the back of it, with a fountain pen, to the effect that the text had been read to me on that particular date. My heart didn't give an extra half-beat. It was also every day and routine. Could this really be my sentence, the turning point of my life? I would have liked to feel nervous, to experience this moment to the full, but I just couldn't. And the Major had already pushed the sheet over to me, the blank side facing up and a schoolchild's seven kopeck pen, with a bad point that had lint on it from the inkwell, lay there in front of me. No, I have to read it myself. Do you really think we would deceive you? The major objected lazily. Well, go ahead, read it. Unwillingly, he let the paper out of his hand. I turned it over and began to look through it with deliberate slowness, not just word by word, but letter by letter. It had been typed, but what I had in front of me was not the original, but a carbon. Extract from a decree of the OSO of the NKVD of USSR of July 7, 1945. All of this was underscored with a dotted line, and the sheet was vertically divided with a dotted line. Case heard, accusation of so-and-so, decreed, to designate for so-and-so, name for anti-Soviet propaganda and for an attempt to create an anti-Soviet organization, eight years in collective labor camps. Was I really just supposed to sign and leave in silence? I looked at the Major to see whether he intended to say something to me, whether he might provide some clarification. No, he had no such intention. He had already nodded to the jailer at the door to get the next prisoner ready. To give the moment at least a little importance, I asked him with a tragic expression, But really, this is terrible. Eight years? What for? And I could hear how false my own words sounded. Neither he nor I detected anything terrible. Right there. The Major showed me once again where to sign. I signed. I could simply not think of anything else to do. In that case, allow me to write an appeal right here, after all. The sentence is unjust. As provided by regulations, the Major assented with a nod, placing my sheet of paper on the left-hand pile. Let's move along, commanded the jailer. And I moved along. I had not really shown much initiative. Georgie Tenno, who, to be sure, had been handed a paper worth twenty-five years, answered, After all, this is a life sentence. In olden times, they used to beat the drums and assemble a crowd when a person was given a life sentence. And here it's like being on a list for a soap ration. Twenty-five years and run along. Arnold Rappaport took the pen and wrote on the back of the verdict, I protest categorically this terroristic illegal sentence and demand immediate release. The officer who handed it to him had at first waited patiently, but, but when he read what Rappaport had written, he was enraged and tore up the paper with a note on it. So what? The term remained in force anyway. This was just a copy. Vera Kornieva was expecting fifteen years, and she saw with delight there was a typo on the official sheet. It read only five. She laughed her luminous laugh and hurried to sign before they took it back. The officer looked at her dubiously. Do you understand what I read to you? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Five years in corrective labor camps. 
The ten-year sentence of Janos Rosas was read to him in the corridor in Russian without any translation. He signed it, not knowing it was his sentence, and he waited a long time afterward for his trial. Still later, when he was in camp, he recalled the incident very vaguely and realized what had happened. The OSO was nowhere mentioned in either the Constitution or the Code. However, it turned out to be the most convenient kind of hamburger machine, easy to operate, undemanding, and requiring no illegal lubrication. The code existed on its own, and the OSO existed on its own, and it kept on deftly grinding without all the code's 205 articles, neither invoking them nor even mentioning them. As they used to joke in camp, there is no court for nothing, for that there is an OSO. Of course, the OSO itself also needed, for convenience, some kind of operational shorthand, but for that purpose it worked out on its own a dozen letter articles which made operations very much simpler. It wasn't necessary, when they were used, to cudgel your brains trying to make things fit the formulations of the code, and they were few enough to be easily remembered by a child. Some of them we have already described. ASA anti-Soviet agitation, KRD, counter-revolutionary activity, KRTD, counter-revolutionary Trotskyite activity, and that T made the life of a Zek in camp much harder, PSH, suspicion of espionage, espionage that went beyond the bounds of suspicion was handed over to a tribunal, SVPSH, contacts leading to a suspicion of espionage, K.R.M., Counter-Revolutionary Thought, V.A.S., Dissemination of Anti-Soviet Sentiments, S.O.E., Socially Dangerous Element, S.V.E., Socially Harmful Element, P.D., Criminal Activity, a favorite accusation against former camp inmates if there was nothing else to be used against them. And then, finally, there was the very expansive category, C.H.S., member of a family of a person convicted under one of the foregoing letter categories. It has to be remembered that these categories were not applied uniformly and equally among different groups and in different years, but as with the Articles of the Code and the sections in Special Decrees, they broke out in sudden epidemics. There is one more qualification. The OSO did not claim to be handing down a sentence. It did not sentence a person, but, instead, imposed an administrative penalty. And that was the whole thing in a nutshell. Therefore it was, of course, natural for it to have juridical independence. But even though they did not claim that the administrative penalty was a court sentence, it could be up to twenty-five years and include deprivation of titles, ranks, and decorations, confiscation of all property, imprisonment, deprivation of the right to respond. Thus a person could disappear from the face of the earth with the help of the OSO even more reliably than under the terms of some primitive court sentence. The OSO enjoyed another important advantage in that its penalty could not be appealed. There was nowhere to appeal to. There was no appeals jurisdiction above it and no jurisdiction beneath it. It was subordinate only to the Minister of Internal Affairs, to Stalin, and to Satan. Another big advantage the OSO had was speed. This speed was limited only by the technology of typewriting. And last but not least, not only did the OSO not have to confront the accused face to face, which lessened the burden on interprison transport, it didn't even have to have his photograph. At a time when the prisons were badly overcrowded, this was a great additional advantage because the prisoner did not have to take up space on the prison floor or eat bread once his interrogation had been completed. He could be sent off to the camp immediately and put to honest work. The copy of the sentence could be read to him much later. All the articles of the code had become encrusted with interpretations, directions, instructions. And if the actions of the accused are not covered by the code, he can still be convicted. By analogy, what opportunities? Simply because of his origins. 
belonging to a socially dangerous milieu. For contacts with dangerous persons, here's scope for you. Who is dangerous and what contacts consist of only the judge can say. But one should not complain about the precise wording of our published laws either. On January 13th, 1950, a decree was issued re-establishing capital punishment. One is bound, of course, to consider that capital punishment never did depart from Beria's cellars. And the decree stated that the death sentence could not be imposed on subversives, diversionists. What did that mean? It didn't say. Iosif Viserionovic loved it that way. Not to say all of it, just to hint. Did it refer only to someone who blew up the rails with TNT? It didn't say. We had a... We had long since come to know what a diversionist was. Someone who produced goods of poor quality was a diversionist. But what was a subversive? Was someone subverting the authority of the government, for example, in a conversation on a streetcar? Or if a girl married a foreigner, wasn't she subverting the majesty of our motherland? But it was not the judge who judges. The judge only takes his pay. The directives did the judging. The directive of 1937, 10 years, 20 years, execution by shooting. The directive of 1943, 20 years at hard labor, hanging. The directive of 1945, 10 years for everyone, plus 5 of disenfranchisement, manpower for three five-year plans. The directive of 1949, everyone gets 25. The machine stamped out the sentences. The prisoner had already been deprived of all rights when they cut off his buttons on the threshold of state security, and he couldn't avoid a stretch. The members of the legal profession were so used to this that they fell on their faces in 1958 and caused a big scandal. The text of the projected new Fundamental Principles of Criminal Prosecution of the USSR was published in the newspapers, and they'd forgotten to include any reference to possible grounds for acquittal. The government newspaper issued a mild rebuke. The impression might be created that our courts only bring in convictions. But just take the jurist's side for a moment. Why, in fact, should a trial be supposed to have two possible outcomes when our general elections are conducted on the basis of one candidate? An acquittal is, in fact, unthinkable from the economic point of view. It would mean that the informers the state security officers, the interrogators, the prosecutor's staff, the internal guard in the prison, and the convoy had all worked to no purpose. Here is one straightforward and typical case that was brought before a military tribunal. In 1941, the security operations branch of our inactive army stationed in Mongolia was called on to show its activity and vigilance. The military medical assistant, Glazavsky, who was jealous of Lieutenant Pavel Cholpenev because of some woman, realized this. He addressed three questions to Cholpenev when they were alone. 1. Why, in your opinion, are we retreating from the Germans? Cholpenev's reply, they have more equipment and they were mobilized earlier. Lazavsky's counter, no, it's a maneuver. We're decoying them. 2. Do you believe the Allies will help? Chopenyev, I believe they'll help, but not from unselfish motives. Lazavsky's counter, They are deceiving us. They won't help at all. They won't help us at all. 3. Why was Voroshilov sent to command the Northwest Front? Chopenyev answered and forgot about them, and Lazavsky wrote the denunciation. Chopenyev was summoned before the political branch of the division and expelled from the Komsomol for a defeatist attitude, for praising German equipment, for belittling the strategy of our high command. The loudest voice raised against him belonged to the Komsomol organizer Kaligin, who had behaved like a coward at the battle of the Kalkin Gol in Chopenyev's presence, and therefore found it convenient to get rid of the witness once and for all. Chopenyev's arrest followed. He had one confrontation with Klazovsky. Their previous conversation was not even brought up, by the interrogator. One question was asked, Do you know this man? Yes. Witness, you may leave. 
The interrogator was afraid the charge might fall through. Depressed by his months' incarceration in the sort of hole in the ground we have already described, Chopenyev appeared before a military tribunal of the 36th Motorized Division. Present were Lebedev, the divisional political commissar, and Slesarev, the chief of the political branch. The witness Lazovsky was not even summoned to testify. However, after the trial, to document the false testimony, they got Lazovsky's signature and that of the political commissar Serigin. The questions the tribunal asked were, Did you have a conversation with Lazovsky? What did he ask you about? What were your answers? Naively, Chopenyev told them. He still couldn't understand what he was guilty of. After all, many people talk like that, he innocently exclaimed. The tribunal was interested. Who? Give us their names. But Chopenyev was not of their breed. He had the last word. I beg the court to give me an assignment that will mean my death so as to assure itself once more of my patriotism. And, like a simple-hearted warrior of old, me and the person who slandered me, both of us together. Oh no, our job is to kill off all those chivalrous sentiments in the people. Lazovsky's duty was to hand out pills and Serigin's duty was to indoctrinate the soldiers. Whether or not you died wasn't important. What was important was that we were on guard. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 The Law as a Child We forget everything. What we remember is not what actually happened, not history, but merely that hackneyed dotted line that they have chosen to drive into our memories by insistent hammering. I do not know whether this is a trait common to all mankind, but it is certainly a trait of our people, and it is a vexing one. It may have its source in goodness, but it is vexing nonetheless. It makes us an easy prey for liars. Therefore, if they demand that we forget even the public trials, we forget them. The proceedings were open and were reported in our newspapers, but they didn't draw a hole in our brains to make us remember, and so we've forgotten them. Only things repeated on the radio day after day drills a hole in the brain. I am not even talking about young people, since they, of course, know nothing of all this, but about people who were alive at the time of those trials. Ask any middle-aged person to enumerate the highly publicized open trials. He will remember those of Bukharin and Zainov, and, knitting his brow, that of the prom party too. And that's all. There were no other public trials. Yet in actual fact, they began right after the October Revolution. In 1918, quantities of them were taking place in many different tribunals. They were taking place before there were even laws or codes, when the judges had to be guided solely by the requirements of the revolutionary workers and peasants' power. At the same time, they were regarded as blazing their own trail of bold legality. Their detailed history will someday be written by someone, and it's not for us to even attempt to include it in our present investigation. An abridged excerpt. This chapter is concerned with the public trials conducted in the first few years following the success of the Bolshevik Revolution. It reviews five specific trials from 1918 to 1920. One can already observe the indiscriminate character of the accusations and the collaboration of prosecution and defense attorneys against the accused. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9. The Law Becomes a Man Abridged Excerpt This chapter describes the law while it is still in its Boy Scout stage in the early 1920s. Five trials are traced in detail, among them the 1922 Moscow and Leningrad trials against prominent church leaders leading to the execution of the defendants. The objective of these trials is to speed up the repression and the looting of the church. Lenin draws up the political section of the criminal code. Its scope is unlimited. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The Law Matures Abridged excerpt This chapter continues the theme of the two preceding chapters, with special attention to three trials of the late 1920s and early 1930s. At this stage, loyal engineers and even fellow communists come under attack. End of abridgment excerpt. And may my compassionate reader now have mercy on me. 
Until now, my pen sped on, untrembling, my heart didn't skip a beat, and we slipped along unconcerned, because for these fifteen years we have been firmly protected either by legal revolutionality or else by revolutionary legality. But from now on, things will be painful. As the reader will recollect, as we have explained to us a dozen times, beginning with Khrushchev, from approximately 1934, violations of Leninist norms of legality began. And how are we to enter this abyss of illegality now? How are we to drag our way along yet another bitter stretch of the road? However, these trials which follow were, because of the fame of the defendants, a sinusure for the whole world. They did not escape the attention of the public. They were written about. They were interpreted, and they will be interpreted again and again. It is for us merely to touch lightly on their riddle. Let us make one qualification, though not a big one. The published stenographic records did not coincide completely with what was said at the trials. One writer who received an entrance pass, they were given out only to selected individuals, took running notes and subsequently discovered these differences. All the correspondents also noted the snag with Krastinsky, which made a recess necessary in order to get him back on the track of his assigned testimony. Here is how I picture it. Before the trial, a chart was set up for emergencies. In the first column was the name of the defendant. In the second, the method to be used during the recess if he should depart from his text during the open trial. In the third column, the name of the Czechist responsible for applying this the name of the Czechist responsible for applying the indicated method. So if Krastinsky departed from his text, then who would come on the run and what that person would do had already been arranged. But the inaccuracies of the stenographic record do not change or lighten the picture. Dumbfounded, the world watched three plays in a row, three wide-ranging and expensive dramatic productions in which the powerful leaders of the fearless Communist Party who had turned the entire world upside down and terrified it, now marched forth like doleful, obedient goats and bleated out everything they had been ordered to, vomited over themselves, cringingly abased themselves and their convictions, and confessed to crimes they could not in any wise have committed. This was unprecedented in remembered history. It was particularly astonishing in contrast with the recent Leipzig trial of Dmitrov. Dmitriev had answered the Nazi judges like a roaring lion, and, immediately afterward, his comrades in Moscow, members of that same unyielding cohort which had made the whole world tremble, and the greatest of them at that, those who had been called the Leninist Guard, came before the judges drenched in their own urine. And even though much appears to have been clarified since then, with particular success by Arthur Kessler, the riddle continues to circulate as durably as ever. People have speculated about a Tibetan potion that deprives a man of his will, and about the use of hypnosis. Such explanations must by no means be rejected. If the NKVD possessed such methods, clearly there were no moral rules to prevent resorting to them. Why not weaken or muddle the will? And it is a known fact that in the twenties some leading hypnotists gave up their careers and entered the service of the GPU. It is also reliably known that in the 30s a school for hypnotists existed in the NKVD. Kamenev's wife was allowed to visit her husband before his trial and found him not himself. His reactions retarded, and she managed to communicate this to others before she herself was arrested. But why was neither Polchinsky nor Kreshenikov broken by the Tibetan potion or hypnosis? The fact is that an explanation on a higher psychological plane is called for. One misunderstanding in particular results from the image of these men as old revolutionaries who had not trembled in Tsarist dungeons, seasoned, tried and true, hardened, etc. fighters. But there is a plain and simple mistake here. These defendants were not those old revolutionaries. They had acquired that glory by inheritance, from and association with the Nerdniks, the Assars, and the Anarchists. They were the ones, the bomb-throwers and the conspirators, who had known hard labor imprisonment and real prison terms, but even they had never in their lives experienced a genuinely merciless interrogation, because such a thing did not exist at all in Tsarist Russia. And these others, 
The Bolshevik defendants at these treason trials had never known either interrogation or real prison terms. The Bolsheviks had never been sentenced to special dungeons, any Sakhalin, any special hard labor in Yakutsk. It is well known that Zerzinski had the hardest time of them all, and that he spent all his life in prisons. But according to our yardstick, he had served just a normal tenor, just a simple ten-ruble bill, like any ordinary collective farmer in our time. True, included in that tenor were three years in the hard labor central prison, but that is nothing special either. The party leaders who were the defendants in the trials of 1936 to 1938 had, in their revolutionary pasts, known short easy imprisonment, short periods in exile, and had never even had a whiff of hard labor. Bukharin had many petty arrests on his record, but they amounted to nothing. Apparently he was never imprisoned anywhere for a whole year at a time, and he had just a wee bit of exile on Oniga. Kamenev, despite long years of propaganda work and travel to all cities of Russia, spent only two years imprisoned and one and a half years in exile. In our time, even 16-year-old kids got five right off. Zinoviev, believe it or not, never spent as much as three months in prison. He never received even one sentence. In comparison with the ordinary natives of our archipelago, they were all callow youths. They didn't know what prison was like. Rykov and I. N. Smirnov had been arrested several times and had been imprisoned for five years, but somehow they went through prison very easily, and they either escaped from exile without any trouble at all, or were released because of an amnesty. Until they were arrested and imprisoned in the Libyanka, they hadn't the slightest idea what a real prison was, nor what the jaws of unjust interrogation were like. There is no basis for assuming that if Trotsky had fallen into those jaws, he would have conducted himself with any less self-abasement, or that his resistance would have proved stronger than theirs. He had no occasion to prove it. He, too, had known only easy imprisonment, no serious interrogations, and a mere two years of exile in Uskut. The terror Trotsky inspired as chairman of the Revolutionary Military Council was something he acquired very cheaply and does not at all demonstrate any true strength of character or courage. Those who have condemned many others to be shot often wilt at the prospect of their own death, the two kinds of toughness that are not connected. And, after all, our entire failure to understand derives from our belief in the unusual nature of these people. We do not, after all, where ordinary confessions signed by ordinary citizens are concerned, find their reasons for denouncing themselves and others so fulsomously baffling. We accept it as something we understand. A human being is weak, a human being gives in. But we consider Bukharin, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Piatakov, I. N. Smirnov to be supermen to begin with. And, in essence, our failure to understand is due to that fact alone. True, the directors of this dramatic production seem to have had a harder task in selecting the performers than they'd had in the earlier trials of the engineers. In those trials, they had forty barrels to pick from, so to speak, whereas here the available troop was small. Everyone knew who the chief performers were, and the audience wanted to see them in the roles and them only. Yet there was a choice. The most far-sighted and determined of those who were doomed did not allow themselves to be arrested. They committed suicide first. Skripnik, Tomsky, Gemernik. It was the ones who wanted to live who allowed themselves to be arrested. And one could certainly braid a rope from the ones who wanted to live. But even among them, some behaved differently during the interrogations. Realizing what was happening, turned stubborn, and died silently, but at least not shamefully. For some reason, they did not, after all, put on public trial Rudzitik, Postchev, Yenugkids, Chubar, Kosir, and, for that matter, Krylenko himself, even though their names would have embellished the trials. They put on trial the most compliant. A selection was made after all. The men selected were drawn from a lower order, but, on the other hand, the mustached producer knew each of them very well. He also knew that on the whole they were weaklings. And he knew, one by one, the particular weaknesses of each. Therein lay his dark and special talent, 
his main psychological bent and his life's achievement, to see people's weaknesses on the lowest plane of being. And the man who seems, in the perspective of time, to have embodied the highest and brightest intelligence of all the disgraced and executed leaders, and to whom Arthur Kessler apparently dedicated his talented inquiry, was N. I. Bukharin. Stalin saw through him, too, at that lowest stratum at which the human being unites with the earth, and Stalin held him in a long death grip, playing with him as a cat plays with a mouse, letting him go just a little, and then catching him again. Bukharin wrote every last word of our entire existing, in other words, non-existent, constitution, which is so beautiful to listen to. And he flew about up there, just below the clouds, and thought that he had outplayed Koba, that he had thrust a constitution on him that would compel him to relax the dictatorship, and at that very moment he himself had already been caught in those jaws. Bukharin, in his last days, began to compose his letter to the future Central Committee. Committed to memory and thereby preserved, it recently became known to the whole world. However, it did not shake the world to its foundations, for what were the last words this brilliant theoretician decided to hand down to future generations? Just one more cry of anguish and a plea to be restored to the party. He paid dearly in shame for that devotion and one more affirmation that he fully approved everything that had happened up to and including 1937. And that included not only all the previous jeeringly mocking trials, but also all the foul-smelling waves of our great prison sewage disposal system. There remained an easy dialogue with Vyshinsky along set lines. Is it true that every opposition to the party is a struggle against the party? In general, it is. Factually, it is. But a struggle against the party cannot help but grow into a war against the party. According to the logic of things, yes, it must. And that means that in the end, given the existence of oppositionist beliefs, any foul deeds, whatever might be perpetrated against the party, espionage, murder, sellout of the motherland, but wait a minute, none were actually committed. But they could have been? Well, theoretically speaking, those are your theoreticians for you. But for us, the highest of all interests are those of the party? Yes, of course. Of course. So you see, only a very fine distinction separates us. We are required to concretize the eventuality. In the interest of discrediting for the future any idea of opposition, we are required to accept as having taken place what could only theoretically have taken place. After all, it could have, couldn't it? It could have. And so it is necessary to recognize as actual what was possible, that's all. It's a small philosophical transition. Are we in agreement? Yes, and one thing more, and it's not for me to explain to you, but if you retreat and say something different during the trial, you understand that will only play into the hands of the world bourgeoisie and will only do the party harm. Well, and it's clear that in that case you yourself will not die an easy death. But if everything goes off all right, we will, in the course, allow you to go on living. We'll send you in secret to the island of Monte Cristo, and you can work on the economics of socialism there. But in previous trials, as I understand it, did you shoot them all? But what comparison is there between you and them? And then, we also left many of them alive, too. They were only shot in the newspapers. And so perhaps there isn't any insoluble riddle in those trials. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 The Supreme Measure Capital punishment has had an up-and-down history in Russia. In the code of the Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich Romanov, there were fifty crimes for which capital punishment could be imposed. By the time of the military statutes of Peter the Great, there were two hundred. Yet the Empress Elizabeth, while she did not repeal those laws authorizing capital punishment, never once resorted to it. They say that when she ascended the throne she swore an oath never to execute anyone, and for all twenty years of her reign she kept that oath. She fought the Seven Years' War, yet she still got along without capital punishment. It was an astounding record in the mid-eighteenth century. 
fifty years before the guillotine of the Jacobins. True, we have taught ourselves to ridicule all our past. We never acknowledge a good deed or a good intention in our history, and one can very easily blacken Elizabeth's reputation, too. She replaced capital punishment with flogging with the knout, tearing out nostrils, branding with the word thief, and eternal exile in Siberia. But let us also say something on behalf of the Empress. How could she have changed things more radically than she did in contravention of the social concepts of her time? And perhaps the prisoner condemned to death today would voluntarily consent to that whole complex of punishments if only the sun would continue to shine on him. But we, in our humanitarianism, don't offer him that chance. And perhaps the reader will come to feel, in the course of this book, that twenty or even ten years in our camps are harder to bear than were the punishments of Elizabeth. In today's terms, Elizabeth had a universally human point of view on all this, while the Empress Catherine the Great had, on the contrary, a class point of view, which was consequently more correct. Not to execute anyone at all seemed to her appalling and indefensible. She found capital punishment entirely appropriate to defending herself, her throne, and her system. In other words, in political cases, such as those of Mirovic, the Moscow Plague Mutiny, and Pugachev, but for habitual criminals, for non-political offenders, why not consider capital punishment abolished? Under Paul, the abolition of capital punishment was confirmed. Despite his many wars, there were no military tribunals attached to a military unit. Despite his many wars, there were no military tribunals attached to military units. And during the whole long reign of Alexander I, capital punishment was introduced only for war crimes that took place during a campaign, 1812. Right at this point, some people will say to us, what about the deaths running from the gantlet? Yes, indeed, there were, of course, hidden executions, for that matter. One can literally drive a person to death with a trade union meeting. But the gealing up of one's God-given life because others, sitting in judgment, have so voted simply, did not take place in our country even for crimes of state for an entire half-century, from Pugachev to the Decembrists. The blood of the five Decembrists whetted the appetite of our state. From then on, execution for crimes of the state was no longer prohibited, nor was it forgotten, right up to the February Revolution in 1917. It was confirmed by the statutes of 1845 and 1904, and further reinforced by the criminal statutes of the Army and Navy. And how many people were executed in Russia during that period? We have already, in Chapter 8 above, cited the figures given by liberal leaders of 1905 to 1907. Let us add to them the verified figures of N. S. Tagensev, the expert on Russian criminal law. Up until 1905, the death penalty was an exceptional measure in Russia. For a period of 30 years, from 1876 to 1904, the period of the Narodnaya Vol revolutionaries and the use of terrorism, a terrorism which did not consist merely of intentions murmured in the kitchen of a communal apartment, a period of mass strikes and peasant revolts, the period when the parties of the future revolution were created and grew in strength, 486 people were executed. In other words, about 17 people per year for the whole country. This figure includes executions of ordinary non-political criminals. During the years of the First Revolution, 1905, and its suppression, the number of executions rocketed upward, astounding Russian imaginations, calling forth tears from Tolstoy and indignation from Korolenko, and many, many others. From 1905 through 1908, about 2,200 persons were executed, 45 a month. This, as Tangetsev said, was an epidemic of executions. It came to an abrupt end. When the provisional government came to power, it abolished capital punishment entirely. In July 1917, however, it was reinstated in the active army and frontline areas for military crimes, murder, rape, assault, and pillage. Very widespread in those areas at that time. 
This was one of the most unpopular of the measures which destroyed the provisional government. The Bolshevik slogan before the Bolshevik coup d'etat was, Down with capital punishment, reinstated by Kerensky. If we are to judge by official documents, capital punishment was restored in all its force in June 1918. No, it was not restored. Instead, a new era of executions was inaugurated. If one takes the view that Latsis is not deliberately understating the real figures, but simply lacks complete information, and that the Rev Tribunals carried on approximately the same amount of judicial work as the Cheka performed in an extrajudicial way, one concludes that the twenty central provinces of Russia, in a period of sixteen months, June 1918 to October 1919, more than 16,000 persons were shot, which is to say, more than 1,000 a month. However, it may not even have been these individual executions, with or without formally pronounced death sentences, which added up to thousands and inaugurated the new era of executions in 1918 that stunned and froze Russia. Still, more terrible to us was the practice initially followed by warring sides and, later, by the victors of only, of sinking barges loaded with uncounted, unregistered hundreds, unidentifiable even by a roll call. Naval officers in the Gulf of Finland, in the White, Caspian, and Black Seas, and, as late as 1920, hostages in Lake Baikal. This is outside the scope of our narrow history of courts and trials, but it belongs to the history of morals which is where everything else originates as well. In all our centuries, from the first Ryuric on, had there ever been a period of such cruelties and so much killing as during the post-October Civil War? At one time, 265 condemned prisoners were awaiting execution in Leningrad's Kresty prison alone, and during that whole year it would certainly seem that more than a thousand were shot in Kresty alone. And what kind of evil doers were these condemned men? Where did so many plotters and troublemakers come from? Among them, for example, were six collective farmers from nearby Tsarskoy Selo who were guilty of the following crime. After they had finished mowing down the collective farm with their own hands, they had gone back and mowed a second time along the hummocks to get a little hay for their own cows. The All-Russian Central Executive Committee refused to pardon all six of these peasants, and the sentence of execution was carried out. What cruel and evil Salchika, what utterly repulsive and infamous serf owner would have killed six peasants for their miserable little clippings of hay? If one had dared to beat them with birch switches even once, we would know about it and read about it in school and curse that name. But now, heave the corpses into the water, and pretty soon the surface is all smooth again and no one's the wiser and one must cherish the hope that some day documents will confirm the report of my witness, who is still alive. Even if Stalin had killed no others, I believe he deserved to be drawn and quartered just for the lives of those six Tsarskoy Selo peasants. And yet they still dare shriek at us, from Peking, from Tirana, from Vilisi, yes, and plenty of big bellies in the Moscow suburbs are doing it too. How could you dare expose him? How could you dare disturb his great shade? Stalin belongs to the world communist movement. But in my opinion, all he belongs to is the criminal code. The peoples of all the world remember him as a friend, but not those on the backs he rode, whom he slashed with his knout. However, let us return to being dispassionate and impartial once more. Of course, the All-Russian Central Executive Committee would certainly have completely abolished the supreme measure, as promised. But unfortunately, what happened was that in 1936, the father and teacher completely abolished the All-Russian Central Executive Committee itself, and the Supreme Soviet that succeeded it had an 18th century ring. The supreme measure became a punishment once again, and ceased to be some kind of incomprehensible social defense. As for the executions of 1937 to 1938, what legal expert, what criminal historian will provide us with verified statistics? Where is that special archive we might be able to penetrate in order to read the figures? There is none. There is none, and there never will be any. 
Therefore, we dare report only those figures mentioned in rumors that were quite fresh in 1939 to 1940, when they were drifting around under the Butyrki arches, having emanated from the high and middle-ranking Yezov men of the NKVD who had been arrested and had passed through those cells not long before. And they really knew. The Yezov men said that during those two years of 1937 to 1938, a half million political prisoners had been shot throughout the Soviet Union, and 480,000 Blatney, habitual thieves, in addition. According to the testimony from Krasnodar, in 1937 to 1938, in the main building of the GPU on the Proletarskaya Street, they shot more than 200 people every night. In May 1947, Iosif Vissarionovic inspected his new starched dicky in his mirror, liked it, and dictated to the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet the decree on the abolition of capital punishment in peacetime. Replacing it with a new maximum term of 25 years, it was a good pretext for introducing the so-called quarter. But our people are ungrateful, criminal, and incapable of appreciating generosity. Therefore, after the rulers had creaked along and eked out two and a half years without the death penalty, on January 12, 1950, a new decree was published that constituted an about-face. In view of petitions pouring in from the National Republics, the Ukraine, from the trade unions, oh, those lovely trade unions, they always know what's needed, from peasant organizations, this was dictated by a sleepwalker, the gracious sovereign had stomped to death all peasant organizations way back in the year of the great turning point, and also from cultural leaders, now that is quite likely, capital punishment was restored for a conglomeration of traitors to the motherland, spies, and subversive diversionists, and of course they forgot to repeal the quarter, the twenty-five-year sentence which remained in force. And once this return to our familiar friend, to our beheading blade, had begun, things went further with no effort at all. In 1954, for premeditated murder, in May 1961, for theft of state property and counterfeiting, and terrorism in places of imprisonment, this was directed especially at prisoners who killed informers and terrorized the camp administration. In July 1961, for violating the rules governing foreign currency transactions, in February 1962, for threatening the lives of, shaking a fist at, policemen or communist vigilantes, then for rape, and immediately thereafter for bribery. But all of this is simply temporary, until complete abolition, and that's how it's described today, too. And so it turns out that Russia managed longest of all without capital punishment in the reign of the Empress Elizabeth Petrovna. Thus, many were shot, thousands at first, then hundreds of thousands. We divide, we multiply, we sigh, we curse. But still, and all, these are just numbers. They overwhelm the mind and then are easily forgotten. And if some day the relatives of those who have been shot were to send one publisher photographs of their executed kin, and an album of those photographs were to be published in several volumes, then just by leafing through them and looking into the extinguished eyes, we would learn much that would be valuable for the rest of our lives. Such reading, almost without words, would leave a deep mark on our hearts for all eternity. In one household I am familiar with, where some former Zechs live, the following ceremony takes place. On March 5th, the day of the death of the head murderer, they spread out on the table all the photographs of those who were shot and those who died in camps that they have been able to collect, several dozen of them, and throughout the day solemnity reigns in the apartment, somewhat like that of a church, somewhat like that of a museum. There is funeral music. Friends come to visit, to look at the photographs, to keep silent, to listen, to talk softly together, and then they leave without saying goodbye. And that is how it ought to be everywhere. At least these deaths would have left a small scar on our hearts, so that they should not have died in vain. And I, too, have such a few chance photographs. Look at these, at least. In the book there are five photographs of shot people. Viktor Petrovich Porovsky, shot in Moscow in 1918, 
Alexander Strollbinder, a student shot in Petrograd in 1918, Vasily Ivanovic Anachov, shot in the Lubyanka in 1927, Alexander Andreevich Svezhin, a professor of general staff, shot in 1935, Mikhail Alexandrovich Reformatsky, an agronomist, shot in Oral in 1938, Yevgeny Vina Anikova, shot in a camp on the Yenisei in 1942. They say that Konstantin Rokozovsky, the future marshal, was twice taken into the forest at night for a supposed execution. The firing squad leveled its rifles at him, and then they dropped them, and he was taken back to prison. And this was also making use of the supreme measure as an interrogator's trick. But it was all right, nothing happened, and he is alive and healthy and doesn't even cherish a grudge about it. And almost always, a person obediently allows himself to be killed. Why is it that the death penalty has such a hypnotic effect? Those pardoned recall hardly anyone in their cell who offered any resistance. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12. Tirzak Tirzak means prison confinement. Tirzak is an official term. In December 1917, it had already become clear that it was altogether impossible to do without prisons, that some people simply couldn't be left anywhere except behind bars, see chapter 2 above, because, well, simply because there was no place for them in the new society. The attention of the new prison authorities was directed toward the combat readiness of the prison guards outside the walls and the takeover of the stock of prisons inherited from the Tsar. Fortunately, it had turned out that the Civil War had not resulted in the destruction of all the principal central prisons and jails. So we recall the Solovetsky Islands, nicknamed Solovki. It was such a good place, cut off from communication with the outside world for half a year at a time. You couldn't be heard from there no matter how loud you shouted, and you could even burn yourself up for all anyone would know. From our experience of the past and our literature of the past, we have derived a naive faith in the power of a hunger strike. But the hunger strike is a purely moral weapon. It presupposes that the jailer has not entirely lost his conscience, or that the jailer is afraid of public opinion. Only in such circumstances can it be effective. The Tsarist jailers were still inexperienced. They got nervous if one of their prisoners went on a hunger strike. They exclaimed over it. They looked after him. They put him in the hospital. There are many examples, but this work is not about them. It is even humorous to note that it was enough for Valentinov to go on a hunger strike for twelve days. As a result, he not only achieved some relaxation in the regiment, but was totally released from interrogation. Whereupon he went to Lenin in Switzerland. Even in the Oral Central Hard Labor Prison, the strikers always won. They got the regimen relaxed in 1912 and further relaxed in 1913, to the point of general access to outdoor walks for all political hard labor prisoners, who were obviously so unrestricted by their supervisors that they managed to compose and send out to freedom their appeal to the Russian people, and this from the hard labor prisoners of a central prison. Furthermore, it was published. It's enough to make one's eyes pop out of one's head. Someone has to have been crazy. In the revolution of 1905 and the years following it, the prisoners felt themselves to be masters of the prison to such an extent that they did not even go to the trouble of declaring a hunger strike. They simply destroyed prison property, so-called obstructions, or went so far as to declare a strike, although it might seem that for prisoners this would have hardly any meaning. In the twenties, the lively picture of hunger strikes grows clouded, though that depends, of course, on the point of view. Still, it was possible in those years to achieve at least one's personal demands by this means. From the 30s on, state thinking about hunger strikes took a new turn. What did the state want with even such watered-down, isolated, half-suppressed hunger strikes? Wasn't the ideal picture one of prisoners who had no will of their own, nor the capacity to make their own decisions, and of a prison administration that did their thinking and their deciding for them? These are, if you will, the only prisoners who can exist in the new society. And so, from the beginning of the thirties, they stopped accepting declarations of hunger strikes as legal. 
The hunger strike as a method of resistance no longer exists, they proclaimed to the Yekaterina Olitskaya in 1932, and they said the same thing to many others. The government has abolished your hunger strikes, and that's that. But the Olitskaya refused to obey and began to fast. They let her go on fasting in solitary for fifteen days. Then they took her to the hospital and put milk and dried crusts in front of her to tempt her. But she stood firm, and on the nineteenth day she won her victory. She got an extended outdoor period and newspapers and parcels from the political Red Cross. That's how one had to moan and groan in order to receive those legitimate relief parcels. Overall, however, it was an insignificant victory and paid for too dearly. Alitskaya recalls such foolish hunger strikes on the part of others too. People starved up to twenty days in order to get delivery of a parcel or a change of companions for their outdoor walk. Was it worth it? After all, in the new type prison, one's strength, once lost, could not be restored. The religious sect member Koloskov fasted until he died on the twenty-fifth day. Could one in general permit oneself to fast in the new type prison? After all, the new prison heads, operating in secrecy and silence, had acquired several powerful methods of combating hunger strikes. 1. Patience on the part of the administration. We have seen enough of what this meant from preceding examples. 2. Deception. This, too, can be practiced thanks to total secrecy. When every step is reported by the newspapers, you aren't going to do much deceiving. But in our country, why not? In 1933, in the Khabarovsk prison, S.A. Chebateryev, demanding that his family be informed of his whereabouts, fasted for 17 days. He had come from the Chinese Eastern Railroad in Manchuria and then suddenly disappeared, and he was worried about what his wife might be thinking. On the 17th day, Zapadny, the deputy chief of the provincial GPU, and the Tabarovsk prison prosecutor, their ranks indicate that lengthy hunger strikes were really not so frequent, came to see him and showed him a telegraph receipt. There, they said, they had informed his wife, and thus persuaded him to take some broth. And the receipt was fake. 3. Forced Artificial Feeding This method was adapted without any question, this method was adapted without any question from experience with wild animals in captivity, and it could be employed only in total secrecy. By 1937, artificial feeding was, evidently, already in wide use. 4. A new view of the hunger strike. That hunger strikes are a continuation of counter-revolutionary activity in prison and must be punished with a new prison term. Approximately in the middle of 1937, a new directive came. From now on, the prison administration will not in any respect be responsible for those dying on hunger strikes. The last vestige of personal responsibility on the part of the jailers had disappeared. In these circumstances, the prosecutor of the province would not have come to visit Chebatoryev. Furthermore, so that the interrogator shouldn't get disturbed, it was also announced that days spent on hunger strike by a prisoner under interrogation should be crossed off the official interrogation period. In other words, it should not only be considered that the hunger strike had not taken place, but the prisoner should be regarded as not having been in prison at all during the period of the hunger strike. Thus, the interrogator would not be to blame for being behind schedule. Let the only perceptible result of the hunger strike be the prisoner's exhaustion. Decades passed and time produced its own results. The hunger strike, the first and most natural weapon of the prisoner, in the end became alien and incomprehensible to the prisoners themselves. Fewer and fewer desired to undertake them, and to prison administrations the whole thing began to seem either plain stupidity or else a malicious violation. Even though the enormous archipelago was already spreading across the land, the prisons for long-termers didn't fall into decay. The old jail tradition was being zealously carried on. Everything new and invaluable which the archipelago had contributed to the indoctrination of the masses was still not enough in itself. The deficiency was provided for by the complementary existence of the TONs, the special-purpose prisons and prisons for long-termers in general. 
Not everyone swallowed up by the great machine was allowed to mingle with the natives of the archipelago. Individuals who were too famous or who were being held secretly, purged gabesty, could by not any means be seen openly in camps. Their hauling a barrow did not compensate for the disclosure and the consequent moral-political damage. In the same way, the socialists, who were engaged in a continuous struggle for their prison rights, could not conceivably be permitted to mingle with the masses but had to be kept separately and, in fact, suffocated separately, in view of their special privileges and rights. Much later on in the fifties, as we shall learn later in this work, the special purpose prisons were also needed to isolate camp rebels, and in the last years of his life, disappointed in the possibilities of reforming thieves, Stalin gave orders that various ringleaders of thieves should also get the Tirzak rather than camp. And then, to be sure, it was necessary for the state to support free of charge in prison those prisoners who, because of their feebleness, would have immediately died off in camp, and would thus have shirked their duty to serve out their terms. The inventory of old jails, inherited from the Romanov dynasty, was, of necessity, looked after, remodeled, strengthened, and perfected. Certain central prisons, like the one in Yaroslavl, were so well and suitably appointed, doors plated with iron, table, stool, and cot permanently anchored in each cell, that the only thing required to bring them up to date was the installation of muzzles. On the windows and the fencing in of the courtyards were the prisoners walked in order to reduce them to the size of a cell. By 1937, all the trees on the prison grounds had been cut down, all vegetable gardens plowed under, and all grassy areas paved with asphalt. Others, like the one in Sazdal, required new equipment, and the monastery arrangement had to be remodeled, but, after all, Self-incarceration of a body in a monastery and its incarceration in a prison by the state serve physically similar purposes, and therefore the buildings were always easy to adapt. One of the buildings of the Sukhanovka Monastery was adapted for use as a prison for long-termers. During the twenties, the prisoners' food was very decent in the isolators for politicals. The lunches always included some meat. Fresh vegetables were served. Milk could be bought in the commissary. In 1931 to 1933, the food deteriorated sharply, but things were no better out in freedom at that time. Both scurvy and dizziness from lack of food were no rarity in the prisons for politicals in those years. Later on, the food improved, but it was never the same as before. The light in cells was always rationed, so to speak, in both the 30s and the 40s. The muzzles on the windows and the frosted reinforced glass created a permanent twilight in the cells. Darkness is an important factor in causing depression. They often stretched netting above the window muzzle, and in the winter it was covered with snow, which cut off this last access to the light. Reading became no more than a way of ruining one's eyes. In the Vladimir T.O.N., they made up for this lack of light at night. Bright electric lights burned all night long, preventing sleep. And in the Dmitrovsk prison in 1938, in a Kozirev, there was a light in the evenings and at night, a kerosene lamp on a little shelf way up near the ceiling, that burned away and smoked up the last air. In 1939 there were electric lights that glowed red at half voltage. Air was rationed too. The hinged panes for ventilation were kept locked, and opened only during the interval of the prisoner's trip to the toilet. In Vladimir in 1948 there was no lack of air, because the transom was open permanently. Walks outdoors ranged from 15 to 45 minutes at various hours in various prisons. There was no such thing as the communication with the soil that had existed in Schulzburg or Solovki. Everything that grew had been torn up by the roots, trampled, covered with concrete and asphalt, they even forbade lifting up one's head to the heavens during the walks. Look at your feet! This was the command both Kozirev and Edomova remember from the Kazan prison. Visits from relatives were forbidden in 1937 and never renewed. Letters could be sent to close relatives twice a month and could be received from them in most years. But in Kazan they had to be returned to the administration the day after they had been read. 
Access to the commissary to make purchases with the money sent in specifically limited amounts was usually permitted. Furniture was no unimportant part of the prison regimen. Adamova wrote eloquently of her happiness at finding a simple wooden cot with a straw mattress and a simple wooden chair in her cell in Sudsdal, after having only cots that folded into the wall and chairs anchored to the floor. In the Vladimir T.O.N., I. Korniev experienced two prison regimens. Under one, in 1947-1948, personal articles were not removed from the cell. One could lie down during the day, and the turnkey very seldom looked through the peephole. But under the other, in 1949-1953, the cell was locked with two locks, the responsibility of the turnkey and duty officer, respectively. One was forbidden to lie down, forbidden to talk in a normal voice, in Kazan only a whisper. Personal articles were all taken away, a uniform of striped mattress ticking was issued, correspondence was permitted only twice a year, and in those days announced without warning by the chief of the prison. Correspondence was permitted only twice a year, and only on those days announced without warning by the chief of the prison. Anyone who missed that day couldn't write and only a sheet of paper half the size of a postal sheet could be used. Violent searches and unscheduled visits were frequent, requiring the complete turning out of one's belongings and undressing down to one's skin. Communication between cells was prohibited to such an extent that the jailers went through the toilets with a portable lantern after each toilet visit and searched in each hole. The entire cell would get punishment cells for graffiti in the toilets. The punishment cells were a scourge in the special purpose prisons. One could get into a punishment cell for coughing. Cover your head with your blanket, then you can cough. Or for walking around the cell. Kozirev, it was considered to be rebellious. For the noise made by one's shoes. In the Kazan prison, women had been issued men's shoes that were much too large for women's feet, size ten and a half. Incidentally, Ginsburg was correct in concluding that periods in a punishment cell were meted out not for any particular misdemeanor, but according to a schedule. Every prisoner was required to spend some time in there in order to learn what it was like, and the rules included another generally applicable point. In the event of any display of unruliness in a punishment cell, the chief of the prison has the right to extend the term of incarceration there to twenty days. Just what was meant by the unruliness? Here's what happened to Kozirev. The descriptions of the punishment cell and much else in the prison regimen tally to such an extent among all sources that the stamp of a single system of administrative rules can be detected. He was given another five days in the punishment cell for pacing back and forth. In the autumn, the building containing the punishment cells was unheated, and it was very cold. They forced prisoners to undress down to their underwear and take off their shoes. The floor was bare earth and dust. It might be wet dirt, and in the Kazan prison it might even be covered with water. Kozirev had a stool in his. Ginsburg had none in hers. He immediately concluded that he would perish, that he would freeze to death. But some kind of mysterious inner warmth gradually made itself felt, and it was his salvation. He learned to sleep sitting on his stool. They gave him a mug of hot water three times a day. It made him drunk. One of the duty officers, in violation of the rules, pressed a piece of sugar into his ten-and-a-half-ounce bread ration. On the basis of the rations issued him, and by observing the light from some faraway tiny labyrinthian window, Kozirev kept count of the days. His five days had come to an end, but he had not been released. His sense of hearing had become extremely acute, and he heard whispers in the corridor, having to do with either the sixth or six days. This was a provocation. They were waiting for him to say that his five days were over and that it was time to let him out. That would have constituted unruliness, for which his stay in the punishment cell would have been prolonged. But he sat silent and obedient for another day, and then they let him out, just as if everything had been the way it was supposed to be. Perhaps the chief of the prison used this method for testing all the prisoners in turn for submissiveness, and then he could sentence all those who weren't yet submissive enough to further terms in the punishment cell. 
After the punishment cell, the ordinary cell seemed like a palace. Kozirev became deaf for half a year. He began to get abscesses in his throat. His cellmate went insane from the frequent imprisonment in the punishment cell, and Kozirev was kept locked up with an insane man for more than half a year, with just the two of them there. And only here, right here, is where our chapter ought to have begun. It ought to have examined that glimmering light which, in time, the soul of the lonely prisoner begins to emit like the halo of a saint. Torn from the hustle-bustle of everyday life in so absolute a degree, that even counting the passing minutes puts him intimately in touch with the universe. The lonely prisoner has to have been purged of every imperfection, of everything that has stirred and troubled him in his former life, that has prevented his muddy waters from settling into transparency. How gratefully his fingers reach out to feel and crumble the lumps of earth in the vegetable garden, but alas, it is all asphalt. How his head rises of itself toward the eternal heavens, but alas, this is forbidden. And how much touching attention the little bird on the window sill arouses in him. But alas, there is that muzzle there, and the netting as well, and the hinged ventilation pane is locked. And what clear thoughts, what sometimes surprising conclusions he writes down on the paper issued him. But alas, only if you buy it in the commissary, and only if you turn it into the prison office when you have used it up, for eternal safekeeping. But our peevish qualifications somehow interrupt our line of thought. The pain of our chapter creaks and cracks. We no longer know the answer to the question. Is the soul of a person in the new type prison, in the special purpose prison, the T-O-N, purified or does it perish once and for all? If the first thing you see each and every morning is the eyes of your cellmate who has gone insane, how then shall you save yourself during the coming day? Nikolai Alexandrovich Kozirev, whose brilliant career in astronomy was interrupted by his arrest, saved himself only by thinking of the eternal and infinite, of the order of the universe, and of its supreme spirit, of the stars, of their internal slate, and what time and the passing of time really are. And in this way he began to discover a new field in physics. And only in this way did he succeed in surviving in the Dmitrovsk prison but his line of mental exploration was blocked by forgotten figures. He could not build any further. He had to have a lot of figures. Now just where could he get them in his solitary confinement cell with its overnight kerosene lamp, a cell into which even a little bird could enter? And the scientist prayed, Please, God, I have done everything I could. Please help me. Please help me continue. At this time he was entitled to receive one book every ten days. By then he was alone in the cell. In the meager prison library were several different editions of Demian Bedney's Red Concert, which kept coming around to each cell again and again. Half an hour passed after his prayer. They came to exchange his book, and as usual, without asking anything at all, they pushed a book at him. It was entitled, A Course in Astrophysics. Where had it come from? He simply could not imagine such a book in the prison library, Aware of the brief duration of this coincidence, Kozirev threw himself on it and began to memorize everything he needed immediately, and everything he might need later on. In all, just two days had passed, and he had eight days left into which to keep his book, when there was an unscheduled prison inspection by the chief of the prison. His eagle eye noticed immediately. But are you an astronomer? Yes. Take this book away from him. But its mystical arrival had opened the way for his further work, which he then continued in the camp of Norlisk. And so now we should begin the chapter on the conflict between the soul and the bars. But what is this? The jailer's key is rattling brazenly in the lock. The gloomy block superintendent is there with a long list. Last name. First name. Patronymic. Date of birth. Article of the code. Term. End of term. Get your things together. Be quick about it. Well, brothers and sisters, a prisoner transport. A prisoner transport. We're off to somewhere. Good Lord bless us. Shall we gather up our bones? Well, here's what. If we are still alive, then we'll finish the story another time, in part five. If we are still alive.
End of chapter 12.